ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Everyone and welcome to yet another day of the ESL SC2 Masters. It's great to be here with you guys once more. We're very excited to bring you guys a whole bunch of games. As today, I'm joined by Pig. How's it going, mate? Fantastic, mate. Oh, it's good to be back on the regional circuit. And man, I looked at today's schedule and I went, "What the heck is going on?" It's it's always that thing, you know, when the regionals aren't on, you're like, oh, there's some StarCraft on, there's a decent amount. And then the regionals come around and you're like, there is too much StarCraft to follow. We have like 16 best of threes over the rest of the day. I think me and you are covering half of it, dude. It's it's just overwhelmingly awesome how many fun games there, there are going to be. Today is like Super Sunday, man. Like we do eight best of threes and then there's other casters are going to show up and they're going to do eight best of threes as well for 16 series the entirety of Swiss round two for Asia and America gets played out today. So big day for a lot of players, a lot of make or break moments, not do or die, but opportunities to set yourself up in a great spot or really be in trouble going into week two next week. Of course, we couldn't be here without our wonderful sponsors, of course, as well. And that is going to be Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, the United States Air Force and the ESL Shop. And of course, this is all building up towards our offline finals in Dallas, which is going to be happening and uh, the very end of May, so you can get your tickets for that right now at dreamhack.com slash Dallas slash tickets. It's 15% off with the code StarCraft, so go get yourself some tickets. We will see you there. It's going to be a good old time. We're very much still looking forward to it, and we're very much still looking forward to this hell of a day pick. Um, Asia Round 2, it's fresh. We haven't had any matches in Round 2 just yet. We've got a bunch of guys at 1-0, a bunch of guys at 0-1. What's standing out for you today? Oh, there's, there's so much that stands out. I mean, for me, I feel like the Asian region is the heart of uh, innovation. It's the heart of kind of players figuring out their own way to play the game and kind of leading forward in different uh, areas. You give these players a new map pool and the balance patch, and you combine that with the creativity that just excels in the Asian region. And of course, we're going to see fireworks. Uh, I think already we saw, you know, XY and Mia Micah had a, a very fun match yesterday. So I'm looking forward to seeing what xy can do to continue his form against firefly which will be our first series uh olivera is always of course the big kind of standout favorite who are kind of just going can anyone take a map off olivera is, is anyone going to scratch him and show any weakness um but <laughs> you know so far he has not shown a, a glimmer really of, of anything wrong with his play at all so I, I think there's a lot of questions as well around just the, the many many protoss players and how they've innovated, especially since we've got quite a few PVT matches today. So the start of today, we've dodged a lot of PVPs, whereas normally this region's very PVP heavy. So for me, I'm curious as like, hey, the Widow Mines no longer turn invisible with the armory. Are we seeing Mass Zealot, Mass Zealot Phoenix? Are we seeing Glaive Adept Phoenix all-ins? Those are the kind of build orders which theory crafting wise should be good in the PVT matchup. And if anyone's gonna do it, Firefly, Lemon, Jayshi, these are the guys who I'm expecting to bring it out. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I'm uh it's such a fun region where you see so many different things. Players have their own vibe. They have their own builds. And I think getting into the 1-0 and no and 1 matches, especially we're going to start seeing some of those really fun kind of, you know, situations arise where very evenly matched players kind of match up. I mean, Firefly XY for the Asia region is actually a really fun one. That's what we're starting off with. We're heading in-game right now with this TVP. So I'm going to get on into it and uh, not waste any more time because when you've got 16 best of threes to go through, you better not be wasting any time. We're going to be in in a second. My StarCraft 2 apparently does not like to load straight away, but we're good, and we can start. In the top left-hand side, we're going to begin the day with the blue Protoss player representing offside. It is Firefly. And his opponent in the bottom right, a player who I have always found an inspirational player in this matchup. My eyes will be glued to his build orders and taking notes. In the bottom right side, in the red, it's XY. Uh, I always thought XY was kind of at the cutting edge of really just clever openings in, in, in this matchup. Um, I guess I think part, partially inspired by Coffee, uh, who's, who's, you know, always been fantastic uh, as well. I think um, XY is very experienced, though. He, he's good at finding ways to kind of leverage his advantage. And TVP is a matchup where if you can surprise the Protoss, trick them a little bit, hit them 30 seconds earlier than they're expecting, Protoss players getting caught off guard are nowhere near as scary as a Protoss player that kind of feels like he sees everything coming a minute or two ahead of time, and we'll see if XY can pull that off. On the other hand, uh, Firefly's kind of the king of four-gate blink, I feel like, many times, and he's very good at just getting in there with his aggressive uh, timing attacks, and uh, I think there's, there's a kind of mixture of, are we going to see the Firefly who YOLOs in with the four-gate blink, 
or does he just tech right on up to three base Colossus? So there is a question mark for XY in terms of can he scout that out and kind of suss out which version of Firefly is showing up today? Yeah, Firefly has really shown himself as a just an all around solid player. He can play very standard things. He can do great aggressively. He can do great being forced into a longer game. XY, to me at least, is more of this specialist where he is good at the timings. He is good at being a bit funky and a bit weird. And if we see something here that's not 100% normal, I would not be too shocked because that is just XY in a nutshell. And that's where he finds a lot of his success. But against someone who is as well-rounded as Firefly, it's definitely going to be a challenge because, like I say, it's not like Firefly is just hinging his kind of entire game plan here on one build that has to go right from the start. He's at this point definitely well-rounded enough to kind of take on whatever XY throws at him and to kind of accept that and to go with it. Next, we're actually going to see the first tech structure here. Going to be a robo facility from Firefly, so just really going to play one of the safest openings you can. I love that this has come back in popularity, you know, after after such a long time, people are like, oh, you can't do that. That's kind of weird. It's not the best. And I think nowadays people are like, wait a second, this shuts down any sort of cyclone aggression. The early robo, it gives you such good scouting. And, you know, it, it's a small change. People haven't really talked about it, but I think it's quite big. The Observer, they, the Observer mm -hmm. still cost 75 gas, but they build an extra like seven seconds quicker or whatever. Oh, I mean, maybe it's only five seconds, but it adds up. Basically, they build quicker. Yes, they're a bit more visible for the Terran to like scan them down, especially when they go into surveillance mode, but it's an incredibly safe opening and quick Colossus has never been bad. Not to mention what I've loved is a lot of players even use the Robo just for scouting and like Hero would go back into Storm afterwards and play like a Storm Drop Charge Lot style, which is not what you'd expect. Normally you'd expect more of what Firefly is doing here, which is, you know, I'm gonna get the Robo Bay, I'm going up to quick Colossus, maybe even a Disruptor Drop is something that people can mix in. And the Adept already getting some great scouting info as the Marines try to get some damage. Nice micro for Firefly. Grab a free Marine shade out. You'll regenerate those shields with no problem. Yeah, nice to see the Adept being active already. The Hellion's going to get through and it scouts everything because it's all on the front door pretty much. So he gets the full sight of what's going on. We're going to get ourselves a probe as well. So we get a bit of damage done too. And that information is obviously just absolutely key here. So being able to see Robo, Robo Bay. And now you just know what is up and what is happening. And uh, yeah, as that Prism finishes up here, we're going to see ourselves Firefly really getting ready to tech as well. There's a Disruptor, so maybe even some Prism Speed. We're going to see some Disruptor drops. I love it. I love it. You know, the, the Disruptor drop is good. It's been scouted, so I don't... I think you should rely too hard on it. And with the Drop Harass coming in, Disruptor doesn't help defend this pretty much at all. Like, it's, it's not useful defensively. It's there just for hitting the workers. So are there enough gateway units in position is always the question I'm asking myself. Two adepts right now, no stalkers warping in. Fireflies being so greedy. He does warp in one stalker, but he's nowhere near that main base. And this drop has the potential to find some damage. That being said, perfectly timed shield battery. So, oh, I like the sneaky drop in the corner though. Yeah, gets to unload first. He's going to be full power as he runs in. That means you're potentially going to be able to still get rid of at least a couple probes here. Just might take a couple of attempts. There goes one, there goes two. We pop the super battery. The units do get here though. So you bought yourself a bit of time to reposition. Of course, still, I think, for XY, you're loving this, right? You get a few workers, you get out. Now we're going to see this disruptor showing up, though, and XY kind of stacks oh. the workers up, which means six SCVs go down. Not bad at all for the first disruptor shot of the game. <laughs> yeah, there's a Viking out, you know? It's like one of these things where it's like, okay, he can deal with that, but the Observer's out front. It sees everything in his base, so he's not just going to fly into the, you know, the Viking or anything like that. I mean, he actually does fly right towards this base. This is a very <laughs> dangerous drop. <laughs> the Viking, I guess, was busy going after the Observer with the scan, so he's like, you know what? I can sneak in here. Not a, not a bad move at all. And uh, Immortal's coming in behind it with Blink. So I like that Firefly is just rounding his tech out. A lot of players, when they do an odd opening like this, they kind of like, look, I'm just never getting Blink. I'm just going to have a few Stalkers on anti-air. If I get out positioned, I'm kind of screwed, but... I like that he's promoted like third command center's done double ebay three barracks coming up xy is doing what is very popular we noticed in gsl for instance in the earlier rounds a lot of the top terran players just kind of saying you know what i want to play three bases and then we can start trading with each other so a super safe style for xy yeah the build of firefly is actually kind of cool right i mean to, to open one disruptor just use that as kind of light pressure and then he's like you say going backwards into that blink an immortal or so, so he's kind of rounding out that army, but it makes for quite a strong army now. As the gates finish, he will, you know, really kind of double down on this stalk account, and he will have a good bit of pressure here. We'll see what Firefly can do, because he is venturing across the map. He is believing, at the very least, that he's got some opportunity to try and get some damage done right now. So, we'll see if that's true. Like you said, it's a very safe build and setup from XY. He's got a bunker, he's got a tank, he's got tank high ground as well. 
The only problem being is uh, right oh, now that Disruptor oh, has potential and he is going to lose the Medivac oh, as well. Oh, oh my god. Disaster strikes. Deadly. Wow. Okay, well, that, that does it. Devastating. <laughs> that was crazy. That was devastating. I mean, getting the full Medivac and the units that couldn't fit in the Medivac and the tank. There's one tank, another tank on the high ground now. But dude, this is disastrous for XY. He's relying on those tanks on the high ground. And of course, this is one of these pre-stim timings. We always talk about three command center builds being dangerous against Protoss because it extends the period when you don't have map control. The Immortal drop on the high ground. He's shooting the Marines. Immortal's not known for their high IQ, but a good bit of micro <laughs> from Firefly does fix that. They take the siege tanks down. That's going to absolutely annihilate Firefly, dude. What a crisp win. Yeah, he just, uh, you know, like I said, kind of set up a bit of aggression. Clearly felt as though he had his moment coming through, and then he just struck, and it couldn't have gone better. The few units were out the front, I was like, well, that's kind of bad, because they don't have stim to get away. Then the disrup Disruptor is clearly in range, you got to lift in the medevac, the Stalkers are immediately there blinking, and obviously just tank fire as your defense at that point ain't going to cut it. You're going to need the extra units to kind of get there, so just a very easy way to close that one out, and that is going to be, in the end, of course, then Firefly adding himself 1-0 advantage to the start of the day. And off to a happy start, as of course everyone in this uh, group right now haven't played one Swiss round. We are at 1-0 and with these guys, so if Firefly, if he wins this, he would be 2-0 and, and looking to move through the playoffs next week. Um, and yeah, looking convincing as well. It, it feels to me like, I, I feel like the last few seasons of WTL, Firefly has kind of just crept his way forwards in, in terms of dominance. Like I, I, A few years ago, you know, you were casting these guys, we were watching them, Firefly was always very good. But I definitely feel like all that experience over the last few years playing against top dogs and, you know, stealing a lot of important points against the Clems of this world, against the very top, you know, Terran, Protoss and Zerg players. Fireflies just got this air of decisiveness, uh, I think is the best word to describe it since that, that last map was basically just a, I'm going to jump on top and finish it off. He's looking good, man. I, I think he's been competing against such a high level of competition in the team leagues and, and it's really brought up his, his level. No, absolutely. It's, um, Firefly's been one of my favorite players to kind of watch over the last year and a bit, right? Where it's just been this kind of progress and process from him where he's been improving and he's been kind of like the anchor of his team a couple of times over as well. So it's just really cool to see him, not, you know, kind of evolving from that where he was the player that could win a couple maps to now being that kind of anchor of the team, constantly pushing the kind of the level further, the bar higher. And uh, now... You know, a real competitor in this Asia region, one of the favorites when we enter in. If it wasn't for Oliveira, I would imagine Firefly would do extremely well in these events, but perhaps be one, you know, the favorite alongside a Cyan or so. So yeah, um, great to see his progress, and you can just see again cool builds as well, right? Like he doesn't necessarily just do the standard, the baseline. He kind of plays his own things sometimes, and they make sense, and that's what's so cool about it. That last game, it all fit together yeah. so nicely, and uh, that netted him the win. Crimson Court for map two now. I mean, yeah, it was it's a really nice way to start. Obviously, like Firefly dropped a map yesterday to Jim, but it's PvP and it's Jim. And uh, I think we all know that Jim is someone we'll never kind of just go, oh, that guy, that guy is easy. No, it's Jim. He's, he's you yeah. know, was was the best Protoss player in China for uh -huh. quite a while, or the best player overall and that sort of thing. And, and dropping a map in PvP is basically part for the course, no matter who your opponent is. So I think Firefly really is, like you said, very close to just knocking on that door of Oliveira. But uh, it's kind of weird when you've got a guy who's such an outlier in the region, it, 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 you kind of need more than that, right? You can't just like be, you know, like it, it's like you don't see the progress from, oh, I'm second place in, in, in there to like right there because there's, there's such a big gap. But I do think that gap is closing steadily over time. Well, as again, again, number two, I'm going to be starting off on the top right hand side of Crimson Court. It is going to be the Red Terran player from Invictus Gaming, XY. And in the bottom left side, a great decisive game one victory. It's Firefly. Now, I uh, I wonder now that you know, I feel like uh, like we've you know guys like yourself taking over some of the the production lead a bit more these days, Wardy. We're still doing intros on every map. You know, I thought we were I thought we thought we were breaking that habit at some point. What do you reckon? Are we gonna are we gonna buck that trend, or is this stuck with Starcraft forever? Is it too deep now? Fourteen it's years too, in the game for it's us too to change. Deep, man. It's too deep, and we and we also have like the two minutes of the very start, or the minute at the very start, where unless the proxy is going down, what else are we gonna say? So, yeah. I don't 
See, it's, it's all good on my side if we don't do it, but then, like, you know, the moment we get, like, an actual producer again and or a cameraman, they're like, we need to do the intros. The cameraman's ready to do the epic twirly zoom on the camera. It's like, okay, <laughs> gotta stay in practice just in case. I'm like, we, we could just be talking about the strategy. They could just show player shots, man. Like, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with just showing player shots. Yeah. <laughs> you I, know, I, we want to yeah. see more of the players. Let's go for it. But <laughs> imagine, imagine that uh, fitting together, Pig. That would be uh, outlandish, if you ask me. <laughs> Even Marpu's in the chat saying to us, he's like, I'm perfect, let it go. It's okay, I don't need, I, I'm good. I can do my job without zooming in on the player's base at the start. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a, I'm sure. I'm, it is, yeah, yeah. I always, you know, there, there's there's just a, a, a habit that we got into many years ago and it does kind of, um, you know, it, it, I can imagine in a mirror matchup when you're a colorblind person watching and for some reason red and blue look kind of similar, Maybe it's nice, but for most people, I don't think it really matters. Uh, anyways, a bit of probe harass early. He hasn't found any damage, but the Reaper's coming over. This is Crimson Court, which is a map which... This is the ESL version. Um, for those who don't know, I didn't know until Mapu just messaged me. It has only two rocks on those side things. Rather than on the ladder version, there's four rocks on top of each other. So thank you, Mapu, for letting me know about that. This map, having the, the, the sides of the map kind of cut off is very unique in that layout. Mm -hmm. Oh, careful, XY. Ooh. Yeah, don't lose that Reaper. But yeah, to continue your point, the the size of the map being cut off does make this map interesting. And I've loved it. It's it's really kind of an innovative way to kind of have a map that plays very differently. Some people do try and expand down the size. They mine out those minerals. They open that space. And then a lot of people just say, no, let's play a very narrow game. Let's play through the middle only. And that creates such a different dynamic of how the game plays. So it's really been fascinating to watch. It's been one of those things that's just been really cool to see. Um, this is... Well, I mean, I actually like a lot of the new maps a lot more than I thought I was going to. Uh, and this one really stands out for me because I do just feel like I'm still seeing so many different ways of expanding and, you know, testing and figuring out what everyone's going to do. There's so much potential for each game to look unique and different. Reaper's getting a good scout here so far. He's going to come in, seize the robo timing, seize the twilight in a second as well. And gets out of there. Wow. Always feels good when you can do that. Meanwhile, Protoss gets the scout off, but Fireflies Adept does go down. Sees the tech lab on the starport, though. So that tells you no medevac aggression this game. We don't need to be so worried right here and now. And uh, that robo on the front of the natural third base attempt coming down. Two gate blink third. Always a very solid opening. But it is kind of on the, the lesser kind of phase in terms of the amount of defense you have available. So Firefly is not playing super safe. Like if, if you're a bit more paranoid, you go three gate blink is a bit more of a in the middle of the road, four gate blink aggressive. Firefly is like, no, nah, it's cool, man. I, I, I got a real clean game one. I can just comfortably macro up and I can't wait to see what he does from there because he's going to have heavy pressure coming his way. Even though there's a bunker, XY is going liberated tank. And that's usually a sign of the Terran wanting to be highly aggressive. That being said, he's not building any Marines and he goes for a third command center. This is a really odd mix up from XY in terms of you've got signs of aggression in the tank Marine Liberator, but then you've also got signs of I'm going to play a greedy slow game with the third command center. I mean, is he possibly just going to turtle with this? That, that seems like it would be a bit of a wild decision. It would, I, I don't see what else you can do, right? Like, yeah, the Lib's going to go across the map, but then the tank's just going to stay at home. You don't really have the Marines to support it on a push. So I imagine, yeah, we just sit back, we chill, we take that third base, and we start adding the extra barracks for the further upgrades and everything as well. So, yeah, I was kind of with you, though. Like, when you see the live, you see the tank, you think, right, he's going across the map. He's going to put some pressure on. Narrow map like this is difficult to get flanked. It's difficult to cut off reinforcements. So you can really set up a good spot and deny that early third. But, uh, yeah, XY decides, no, I'm just going to send the lib. I'm going to macro up myself. Kind of similar to the last game in the sense of he's just like, hey, I want to get to three bases and then we can start to trade. Then I can start to take fights. Last game, it never really got set up as this Liberator gets shut down immediately. Good catch from Firefly. That's, that's part of what, you know, what we saw with the Liberator there is part of why I was doubting it a little bit because the Liberator is so good when you're doing other things at the same yep. time. Like, it's such a nice unit when there's lots of stuff happening. Um, that's why we see it. Usually there's Marine Tank on the front. There's a Widow Mine drop hitting the main. Liberator hits the natural. And it's like, man, that Liberator does so much and causes so many problems. But when you're just sitting at home, I, I, I actually thought XY would wait until he saw Stalkers outside his base and then he would send it in. Like, it's like, a, oh, this is just going to kind of punish you if you get a bit too aggressive. Give me something on your side of the mode to, uh, map to poke. But honestly, it looks like he has a, a convergence point in game one he was aiming for where he's going, you know, I've got me tanks, me stim bio, me three bases. And I would expect a 1-1 ghost 
fire tank all in with an SCV pool. I don't think XY wants to play a long macro game with Firefly because we talked about Firefly just being the kind of more experienced, well-rounded uh, multitasking player, I would say, than XY in, in some regards. Maybe not more experienced, but I'd say a little bit quicker in that mid game and a bit more all consuming. I, I think as XY, you don't want to give a Protoss too much time in general, uh, just because that is a scary choice as a Terran player. And with this build with the fast third commands and he's already in a hurry. And the big change for XY is he's only gone one eBay, right? So he's got plus one weapons almost done. I think he'll add plus one armor, get a few ghosts, and we will probably see him go for a big push. No real splash damage for Firefly. He's got Zealots coming forward, Stalkers starting to micro. There are Immortals and Sentries at home gathering, but he's not moving them across the map. So Firefly is looking like he wants to harass. He doesn't really want to go for the big frontal push, just kind of creating a bit of space for himself. And as I said, he is actually moving forward with the Immortals as well. Yep, he is going to get ready to go. Firefly clearly just kind of comfortable with his seven to eight minute timing windows, which is exactly what hit in game number one as well. So he's moving up, he's getting ready, and yeah, he clearly believes he can kind of send this. So... I mean, spreading out, I love the depots, anything to choke up these elves, anything to take shots that is not going to be on the army straight away is going to be a general a general benefit, but we blink through the top side, we get rid of the tanks there very easily, the bio just had to back away from that, now we can force field and put some work onto this orbital, we're going to blink again, try and get rid of this siege tank high ground, so again, we're dismantling the defense, and very well done so far by Firefly, denying that third from being in position, and if nothing else, now he's mining the third base where his opponent is not. Getting rid of those tanks is huge. The tanks for the range advantage for Terran. With those gone, the threat, the Immortals, the Stalkers, and potential sentries, Firefly finds himself, as long as he pulls his Zealots back, with a decently long-ranged army, right? The the Stalkers and the Immortals, they have the same range, same range as the Marauders, outrange the Marines. The Zealots do have to be pulled back, though, and I like the way that he's not overcommitting fourth base in a Robo Bay. Firefly says, cool, I'm denying your mining. That's good enough for me. XY needs to get that mining on that base, but he doesn't want to pull SCVs into this. I think he should be stimming the buyer at some point. He's trying to be real conservative because he knows Firefly wants to like bait him into over stimming. But uh, he does have to make sure he doesn't let himself get bullied too hard. And taking this gold base on the right, not a bad way of avoiding the frontal collision. It is still a matter of time though, where I think XY will be going for an all in SCV pull at some point. It's just about picking his timing. Um, and the stalkers for Firefly are making that really hard. Yep. I mean, just continuing to come in, right, and just be annoying. A couple more workers and units going down the front. We lose the ops, we lose some vision, but behind all of this, Firefly just sets up into base number four. He's got no need to kind of push in altogether, and, you know, if XY is going to start pushing out, by then we're going to have disruptors out. We have extended thermal line, so eventually we're going to also move into Colossi. Just uh, Firefly saying that right now he needs something to help, and that will be the disruptor. Just build a little bit more quickly. One disruptor much more effective than that single Colossus, so I like that. Just to give him a better chance of holding on here. As we continue to try and slow down this advance, the Terran army is coming big right through the center. Yeah, you know, I keep expecting that boy pool because we don't see any progression in terms of the, the upgrades. Like, there's no second eBay, no armory, no fourth command center. Uh, Zealot run by on the right side is going to be a problem. These stalkers, quite a few of them get taken down on the front, but the Zealot run by is going to cause damage as well. So that's going to force XY back. I, mean, I think XY is getting to a pretty scary army, but as the disruptors start to come out, he, if he wants to go, he's got to go now. Yeah, I mean, he's going to get rid of that Disruptor here, so we are kind of lacking splash damage, but decent force field chokes up the retreat, allows the Zelda to get a few more shots off the Storms with the Concave on the high ground doing decently, and Firefly not going to chase that down too heavily, realizing here that he can just sit tight and just hang back and just let XY be the one to try and find damage. Those Zelda's already did well on the right side, we've got another few coming in once again, and that's just going to keep on causing problems. Every time Zelda's show up here, this is just something which XY doesn't want to have to go back and think about. XY looks like he, he feels he feels a timer right now, right? What he, he feels like he's got to get something done, and that's going to play to Firefly's advantage. If he can bait a few more stims out, notice the Zealot pullback, and he's got that concave on the high ground. You can't really push into that as, as XY, but at the same time, without a third mining right now, you know, he's been so interrupted there by these Zealots, he's kind of got to get something done. A fresh mule comes down, Zealot happy to chew down that fresh mule, and XY is not progressing at all. Firefly though, he's got the fourth established. He's got 2-2 two, two about to finish. The disruptor count is growing. This is a massive advantage for the Protoss, who's just kind of, he's forced XY into an awkward position and he's held him there. It's not like Firefly has done one big sudden winning move, but he just cleared out the tanks, made, denied the third a little bit. And since then, he's just been on the front with a heavy stalker count and pressuring, defending with the stalker immortal. Firefly's still got great progression. There's no pressure on Firefly to win the game right now. 
because hey man you just way ahead on the upgrades and you're getting further and further ahead every second do a bit of multi prong see if you can catch him out here zealots overwhelming a few lives on the right side not siege not by on the left getting ravaged by the marauder disruptor big disruptor shot on the north the command center lives on the left side of the map the bio will come back to defend the stalkers on that left side but firefly happy with the damage he's found and he's got three three on the way behind this yep he is just gonna keep on going man i mean a few more scvs are going down over here and the defense is really just not there at all for XY. Firefly looking good of 20 workers. As you mentioned, the upgrades are getting better and better, improving from 2-2 to 3-3. And his opponent just sat on 1-1, unable to really find the time to afford anything else. Basically reliant on these uh, Liberators right now to kind of buy you time and to stop the final push from happening. But obviously during all of this, you just keep on going as uh, Firefly. We do lose a Disruptor here. This Disruptor goes a bit too far, turns around. The split is good. As we have our units continue to just split apart from the Firefly trade out, and it does look as though he's going to have enough for the final fight to win out, and Firefly is going to find himself. Game two, first best three of the day is his, and of course that moves him to 2 and 0 on this group as well. So, again, one of our favorites for this event is looking very good in that regard still, and is very much so, and I, you know, being the guy right now. Interesting to see Firefly there opening Robo first in that first game and saying, you know, I'm going to have great scouting and disincentivize you from being aggressive. Makes you want to go for a third command center. But guess what? I've got the killer timing to take advantage. And then game two, again, another similar sort of timing attack. And we see what happens when those stalkers and those immortals get on top of those siege tanks and marauders. And you're hitting like, hey, you don't necessarily have combat shields yet. Or if you do, you know, your stim's not done in game one at the very least. And uh, it's just, there's, there's an awkward moment there, right? And, and power spikes in TVP are very pointed things. And when you do do a three base build rather than two base, like when you do two base, we're used to Terran kind of having that stim army poised. Is it going to drop the main? Is it going to hit the third? Is it going to hit both sides at once? How is Protoss going to handle it? But you find when the Terran goes for the third command center, there's going to be that extended period where it's like, oh God, what is Protoss going to do to hit him? You've got to survive that period without really getting too slowed down or you can end up on that slippery slope. And that's exactly where Firefly put XY in game two. Well, our first TVP goes the way of Firefly. We've got a couple more TVPs to start the day off with. Up next, world champion Oliveira takes on Lemon. And we'll see whether Oliveira can continue his streak here in his region. So we'll be back with that in just a few moments. Don't go anywhere. It's more StarCraft 2 here in the ESL SCT Masters.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back as we continue our action here in Asia region. Lemon is going to try and tackle Oliveira in this upcoming best of three pick. And obviously we've got Oliveira as a favorite, but Lemon is kind of an interesting character in terms of what race he's playing, when and why. Yeah, Lemon, we were just talking about that during the break. Um, because I was I was checking looking at the Wikipedia and I'm like, you know, didn't Lemon play a little bit of Zerg? And it was like, yeah, but also played Terran to avoid the Zerg versus Zerg mirror, but also played Protoss and then Terran and then Zerg. And I'm looking through the years of Lemon's play, and I'm like, Lemon is actually just a true random player at this point. Even though there's big stints of Protoss and big stints of Terran and big stints of Zerg, when over the last five years of StarCraft, you've played months of Zerg, months of Terran, months of Protoss, sometimes swapping between them within a single month. That makes you, in my mind, a very well-rounded StarCraft player and a player who's who's looking for the path of least resistance. You know, some people play StarCraft, they're going, mechanics, let's just click the buttons faster, better, make sure my supply blocks are less, get my build down to the second. Lemon's the kind of guy who's not going to be winning that way. He's going to be looking for strategic victories and advantages that way. Well, let's have a look and see if he can find some of them in the bottom right, starting himself as the blue Protoss player. This is going to be Lemon. Playing for Mystery Gaming, of course. And his opponent in the top left, the king of Asia, the absolute monster outside of Korea. There are very few, few players who can even take maps off him. In the top left, it is DKZ's Oliveira. As a non-American, I kind of want to say DKZ. How do you feel about that, Wardy? As a fellow proper English speaker. Definitely DKZ. Sorry. <laughs> we're, we're just kidding. We're, we're just left. Cultural imperialism just has us. <laughs> There's no way I'm ever seeing DKZ. I actually talked about this yesterday. Me and Kath. And oh, was, really? Uh, yeah, we, well, we, not necessarily with DKZ, but with like uh, ZVZ being like Z versus Z or something. Ah, yeah. Like, okay, so, yeah, ZVZ terrible. does sound wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like saying T for T for TVT, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, let's not. Uh, the... The PP matchup for uh, Protoss <laughs> versus Protoss, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, honestly, you know what's cool about this match is Lemon actually has statistically the best record against Oliveira of anyone in the region, having uh, won uh, against him <laughs> the only time they've played a best of three, historically. 100%... Um, uh, oh, actually, sorry, it was, it was one to one, so in, in series. But, you know, even in series, one in the Korean StarCraft League earlier this... Uh, well, it was literally yesterday. Um, and uh, and lost to him back in 2019, you know, which is which Lemon was coming up as a player. So the fact is, you know, Lemon's used up some tr tricky builds, caught Oliveira off guard. The question is, were though his his only surprise build orders? Does he have extra ones? You know, how does Oliveira adapt and react? And so far, double gas build, very safe opening, allows the Terran to get the momentum. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of regretting not doing my homework as a lazy caster. Didn't actually see what happened in those KSL matches. So I'm going to try and get those running in the background and hopefully have an update on you guys before the series is over or just afterwards on what happened there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Tell us, Pig. Figure it out for us. As we uh, do just <laughs> get set in this game with a uh, very safe play from Oliveira, by the way. That CC comes down pretty late. Everything is in the main base as well, so really not going anywhere in that regard. And just, uh, yeah, just just basically making sure that he's not going to be vulnerable to anything at all in the early stages. Meanwhile, Lemon, he starts up the Twilight Council, and we'll see just how aggressive he wants to be off of what is an expected blink opener over these next couple moments. Another fast third command center open is so weird that this has taken over so much in this patch. Because the patch changes are, are definitely significant for the matchup, but I don't think they're significant enough to completely change the openings. Um, neither is like the Cyclone change nor the Widow Mine change. And yet we are seeing Terran players of all persuasions. Clem's been doing it against Max Max in Europe, Maru against Hero over in Korea and against uh, Beyond as well. Fast third command center. I just, I'm afraid of you, Protoss player. I want to go to three base before I dance. And I think a lot of the Protoss players have really been taking advantage of that by being quite greedy up to three base and beyond and getting more control and more time to respond. And I always feel like Protoss's weakness in this matchup is you know being on the back foot and just being a few seconds slow to respond to this or that so I, i'm really curious as like a test because you do need to be very high level to take advantage of this room terran gives you and to be fair he's still got harassment coming right it's 
It's actually, sorry, just a natural command center. My brain is totally broken right now. I apologize for that, Wardy. I don't know why. I'm looking at a command center in the main going, that's a third command center because they're normally built on the natural. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it, 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 we really just kind of built it quite far back in his base and everything. Like, I was, uh, I've done that many a time. Pig, where you're like, and here's the third bit. Oh, no, it's, it's still just early in the game. Never mind. A uh, little drop comes in. <laughs> We're going to run into the natural same time. Might actually be able to get a pro because everything kind of ran away. Okay, it turns back around. So the rib actually gets out alive. The wood of mine went off for a single probe in the main, but more, more than anything, everything gets away from Olivera. So he gets to keep all of these units to harass with further or just to obviously kind of go back home and then grab one bigger, larger army and go all at once. You know, it's a great comparison yeah. to that previous game. We're seeing the tank and the liberator. And this time, I think we might actually see the marine tank push and then that liberator going elsewhere at the same time. As you were mentioning then, that's where that Liberator could actually be much more effective. 100% Wardy. This is this is kind of what you expect when you see a Liberator in production. A much scarier move out. And he might set up an ambush in the middle of the map. Careful, Lemon. God, don't want to lose these Stalkers. Lemon is, is in a real spot above the start of the third Nexus and immediately sees uh, an army. Immortal does get Chrono, but with only three gate blink production, it's going to be hard to hold this off. Let's see what Lemon can pull out. This is a high pressure moment. Firefly is not giving him, uh, sorry, uh, Oliveira is not giving Lemon any room to breathe. Lemon has just a little bit of room to micro. Doesn't have any forward battery, but now he's in range of it and he has slowed this push down a fair bit. Good micro from Lemon so far. Yeah, he's forcing the siege up and just forcing Oliveira to, to kind of play it slowly. Gets in, gets the Liberator immediately. It was just trying to come with this army to reinforce the siege, but yeah, now we're going to have ourselves a setup from Oliveira. Does not look that strong. Only a handful of Marines. Uh, the Woodman goes down so we can blink on top of these uh, tanks and get rid of them. We don't even need to. We're just going to wander on forwards wow. and get rid of everything, and the cleanup is made. Dude, that, he just wrecked that. That was incredibly well done. Like the methodical pulling back with the blink, the fighting in the overcharge. I mean, that was fantastic as far as holds go. And the third command center does go down behind this. And this isn't, a, oh, I'm afraid and I'm turtling to 3cc, what I was starting to talk about earlier while completely misreading what was happening. This is, you have to go third command center after this sort of tank push because, you know, your second and third barracks is so delayed. This is just the transition you do. But it does mean if you don't kill their third or at least cause a ton of damage, you're sitting back for the next three to four minutes waiting for stim to finish you know waiting for this third command center to pay off and all that sort of stuff oliver is stuck on the defensive firefly now has all the room in the world to go robo bay charge forge and he's already thinking about a fourth base and that's what i love a lot of players i feel like they win a fight like that and they go oh it's time to counter attack oh, i need to do this or that but if you think about it, all terran can do is sit and defend two base right now he's not going to be open for you to do much damage unless it's a giant all in and look at that even catching the liberator Dude, this is just excellent play. Does lose a Stalker and a probe. Good focus fire from Oliveira to get the weak Stalker. But nonetheless, I feel like Lemon just has a, such a clean control and hold on what's going on so far. Yeah, and he's just he's just rolling with it too. Fourth base goes down. He moves into Colossus production. So he's fleshing out the advantage. He's now saying, cool, now I can move to my, you know, like I say, that fourth base. I can get my economy continuing to go. I can get the splash damage out, which is necessary in this matchup as well. And he's doing all of this safely because of the way in which he's controlled the earlier stages and won those fights. It's a long way for Stimpak and Combat Shields to be done from Oliveira, so he's really not going to have anything on the map for a little bit. By the time he's on the map, Lemon is going to be so well established. This is looking pretty rough for Oliveira. I mean, you got to remember Oliveira maybe is the favorite player, so perhaps, you know, in the longer game, he can still drag it back. But Lemon could not have given himself a better opportunity in these early stages. You know what I love to see here? Non-stop pro production and bonus little details to add to his position. Okay, I'll squeeze a battery in the main. I'll get one over at the fourth, but also let's get a ring of pylons for vision. Let's have the observer watching everything on the front. It feels to me like a lot of players freeze up and they get ahead against a favored player. Like, you know, an Oliveira, you go, oh no. But Lemon's just playing a confident macro style. 72 probes, fifth base stars, double forge. I don't see this as being overly greedy. I see this as really towing the line of I'm ahead. I'm going to get further ahead. A triple robo. Oh, I'm a god. Classic style. <laughs> Just going super heavy on the robo. I love it. I think this is such a, a good way to play. You know, don't get me wrong. The, the hero max pack style of one robo until 20 minutes and just use really good blink stalker micro and zealots running in and out. That's a good style. It's, it's one of the best for a reason. But the triple robo just packs so much explosive power. Good choice here. Nice ambush in the middle of the map as well. Baiting the stim out, forces the tanks to siege and pulls back. Just slowing down Oliveira's push. Unfortunately, he does move his observer into scan range. Slight mistake for Lemon, but Lemon's already slowed Oliveira down a lot. Yep, Lemon is uh, 
I'm gonna have all of her just halted in the center, and anytime you're buying time, it's generally gonna be good. Those robots finish, more units get out. Your defense is likely going to be looking stronger. And Oliveira is backing it off as well. He's just gonna say, okay, I'll step back here. As Lemon just takes a fifth base, there's been no slowing him down. I was about to say, Oliveira almost feels like he needs some harassment on the map again. He is going to get two medivacs loaded up, and they move over to the right side. So that could be his opportunity. That could be his pot potential to finally get in and do some damage again, start pulling Lemon apart, and maybe you have the chance to start out playing Lemon a little bit more than what we've been seeing the last little bit. Four more gateways coming up. The disruptor production's good. I I've loved the observer vision so far. I do want to see more observers mixed in because I feel like on a big map like Golden Ore, you do need to kind of track what's happening. Army skirmishing in the middle. Uh, does look like cleaning up some Widow Mines. The army in the north is being annoying, and uh, that's actually, yeah, with Micro, Oliveira can definitely win this fight. He's got a fourth command center building on location, his two twos on the way as well. Stalkers do barely finish warping in there, and you gotta be careful once Stalkers are here as well. Might be on a bit of a timer, as those medevacs, of course, can get jumped on. Oliveira dropping in the main would be uh, ballsy, to say the least, so he does just go to the dead space. And uh, so far, just a good way of keeping Lemon back. Lemon. Double upgrades. He's not really got a massive amount of triple robo production used up yet. Just two Colossus, three Disruptors, but he's lost track of the army. Oh gosh, Lemon. He's lost yeah. map control here. And he doesn't realize this Terran army is sneaking up on his, his fifth base. He might have to give this Nexus up. Yeah, this, this was all this drop, man. First of all, Lemon had to pull back in general. And now he just, completely, like you said, completely lost map control. His fifth base, no opportunity to defend it at all. And now this map uh, position is going to work against him, although the tanks do siege in range of a Colossus or two, oh. but they're actually going to be in range to fire back. I thought the Colossus might be able to do more. Disrupt the shot will clean out some already used mines, and Oliveira continues to press into the natural expansion, finding pylons that are powering robos, denies the Disruptor already. I mean, this is just the bio. The tanks are further back, remember, but it's still trading decently. Oliveira now maybe getting a little bit cornered in. Stalkers blink to make sure there's no retreat here, and this is where Lemon finally starts to look a little better as he gets the cleanup. I mean, Lemon was dominating this early game. There was a big mistake losing map control. The fact that he still crushed that army, it goes to show how good his setup was. Like, we're not gushing over his opening for no reason, guys. <laughs> He's still, after getting, this is like a huge screw up positionally. He comes all the way back from the middle of the map, loses a ton of infrastructure and workers, still up 20 supply. He, he still just rebuilds the fifth, you know, warps in more zealots and, and continues. As long as he keeps going with it, like his upgrades and everything, you know, three, two on the way, double disruptor production. Um, it's going to be very difficult for Oliveira to ever secure a fifth base in this game. The only thing is because he doesn't have that fifth mining and he hasn't taken that many extra gases, like you can't really go mass blink DT. And that would be such a killer move, which Oliveira just cannot afford to defend right now. But he's bought himself time, has Oliveira by doing that damage. But he can't be caught on the map. The Stalker Blink is really good. Lemon knows he's ahead on the army and jumping on top like that, taking out the Metavax is super good. Yeah, but he just knows fine well exactly what he can get away with. That's an empty medevac here, and nothing going to be really come about from it. A up will run by topside onto the third base. We've also got this Widow Mine drop coming through here. Lemon is not watching this, so oh. the game's getting a little busy. He knows it's late. He does lose six workers. Could have been worse. They'll get rid of a tank on the third. The wall off, stopping the mineral line from being exposed. Lemon's still maxed out, though, and really on the verge of getting across the map and perhaps being able to kind of try and take a bigger fight again. But obviously that is scary because you're going to be attacking into a defensive Terran setup. Only two tanks and three Vikings though. I th I'm with you, Wardy. If he just pushes, I think it's game over. I don't think Oliveira can defend a push right now. That being said, hard for Lemon to know that. And we can see with time Oliveira leverage experience. But what does he need to do? He needs a second starport. He needs a fusion core. He needs range lives. He will need those. Otherwise, he will, you know, really struggle to deal with this position for now, going out with this drop is honestly a wildly dangerous move. Oliveira right now, he's only got three medevacs. Like he can't get this army out. So I, I, I really think this might be way too dangerous for him. Getting an Exus Cancel is good, but why is he attacking towards a Protoss with only part of his army? Yeah, I mean, it's just, there's nothing else going on. He's pushing the bottom left, trying to deny that gold. Sure, great. I mean, that is something you want to get rid of, but he's got to be super careful with the rest of this. Now he's getting jumped on again, so there's no retreat in here because the, the medevacs will go down. So, yeah, Lemon just has the ability to jump in and make dives like that, and that's going to help him a lot as he's going to clean everything up there. I mean, don't get me wrong. He does deny an Exus on the top, gets an Exus and 10 probes on the bottom. Like, he's trading okay, but you can imagine if Lemon's just a little bit quicker with his positioning, he stomps on that army before he even gets on the Nexus. Like... Oliveira is playing a little fast and loose. If he can use this map control to secure his own fifth base, continue his upgrades, get to range lives, don't get me wrong, he, he could definitely win this game. 
but he's doing it in a dangerous manner and that just shows how much pressure lemon is putting on top of him like lemon's saying you know he's in such a monstrous economic lead from the early game it feels like Oliveira has to make something happen and a rotation to the left could be huge here disruptors are dodged Oliveira's looked very clean so far another shot does take down a widow mine yep widow mine over get scanned getting cleaned up we see the army of lemon coming back over the right hand side widow mine it's picked off, the rest of the army gets chased up, Stalkers are blinking in after Vikings, and there's another Disruptor shot firing through, gets rid of another mine as well. This army really does want to battle its way up, Lemon now in the aggressive position pick, feeling as though he might be able to get something out of this. He's got Warpins coming from the center of the map as well, so he is very ready to send this. Dude, Oliveira's fifth is so greedy, I don't think Lemon even knows about it. Okay, he splits yeah. a unit off, yeah. That's a free planetary if he decides to go up there but I don't mind him just poking forward first and breaking these rocks. There's only one tank. So don't overestimate what one tank can do. You know? <laughs> That's a maxed army. Two disruptors just in its face, just drop their shots and say, nah, -uh. Oliver is looking for this round. I don't think he has the meat and potatoes to do this. Three, two is done for Protoss. So it's not like there's a big upgrade advantage for Terran. Disruptor shots on all sides. Oliver's flank gets absolutely purified. And that is disgusting, man. Dude, it's it's weaponized Tide Pods all over the face of Terran. Oliveira's army is getting absolutely trounced. He's been on the back foot from start to finish, and Lemon is showing he's a proper macro Protoss. He really is. He's kept control of this game. He has been able to take proper fights. I mean, that was a difficult fight to take, right? You got a disruptor in different directions, control them, hit them, and he manages to hit pretty much every single one. Oliveira loads up. He realizes it's desperation time. He's moving across the map with the whole army. But I mean, in turn, a base trade against Protoss, he will have recall available and he gets the kick, you know, head start and being able to trade out a base or so. That doesn't seem like it's it for Oliveira. He's going to knock down the pylon and maybe some reinforcements, but I mean, he's really just buying time. But buying time for what? Exactly. That's the perfect question, Wardy. Buying time for what is, is, is the best way you can put it. He's not got ranged lips. He's not got a lot of Vikings to deal with the Colossus. It's only been two Colossus the whole time anyway. So even if he gets like eight Vikings, that's almost an overcommitment. The disruptors are just as big of a concern. But I mean, I I'm just looking at the, the lost unit count. There's like four tanks, three Vikings, two libs, all these ghosts and marauders and marines. Only three disruptors have died this game. The robo unit retention has been fantastic for, for Lemon. And, and it feels like, you know, when life gives you lemon, make lemonade. Oliver is trying to do that, but it's pretty sour, man. He doesn't have a lot of sugar to sweeten this, but he does get on top of the disruptors a little bit. They're all empty. Those were some great dodges. I just don't think he has the numbers to push through. I don't think he does at all. I think it was definitely one of the better fights Oliver could have taken, but again, he needed more reinforcements. He needed more numbers. And Lemon is absolutely winning that numbers game as he pisses on in and cleans out a Widow Miner 2. They're going to be back on top of this location. I mean, again, just disruptors keep on firing, and at this point, Oliveira can't afford to keep bleeding out like this. That cannot happen again and again and again and again with the way that Oliveira is set up, and Lemon is able to take game number one off of Oliveira, and today takes a little bit of an intestine turn already. Uh, interesting number we didn't really weigh in on. I'm not sure if Marpu was, like, purposely showing it on stream or not, but it was uh, up there. I just noticed at the very end... His 24th warp gate was morphing just as that game finished. Um, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating when I said proper macro Protoss. Lemon just went Rainer style in the, in the late game. That was insane. I was like, man, feels like a lot of Protoss is dying in this fight. Why is his supply still so high? Oh, he's warping in 20 zealots at a time. That's why. Okay. <laughs> Lemon really, like when he got the advantage, you know, I was like, oh, I, I, I basically was like, this is a story I've seen so many times underdog player they play a really good clean early game looks great they get out of position just from a little drop catch like being annoying and then like the game falls apart but he came back cleaned that up immediately re-expanded and just did not miss a beat on everything he needed to do at no point did i get the feeling like lemon was tunnel visioning on any one area of the game and that's what you need to be a proper macro player so really really solid play I i'm very impressed by that game one yeah, no, he, he controlled, you know, it's not like he just got gifted a lead early, like he had to find the cleanup on that attack, it was not an easy attack to defend, he got that defense, and once that defense was made, he really made sure to not let it slip, there was that one moment he got pulled back by the double drop, lost map control, Oliveira got the fifth base, that was the one moment it really felt like Lemon slept, anything slip in that game, otherwise he was really on top of it, took good fights, took decisive moves as well, like oftentimes blinking on top of medivacs, playing the cleanup, and just punishing Oliveira for being a little bit too active on the map, so... Yeah, very well earned game one victory. Lament takes the advantage over Oliveira. And definitely on the way to causing a little bit of a cheeky upset here right now. As we get ready for game two on Oceanborn. So, let's see what Oliveira has planned to try and even this series out and to wrap this up.
Dude, that's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's cool as well, seeing that, like, you know, technically they're one-to-one investor threes, but Olivera beat him in Terran versus Zerg, you know. He won. <laughs> yeah. He won yesterday in KSL. He won the PVT then two-to-one against Olivera. He's now one game up. It's like, okay, Lemon, is Lemon just really, really good at PVT right now? Does he have his number? Like, what is going on? You know, I've been hunting through videos uh, in the background as well, and I, I'm not sure if anyone actually cast it live. I'll have to go look through the replay pack myself to find exactly what happened in those games versus Oliveira, because I found some of Lemon's other games, but not the, the ones from the KSL. So uh, that's going to have to be something I update everyone on in the audience at a later date. But uh, I'm, I'm excited, mate. This is a really good start to the series for him, and uh, great things could potentially be here, especially when 2-0 would be such a crazy start. I would be absolutely wild as fighting to not let that happen in the top left. The red Terran player from Dragon Kaiser Gaming is indeed Oliveira. And in the bottom right side, he's been a bit sour for the Terran today. Honestly, just amazing early game defense, setting himself up for success and carrying it forwards with poise. It's Lemon. That's a simple name. You know, I, I kind of like the simple names like I, i've always felt there are some names that are a bit iffy but um i find like a lot of the, the names I, it, I, I i think we should have more fruit related names like i always like you know jigua watermelon which i'm sure i'm butchering the pronunciation of that um lemon i don't know there's something there's something simple and nice about a fruit name well if, if you could go back and name yourself something different wardy something cool rather than just your name what would you do well I don't, I don't know for myself, but I was just thinking, imagine someone called, like, Banana won the World Championship. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, no! World Champion! Banana! <laughs> <laughs> that would be so much fun, man. There'd be so many, like, fruit-related dumb jokes and People lines we could People would just, use, like, you know? literally have bananas in the crowd. I love it. <laughs> His ceremony every time he wins is he just peels a banana on stage and, like, smashes it. <laughs> Uh, when his opponents win, they throw a banana on the floor and step on it. Uh, it'd be good times, man. <laughs> yeah. Oliver is going to go one racks expand. This is a, a bit more traditional rather than the, the aggressive opening from the previous game. Yep. He's getting himself that expansion up, getting that CC down. Uh, a little bit less kind of safe, right? Because you're just going to get the CC down immediately. It's on the low ground. You don't have the factory beforehand to get the units out already. But as you say, it also just sets you up without the need to maybe apply as much pressure. So that is a benefit seen here as well. So you just have this Reaper heading down at the bottom right. And Oliver is about to start scouting, about to start trying to pick off a probe or so, about to start trying to take control of this early game. Good adept positioning there. Reaper's got to back off to be careful. Second barracks is very early. This is the this is the the, the, the Chinese build, man. The Chinese TVP build is the quick second barracks after factory. It's what Oliver used to win his world championship. He did this a lot in TVP back in Katowice that year. Um, and, and it's a good build order because it just gives you so much stuff. There are some scary attacks that can come off it. It also makes you relatively immune to things like 4-gate blink pressure because you will have such a, a well-timed stim and just extra fighting units in the early game. And you can still turn it into a macro build. You don't have to do a two-base timing. It just leads itself into incredibly strong two-base timing. So I'm really keen to see it. I, I remember Coffee was the guy who used to spam this out in uh, in the Chinese region mm -hmm. back in the day. It was so many two and three racks before Starport builds. And indeed, that third barracks is going down. So we're going to be seeing an immense amount of early bio Gary to deal with for Lemon. Lemon's Adept has had some good scouting. These Marines walking all the way across the map. This is a dangerous move. What, yeah. Is he just going to try and overwhelm the Stalker and get kills? I mean, it looks like it. The Reaper is going to grenade the Stalker. The Stalker goes backwards. A couple probes will pull. And so we will get ourselves a couple of kills here. One probe, two probe. We are going to get three. And Stalker had to play afraid. Lost its shields early. And yeah, we're just missing the extra unit to really make this a simple defense. Now four probes go down. All of error early game is going to make up work. Gets an Adept as well with the Cyclone, so not bad pressure. I mean, it's it's these cute little things. I always say, you know, if you can catch a Protoss off guard, it's there's these narrow little windows of like, he's like, oh, no, no, I only need one Adept into one Stalker. Like, that's fine. I can go straight for a third Nexus. And it's like, wait a second, can you? What if I sneak these three Marines around the Adept with a Reaper? And if Lemon didn't react so quickly with the Stalker, if you bounce the Stalker with the first grenade towards the Marines, like that Stalker might just die very quickly as well. So you could kind of see the, the little details there, the mistakes that Oliveira was digging for and trying to force out of his opponent.
He's now going for a giant three racks marine tank timing. His second tank's going to start up now, and he's going to push with the second tank most likely. Maybe wait for the third one. Uh, stopping that off two gate blink is, um, poof. Let's just say his, his hold was impressive last game, but he'll have to do something even more impressive this game. If, if Oliveira commits to the two tank move out, which you normally do with this build, there's going to be so many Marines and tanks, probably a few SCVs for repair, and that can be really hard to stop when you've only got a couple stalkers. That being said, third and fourth gateway goes down for Lemon. He does have the vision with the Observer, which will give him warning of what's going on. So he, he's going to see him move out. Yeah, he knows. And <laughs> now he definitely knows as the Observer goes down. So that's going to be caught. The upgrades are going to be done. Extra gateways coming online here. The Stalkers are going to try in their very low numbers to move forward and to try and force a siege of trying to slow this down at least a little bit. Uh, Reaper taking a shot or two. The cycle in there to fight back. And this army continues to press on forwards. A couple of SCVs already coming in. Stalkers continue to back it up. And the army about to arrive on that third base. No mortal out just yet. It's just Blink Stalkers. One of them already goes down. The shield battery started really late. He took quite a few seconds after seeing his Observer Scan to start it, and that's going to punish him. If he had a battery overcharge already, he could have fought a bit further out. But as it is, Lamin is going to have to give up this third base, and that is very tough. As I said, the hold in the previous game was impressive, but defending this army is so difficult. I mean, remember, we all remember Hero being a massive favorite against Oliveira in that semifinals and crumbling to these sorts of pushes time and again. It's such a vicious stim timing look at the numbers how do you stop that with a handful of stalkers and an immortal the answer is you do not Oliveira going back to his best build order the old tried tested and true and he gets a crisp game two comeback victory yep he shows us what's up man he's just like hey no 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 <laughs> lemon that was cool game one you played well but you know let's actually see how my aggression does against you let's see if you can hold this and and Lemon could not hold it. So Oliveira does indeed, as you say, bring this back to 1-1. One, one. And we are going to be going to game number three to decide this series on Ghost River Pig. What are you thinking about this new map? Because this is the map I'm still kind of a bit more kind of undecided on in this new map pool out of all the maps. This one I'm not quite sold on yet. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I've been playing a lot of Zerg. I've played a lot of games my first week on this map. I was like, this map's so awkward. Oh my gosh, I can only expand in one direction and the push pit path is so close and it's just... It feels weird and I actually really enjoy playing on it now after a little bit more practice and I'm going oh I kind of like this and I, I'm not sure what it is there's just something about the the different kind of engagement patterns on it and stuff and how you do both kind of expand and meet in the kind of bottom center of the map in the late game or over those middle paths in the mid game um it's definitely a map with a short push path there, there is you know the big drop angle just straight into the natural that gets there so quickly there's some nice tank pushes behind the rocks in this matchup where you can elevate uh, I, I really haven't watched enough TVP to have a super tight hold on it, but I think you add that kind of short distance between the players. You combine that with, I mean, a lemon that looks great in a macro game and an Oliveira that looks like he wants to punish it and not really give him too much room to breathe after that game one. And, and it does feel to me like it's going to be a question of like, Lemon probably wants to go four gate blink or something, or at least three gate blink, I think, to have extra safety. I think if he goes two gate blink robo again, we might see him crumble to another vicious timing. It'll probably be a different setup for Oliveira, but I do think he's probably going to take the fight to him at latest, say with Stim and Shields finishing with the kind of standard medevac bio multi prong around eight minutes at the latest. I think Lemon's really going to have to fight for his life. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just looks as though we got set up on the wrong server, so it might be a moment or two, but. Um... You know, I think um, I think it's one of those things, or one of those ideas, right, where a lot of the time you have these players who, like, a lemon looks really good in a macro game, but then he needs the start to be able to feel comfortable, right? And that's, like, what separates him from being one of the very best still versus, like, just a very strong player. And that's why Oliveira's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to come in. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to try and, you know, take these fights, and I'm going to try and throw you off your game. And it's how you deal with that that really kind of, you know, sets you apart there, so... Yeah, we will uh, get into this game number three in a second. Looks though like we were on the right server, just uh, waiting for one of our uh, people to... Well, one of our players to relog, and we'll be off and away. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but I, I think it's going to be tough for Lemon, because I think all of variable will know to get in there, try and disrupt, and Lemon has to kind of get through that point to get to the stage where we've seen him be the best. Well, that's what's been weird in, in this patch, because it was meant to target TVP in certain ways, and obviously all the discussions around that, but... It felt like from day one, the Terrans were playing completely different TVP. Like, and I was like, why are you guys change your builds? Why are we giving so much room? You know, there's so much defensive three command center play from everywhere. And I'm like, 
why are we letting Protoss get to four base for free and, and disruptors? I'm like, it used to be really hard to do that. Why are we letting that happen? I'm like, you know, you, you know, there's stuff that happens on the high level ladder that you don't always see as a caster because it gets like within two or three days, people are like, no, 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 we've got to change the build to this because of this. And then they go back within a few days and like, but the meta develops so quickly on a new map pool um, that we have been kind of left in the wake. But we, we saw it, for instance, in GSL, right? Group stage, Hero, Trounced, Beyond, and Maru in the group stage. Later on, we saw those same Terran players switch their TVP style and be way more aggressive versus their Protoss opponents and really be like, okay, let's not let's not just let the Protoss get three bases and then jump on us with Storm and charge lots or macro to four bases and beyond. So I think we're seeing that same thing here where obviously it's not like Oliveira played uh, super defensive in game one. This is, this is obviously he's just like, yeah, that timing didn't work out. Let's switch it up. Let's make sure we don't delay Stim and Shields too long in game two. Hit like a brick. It's another map for good pushing paths. And we'll see what he can find out. Will Lemon go for the, the, the early robo? You know, something like the Observer first that Firefly went for? That's something I would be tempted to do if I was in his circumstance. Either that or something with a lot of safety baked in, like a four gate blink. Well, let's find out as we set up into it. There's going to be map number three here on Ghost River. In the top left corner is going to be our red Terran player from Dragon Kaiser Gaming. Bringing it back clean and crisply in that game number two, it's Oliveira. And the underdog player who's already impressed us, but did crumble a little bit in the last game, though everybody has crumbled to that push in the past. It is Mystery Gaming's Lemon. I, um, yeah, I, I really feel like this map is uh, uncharted territory in terms of the many different builds the players can do for TVP. We've got to see so much more on these maps to, to figure out exactly where the players will be going. I mean, it felt like that the GSL matches in the top four which is chaos from start to finish and <laughs> no surprises really when you've got those those particular players playing pvt like just just wildly all over the place in terms of the movement and the back and forth and protoss is ahead now terran is ahead um definitely though with that rainer style of, of pvt like we said get ahead and then make a billion gateways and lots of bases and just really really use that production lemon will be looking to ascertain what is happening and then react to it and double gas Usually something you want to choose a safer option against. Yeah, that's um, that's very true. The pressure will build up here from Oliveira. He will be able to get feisty early on. So do something that's not going to kind of leave you vulnerable to that. Make sure that's baked into your build order here. Get you through to that uh, stage nice and comfortably. He has the pro, of course, and double lap the SCV for just a couple of moments. Now the SCV coming across. And obviously this is just Lemon trying to figure out what's going on. Obviously confirms the factory is indeed in the base as well, just in case... And at home, he gets his pile on the low ground, so he can set up a battery there as well if needed, give himself that opportunity. The probe got pushed back without the SEV going down as well, which is nice. Yeah, not, not too annoying. It's not one of those probes at the very start of the game that like forces you to build your barracks out of position and is just running circles, just zapping the whole time and needs an SCV escort or anything like that. Reaper's going to come over across the map. And the Adept first to bounce it away. We haven't seen any Stargate play for Lemon. That may be a, a strategic weakness if he's not feeling confident with Stargate play. I do think there's like um, builds that you you sometimes feel like, oh, I can't do this. If they, if they go Phoenix, it'll be really bad. But if you know your opponent never plays Phoenix, always plays Blink, it gives you an advantage in the, the build picking phase as the Terran. And, and seeing once again, you know, three games in a row, Twilight, definitely that is something that is available to Oliveira. That does not look like it's a proper Reaper wall off, does it? But <laughs> apparently it is. Uh, I stopped judging wall offs a while ago, man. Sometimes I'm like, surely that's a wall off. And then something walks through, and then I'm like, no <laughs> way, and just gets stuck. So, yeah. Sometimes wall offs. The moment are very there's deceiving. any sort of like diagonal involved. Yeah, stuff yeah, just gets exactly. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very true. That's, uh, yeah, the Reaper definitely does not seem like it can get in. Obviously, just trying to poke up, but not really having too much success. Let's uh, just kind of keep on. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think he's thinking the same thing we are. He's like, surely I can get up there, right? <laughs> he believed, man. He believed. Well, uh, Ollie is going for a medevac. And we are seeing uh, so far two gate blink robo. This can still turn into uh, four gate. And the third gate does go down, which bakes in a bit of safety. 
without going too hard. I've actually really enjoyed like some of the three gate blinks that Max Max and a few other players have done recently. So, you know, because you can still be quite aggressive with three gate blink. We're like, well, that's it's four gate is aggressive and three gate is just defensive. And it's like, no, not really. Three gate is both. It can be defensive and offensive. It's it's just the, the more balanced. It's not as extreme one way or the other. Um, Nightmare actually did some really good three gate blinks versus Clem last week in the weekly cup. He looked fantastic with that build. Oh, this drop just snaking nice. through the, the little hole in the fog of war. What a great position as well, because now you go on top of the ramp with the mine. That means you got to give something up just to access oh. the base. So the adept goes down immediately. Now these marines are still chasing a stalker already. We get three probes from lost mine time. We get out at very minimal losses. This really is just nice for Oliveira. Gets in, gets some damage done. Doesn't have to be overly committed. And once again, Pig, we've seen those tanks, seen that liberator. This is kind of what went wrong in that first game. But uh, he's already started off well with a bit of pressure here, so we'll see if he can follow through with some aggression. As that tank at the moment just sieging up in the main base. Yeah, it feels like a more defensive version of it, though, um, because he's already, you know, gone for that drop and so on. Just in that, even though there's a bunker, like the second and third barracks is already down. So he, I think Oliveira is going to fake the push, maybe move out, but I don't think he's going to commit crazy hard. This is like, you know, it was he was like, I need to do damage in game one with the tank push. This time, I think it's going to be more of a poking, get the lib in the main. Lib getting scouted is a problem. That's, uh, you know, you should be very ready for that now as Lemon, now that you know it's coming. Third Nexus does start. It's three gate plus a mortals already building. Oh, and I love this stalker move. That's great. Mm-hmm. Trying to catch this Liberator. Going to get a few shots on it. It's going to be low. It is going to be just about alive, and it will send the dead airspace, but... Not exactly the ideal. Stalker cannot reach it there. And so the Libero will just chill and I guess be a threat. At least it means that you've got to keep in mind that that is there. Otherwise, if you forget about it, it could still get a work or two or get away and get repaired. So there's a chance for the Liberator. Second life given to it as Oliveira slowly starting up those bio upgrades. Stim plus one now on the way. Well, Lemon will have some time to get set up. He's getting his charge coming through, his extra gate and the Nexus obviously as well, including the Forge. Everyone's looking to kind of just move on through to the mid game at this point. Forge is almost finished. We got charge started up. Three more gateways are building. So six gate coming up. Yeah, this is a pretty good setup for Lemon. I mean, the great thing is the Observer sees no third command center. At this point, you're pretty certain, like technically there could be one maybe in the bottom left of the base, but you, with everything you see, you're like, no, no, no. I just got to deal with the two base push and what a streamlined way to deal with it. Look, I'll get the forge. So I have some progression to my army, not to mention immortals and sentries, which adds some, some real staying power, right? But essentially I'm just massing zealots from here. And if I can shut this push down, that's going to be it. Now, Oliveira has less information. He might not realize, oh, you know about this. Um, your observer sees everything. I probably shouldn't actually commit too hard to this push. Like I should probably build the command center on location look for damage but don't overcommit here you know and, and his army actually doesn't have them, that many marines in it like zealots are so dangerous against this if they can get on top of the siege tanks it's an eight marine drop to distract a liberator that's already been shut down and already this force field ambush is deadly olivara moves into the ambush and oh you know what saving the tank slick micro by ollie that could have been so much worse for him he actually I mean, life gives you lemons. He makes lemonade out of that one for sure. That should have been a disaster. And he's actually way ahead on the units lost. That's actually wild, right? I mean, lemons ambush, ambushed himself somehow. I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know why. But apparently that's the result there is that Libera is going to relocate. It's going to go elsewhere. Now we recall into the main base. So there's a single medevac. This gives the lip maybe a chance to siege this natural. And Oliver starts to be everywhere. And of course, at some point, he might even still try and move that army further forwards again. Three probes go down. Now the Stalkers will get in there to clean up that lid, but that means, again, everything is pulled back. And so here we go. The zombie oh. moving forward from Oliveira, and he's in the middle of the map already. Dude, this, this army gets across the map so quickly here. That's what you got to be careful of on this one. Third Command Center is already almost finished behind this as well, so he doesn't need to win the game right now. There's, it's just Stalkers. It's a low-tier army for Lemon. Lemon needs a flank on this. He needs to crush this army, but he's coming from a slightly awkward angle on the right with those rocks in between him. Uh, the bio is going to come around. He's, he's got Guardian Shield. The Zealot and the Stalker in the south are very far away. They're going to try to come in now. He's going for it. Here we go. Lemon's going to try to break this army. The Widow Mine's getting some big splashes on the Zealots, but a couple of the tanks are already going down. Immortals laying down some damage on the exposed two tanks. The one tank in the back does a lot of damage, as does the bio. It's just Stalker sentries and Immortals trying to chase down. He does blink to chase down one of the Medivacs. Good move here for Lemon, but Oliveira sieging a lib, stimming more units. He's got Widow Mines to fall back on the blink. Forward is super decisive. Lemon feeling confident right now, and with good reason. Ah, that change on the Observer as well, 
mate. We finally see it in a pro match. The Observer does not die to Widowmine's Flash anymore. 10 extra hit points makes a world of difference. Yep, he gets to live. The Obs gets to sit out the front, and Oliveira unsuccessful on this push. Fleming gets the cleanup, is on his way to base number four, while Oliveira still has to figure out moving his own third base across. So looking to work on that in the next moment or two. Oliveira just scanned, but didn't catch anything. This Observer now moving away as it uh, realizes it might be being hunted. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, again, good cleanup for Lemon. And suddenly he kind of start having vibes from that game one, right? He gets a defense. He gets to start macroing up a little bit. It's maybe not as decisive as that game one, but it's definitely got, like I say, that kind of vibe. And now we're actually going to see him in the middle of the map. He's going to catch these units again. He's been very decisive with these engagements. He's been immediately ready to blink through and all the rest of it. So he's had no hesitation about that. And it's, it's so good. This is what I was saying about him playing dangerous. Oliveira in game one is like when your opponent's doing this, like getting out here is dangerous, but he's going to try and turn it into a trap as he comes down with the rest of his force. Have these immortals chased too far? The answer, I think, is yes. That's a damaged bio army. He has to fight. I don't think you can run because concussive shells here. A few zealots do come in. Uh, as those zealots come in, maybe he can turn this into a, a, a kind of safety force and, and actually retreat off the map. Both sides back away with a bit more respect for each other. Remember, three Immortals never died in game one. They just kept trading. This time, one of the Immortals goes down. The other two are still looking healthy. Disruptors have started the fourth base. Get a scan. Oliveira goes, ah, oh, crud. He does have a fourth. That's got to feel awkward. You know, that's not going to feel great for me. He splits a double drop off on the south while he tries to focus on a defensive setup at home. The Observer goes in for Lemon, though. He might just die. That is a tiny Terran army. There is nothing there, man. Nope. There is uh, really nothing at all. A couple of mines uh, are going to be the, the safety net at the moment. And uh, Oliveira really doesn't have much here at all. Lemon showing up on this third base. Going to knock down these couple of mines. Widow mines firing through. And we are just going to keep on going. I mean, the mines are gone. This third base is in a lot of trouble. We are dropping across the map at the same time. The SCVs pull in here. Lemon needs to decide, does he want to finish off the base or fight the army? He's going to fight the army. Disruptor shot was flanking in. The Zealots are kind of figuring out what they're doing. We've already killed 23 SCVs. Oliveira is going to probably deny the fourth base. He loses the third CC at the same time, though. And they're actually going to get Dude, to recall on the fourth the base. Yeah, he's not. Not even. Wow. He F2'd at home. In, in panic in that defense, he F2'd this drop home, delayed it by a good 10, 15 seconds. You know, it was, it was a really, it, it was a bad situation either way. Oh, no was in the dead space even that full medevac goes down dude lemon is just playing some absolutely sweet starcraft today he is looking fantastic i i, I am just amazed it's so decisive oh it's so all controlling and lemon is now two for zero in protoss first terran series against Oliveira. back to back wins two days in a row Damn, dude, talk about surpassing people's expectations. Comes in as an underdog who's normally not even in the contention for top four in the region and uh, has already dethroned the champ in the Swiss stage. That is a great way to kick off this season of the ESL Masters Spring. Yeah, man, I mean, that what a wild, wild result. This is not one that anyone would have really predicted. And it just means that Lemon now is in such a good spot as well. His route, by the way, has not been easy to just reinforce that yesterday he played against Nice, or the last time he played, he played against Nice. That was a victory. Now he's just beaten Oliveira. Those are two of the tougher guys in the Asia region. And Lemon is going to have three shots at making playoffs. He is a player to be watching out for here in this Asia region. That is absolutely bonkers. Oliveira is now going to be one and one in this group and we'll be facing one of the other players that's one and one next week what a surprise i mean that's so exciting i i love to see you know players coming up and challenging the established guys and uh yeah beating nice was a pretty big upset beating yeah. Oliveira. <laughs> yeah uh, oh my oh my <laughs> oh my indeed well we do have plenty more games to come it's gonna be one more pvt up next yeishi taking on coffee that'll be followed by cyan versus has we round out all the players that started off the day on one and oh and our second half of the day we're going to be going to the players who are zero and one right now so we'll talk a bit more about that later for now a quick break when we return it is that yeishi versus coffee best of three tvp that's five minutes again Sick. Did you say Yeshi? Yeah, I say Yeshi sometimes. I, I can't say it properly, so. I mean, I just say Yeshi, and I know yeah, it's like not correct. But it's funny because like people are like, oh, can you at least say the player's names right? And I looked it up ages ago, and when I Googled it, how to pronounce Yeshi, it literally just came up with Chang Kai Shek. And I was like, what? <laughs> I think because he's the most famous person whose nickname was Yeshi or something uh -huh. like that. And I was like, I need it.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, as we are heading into Yeshi versus Coffee for the TVP. And uh, we're going to be getting into this in just a moment. We just need to get Pig on in here. And uh, we are going to be good to go. Yeah, I know you guys are getting very excited. Me and Pig were on doing some very juicy conversation about the um, the pronunciation of Yeshi that you guys got to listen in on. But uh, yeah, but how will we butcher to... the Chinese players' ideas <laughs> today? Yeah, <laughs> this episode. That, that is as exciting yeah. as it gets. So you guys really got to listen in. <laughs> It, it really is funny because like there there are so many times as well where you like you learn the correct pronunciation of something and then there's like yeah i can say that if i practice it 500 times in a row but naturally saying that while commentating it's going to go straight back to like whatever the other one is so there's always there's always like a middle ground right where i'm like okay let's uh let's I, figure out how we could do this and I, hopefully I, all consistently say yeah. it the same way is also more important as commentators i think i i always found that uh with with yeshi's name as well like yeshi yeshi when I listen to it, I just can't get the same sound to come out of my mouth. So I'm just like, yeah, GG, man. I'm good. I just I just live with it. And I'm just calling the Blue Protoss for the majority <laughs> of this series as we are going to be kicking it off. In the bottom right-hand corner, though, I'm going to get the easy intro with our Red Terran player from Mystery Gaming. It is Coffee. Well, you're going to need a nice steam. If you want to stop the Terran pushes that are coming across this map in the top left, Left snap in the blue, it is Jayshi. This is another fun series because Jayshi is one of those players who has continued to push for the kind of, you know, one of the top spots in China. And, you know, he consistently was kind of getting up there. And he's just not quite had that kind of bigger figure in the finish. He's not been able to go all the way. He's kind of been outperformed by Firefly. And then I say it's interesting because Coffee to me is. Kind of very similar to XY, you know, he plays a bit more wilder, he plays a bit more aggressively, he has his own build. So it's, to me, a bit of a recall to our first series of the day where Firefly took on XY. Uh, these are a very similar set of playstyles in my eyes. 100%. You know, it is funny as well because you've got, obviously, Jayshi playing for DKZ. You've got Coffee playing for Mystery Gaming. Um, but it's actually Jayshi whose ID used to be Mystery as well. So that always kind of does mm, my head in a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> he changed his name at some point. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, it's weird because statistically Coffee preys on, on Jayshi. Uh, he has got just great builds. Like, he's so good with his timing attacks and the like. And I think overall, Jayshi, I mean, Jayshi's had moments where he's beat Oliveira and dethroned him. It's, it's happened before for like yep. a season a couple of years ago. And he's had these moments where he looks so fantastic. But Coffee is just like his Achilles heel. It's it's his kryptonite. Um, Coffee always has a build order to catch him off guard. And right when you think Jayshi can stop the frontal pushes, it's when Coffee goes into this like chaotic, I'm going to drop four places at once. And I might not be microing every drop, but you're definitely not defending four things at once correctly either. And I'm just going to overwhelm you with chaos. So occasionally Coffee will bring that out. More often than not, it's just a really crisp timing attack from Coffee. As you said, X, Y, and him do share a fair few builds together. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Jayshi can bring out. Can he find a way to stabilize as his recent results against Coffee have been very one-sided in the Terran's favor? Yeah, Coffee, to be fair, has as well, I feel like, since kind of eaten up this year, but it was last year, right, where he beat Zaun. And uh, since then, it's like, we've had a bit more of an eye on Coffee, and he's had a couple of good results as well, so it has been cool to kind of follow that. And, um, yeah, just, I mean, Coffee has been... He kind of leveled up and then kind of just has stayed at that kind of very high level where suddenly he's no longer kind of to like me, like a top 16er in Asia, but like he's really like a top four to top eight in Asia. So, yeah, there's that yeah. Uh, aspect to it as well. Of course, both these guys are one to know in the group so far. So both looking to kind of well, he, keep clean. He invents the builds. Oliveira goes and wins with them. I yeah, think. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the way I look at it. I'm like, especially in this matchup, uh, getting scouted straight away, not great. This is that three rex build, which I told you guys when Oliveira did this, like, I'm like, man, this is the coffee build. Like, I remember the first time I saw, it was back on the Blackburn map pool when I really became a big coffee fan. Because I remember watching him and I was like, I didn't feel like anything was blitzing fast. You know, this pro game is like this kind of um, Shin, used to be Ragnarok, I feel like, is kind of like this for Zerg. It doesn't feel like he's doing things that are impossible to execute. They're just really smart and well-planned. And I think that's that's what coffee strikes me as. Whereas I look at the way he plays and I go, oh, I, I might be able to kind of replicate that and like do that on the ladder at my own level and make something work. Whereas 
Other guys, sometimes it looks like what they're doing is just so knife's edge and flashy and hard to pull off under pressure. You're like, oh man, I can't, I can't even copy that at all. Like there's, there's nothing to learn, but Coffee, he's, he's really good at optimizing these pushes, having his whole build designed towards a very sharp point. And uh, yeah, the Reaper gets denied, but he knows it's blink. He can see that it looks like a two gate blink robo, simply because you see a probe looking to take a third at four minutes. That's what you're assuming. It's like around that phase. Now, of course, we know it's actually a three gate, so it is a little bit safer. And that's going to be very important because you do not want to go two gate blink robo against a man that's building just nothing but Marines and tank or tanks off uh, three racks in a factory, skipping the starport to get a massive army on the map. Yeah, I'm just going to go for as much as possible here, really power up and uh, obviously provide some aggression. In the fairly near future, the Stalker's poke and they get rid of one SCV, but nothing too major. Just going to finish that wall off as coffee and okay, uh, Jayshi is going to just go make his way into that robo base. So getting himself teched up, trying to get those important tech units out to help him with this incoming push that you're expecting to see from coffee sooner rather than later. As that still will be done soon, we'll see if he wants to go. He is starting the starport as well for the future medivacs. You know, it would have been 300 IQ this game. So basically what's happened is Coffee's 3-Rex factory got scouted. So he's playing the more conservative approach where you add the third gas, you add the starport, you add the eBay, you get upgrades. The, the really, really 300 IQ thing would be if he just like pulled the boys and shoved with his first two tanks. and was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going with stim and shields like the moment this stuff's ready. Like, I, I know you know it's coming, so it shouldn't be good, but I'm just going to go even harder into the attack. Whereas as it is, it feels like JC has had all the information to prepare for this. You know, we're going to we get the Robo Bay up. We've got Charge, Forge, not going too hard on the probes, but enough to still have a nice advantage. Picking off depots and now a Marine or two going down. This is really well done by our Protoss player. I just want to see like a Colossus start after this Immortal, which, yep, he has indeed started. And a lot of Chrono Boosts into that. And it feels like, yeah, I mean, you scan, you see this. Coffee's trying to make intelligent decisions right now, but I think Jayshi has the kind of momentum with a forward position, a balanced set of tech going down. Coffee, he's looking more and more committed to a two base push, but he's going to have to move out soon or it's going to get even harder to make this work over time. Yeah, it, it, the longer he waits, it just feels as though the more opportunity there's going to be for Jayshi to have everything he needs, right? I mean, the Colossus count is growing, the extended thermal lances do want to be done if we don't get moving soon. We build two more barracks up for the future, but again, there has to be something in the right now as well. And we are starting to make a little bit of progress out the front. I think at this point, coffee's taken so long. He Oh, I was going to say, I think he has okay. to wait. <laughs> I was like, I think he needs to wait for like a few Vikings and Marauders and just keep building tanks and get up to like a bunch of Vikings and tanks. But he's actually shoving it and force field's so good here. Force field's so good. The Colossus is out. Second force field, maybe not that important. I think one more force field to buy time on this ramp and keep warping in one or two more sentries. And the charge is done. The gateway count's coming up. The second Colossus is almost here. The Marines and the SCVs are getting ravaged. You really can't push forward very effectively. This is so nasty for Coffee. It feels like Jayshi has all the positions. But keep in mind, Coffee doggedly knows where the win condition is. He will not back away from this. He's committed. He's going to go for it. He's stepping on top. There's no more sentries here. Just one force field. The Colossus is going to get jumped on. It goes down. That is huge. The second Colossus is out on the map. It's going to arrive. But there aren't that many zealots yet. My lord, what a crazy shove from Coffee. The Immortal gets a eviscerated by the siege tanks a wild fight here the colossus can't do anything to the tanks he's got to back away jayshi does not have the numbers i cannot believe coffee is breaking through i'm telling you this guy is a mad lad jayshi seems to have had everything ready and yeah he's gonna have to give up this third base i don't think he can fight right now he doesn't have the numbers yeah he does not and all he, he that the first colossus going down the way it did was absolutely uh devastating quite frankly that is going to be so costly and uh, that just allows Coffee to really push in and to get into this space here, get rid of this third base. And Pig, we have got ourselves Coffee. He's got a cut off. Trying to make oh, it work. Oh, We're going to go. We're going to send us the tanks re siege, but the Colossi are not going to last for long. There's Elf put in work. Can we get rid of enough uh, tanks here? Uh, the, the Colossus going down is a disaster, but he might just have enough Stalkers and Zelts to do it. Remember, he's two base against just 36 worker Terran. But I think he's got to pull back this Jayshi. Wait for another Colossus. He's overextending into the bio right now. The bio ball is there. He, he could have cut off the reinforcement with charge lots earlier. He needed to do that. But because Coffee's been rallying to the front, this little set of bio is a problem. He will hold with the battery overcharge, though. He's going to even take out a medevac. Not too bad. Bit of a force field going down. Fighting so far in front of his base. Jayshi does have a new third on the south side. Coffee is basically just building Marines, Marauders, Vikings, trying to gather up an army. But it feels like I think it's a good enough hold for Jayshi because you kept most of your workers alive. But it was definitely nail-bitingly close. And I think Coffee's just going to build up to round two and probably go again sometime in the next minute. 
here. I mean, he's got not really got any other option, right? So he just has to go one more time and with denying the third and everything and get rid of the tech count. It gives him the possibility of making it work out. You know, beforehand, if none of that happened, going again right now is almost always a doomed experience. But this time it actually has that little bit of potential. It actually has a little bit of hope and possibility. So I'm going to get this uh, moving. As you do see the Observer, going to get caught by the Viking and a few Marines. And yeah, it's just a matter of time. What is the what's the goal moment here for coffee? Like, when do you decide that, okay, that's enough time to send it? Uh, I think you kind of need the units to build to a natural power point. He's decided three tanks, a couple of Vikings. He's got a good set of Marauders up front with Concussive. He said, let's pull the boys again. He's going to keep building boys again behind this for another potential, you know, round and maybe moving his base out. SCVs get spotted. Stalkers will be happy to pick off as many of these <laughs> as they can. They, they should just go behind this army. That's the correct blink path. He actually recalls to rejoin everything on the front. I, I do think that's a pretty good Protoss force here, especially if he gets a battery overcharge up during the fight. Guardian shield is big here. Oh, no battery overcharge. He didn't save energy on his neck side. That is an issue. He's not got many zealots in here either. Oh, but the bio is thinning out. The SCVs are gone. Those SCVs being gone is massive. And the battery overcharge, even though it was delayed, no. does join the frame. But the Colossus rallying into the Viking Marauder disappears so quickly. Uh, once again, maybe give up the base counterattack with Zealots. Cutting off the reinforce or coming from behind with Zealots would be huge. That Colossus. Oh, it's oh, in trouble. It's going to yep. go down. Every every Colossus has just had a bad time in this match, man. As the Zealots get through, the Zealots are probably the answer right now because the tanks don't do as well against them. But you kind of need enough Zealots for that to really you know, happen in the first place. Now this base is going down. We're going to lose this income uh, availability. And that is going to be Coffee. He still has the siege position set up, doubling the army supply of his opponent and looking good to take this game one somehow in some way because it really felt as though his timing was shut down. It really felt as though he didn't get it. He got the moment where he's like, right, this is it. I got a shove. And he just kept getting enough in each of the trades as these few Zelds are going to charge forward Ooh. and we don't kill Zelds very quickly. We're going to have to micro the tank back in the medevac. Keep it a micro. The Immortal and the Archon get into work. And again, those tech units are so hard to get rid of for coffee. That's why Yeshi or Yeshi has a little bit of an opportunity here at least. Oh, the Archon does pull back, gets itself healed a bit. Immortal Archon Zealot coming forward. Dude, he can still hold. This Immortal Archon is doing so well. Landed Vikings, these damage Marauders doing nothing. Coffee needs to pull back. I, yeah, I mean, you've lost your third. You need a new Nexus desperately. But at the same time, Coffee needs to move his main down. Like, Coffee should have done this a while ago. His, his main is mining out. I know he doesn't have that many workers, but he's got plenty of gas. So he transfers from the main to the natural. He should move that command center down. He can maintain some mining. Ah, it kind of feels like the point where you, you maybe want a multi-prong to take advantage of the fact that there's no stalkers. If you can make Jayshi mo make more stalkers, stalkers are the kind of low-quality units Protoss really doesn't want to spend money on in this scenario. So maybe do a little bit of a drop in the back. If you can deny that third one more time, perhaps you can make something happen. Coffee is doggedly committed to this. And honestly, the fact that he's making this look so good when Jayshi had every piece of information and warning about what was happening in this game, it, it makes me worry a little bit for Jayshi's uh, ability in a game where Coffee denies scouting better. Like if Coffee could have denied the info, Jayshi, I don't think would have had any chance of defending these waves because he knew minutes ahead of time still is struggling. And that bodes very well for the Terran player in the future of the series, even though right now I would say Jayshi is favored. Yeah, he's down in army supply, but he's got two next side building and he's doing nothing but making a mortal arc on Zealot, which is the most efficient army for him to try to hang on this game. Yeah, again, the double expander, but puts the pressure on Coffee again. His army supply lead Coffee is not as big as before. And you look at the units and you're right. It's the kind of units now from Jayshi which just look better when it comes to these trades than what we've had before. The Colossi obviously never really got to stay up alive long enough, but these Archons are going to be tough to get rid of. The only concern, I guess, is these Liberators are going to be tough to get rid of on the side of the Protoss player. Um, so that's going to add to kind of the siege potential of this, but if we have enough from Jayshi and he can just attack in, we are just going to be able to take the Concave attack through. A couple lib shots aren't going to make the difference. As, uh, well, actually, he's going to get the catch on the back side of this, so grab the tanks before they siege, and the libs are going to be split oh. apart a bit weirdly as well. And that disrupt shot, okay, does get denied at least, because that could have been deadly, but the Archons are all in this fight pick, and they are whacking away. We've got Zelda coming in from the left-hand side. The SCVs are over on that location, and as units awkward land, time. is it going to be enough? It's just a wild it's time. So, it, it's so awkward. The Zealots all charged on a rallying Marine at the start on the right side of that fight, which was a disaster for Jayshi. That being said, the SCVs were all just doing nothing on the left side, fighting the Zealots as well. So there was, there was kind of, you know, parts which were good for each player, parts which were bad for each player. Jayshi's trying to whoop in Stalkers, but once again, that third base is going down. He's got a fourth in the north. You know, he has another base. I think Jayshi can still recover from this. He could definitely take that Liberator out from behind and just blink away. 
keep whopping in more zealots a new colossus coming in is huge you, you do need to have a colossus in the mix you know um but yeah i think the zealots charging awkwardly it felt like jc just wasn't as confident with, with when he jumped on the army right with, and then th that tiny bit of hesitancy meant that rallying marine came from the right and the attack movement all the zealots went hey that's the closest enemy unit let's charge away from the army which is the opposite of what you want them to do and uh, unfortunately, that works in Coffee's favor. I think Jaishi had an army that should have trounced him, especially getting him before he was sieged. Ends up being a much closer trade than he would like. Their neck and neck and army supply, that still bodes well for Protoss. This command center hasn't moved down yet. Coffee has pulled more workers with every wave, 15 against 50. This looks like Jaishi is finally going to weather the storm. I think he may have had to pay part of his soul to do it, though. Honestly, he's a couple Horcrux down after this game. He's feeling stressed. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's had to re <laughs> really really give it his best to kind of survive through and, and somehow just about eke out the victory because again at first it looked so good for him and then to be put through all these stresses and these close engagements and coffee just about getting the jump on you and everything what a wild time ggs game number one does go the way of jc our pros play is going to grab the opening map here but uh yeah that's that is honestly again pretty wild if you ask me because uh I don't think Coffee should have been able to have a chance, and then he made it so close repeatedly. That was that was a good good game, good time. I think the biggest um, issue there was not cutting off the reinforcement. Um, remember when the first SCV pool came and the Stalkers spotted it, or maybe it was the second one, and they kind of recalled home. I think he should have kept the Stalkers behind the Terran army. I think what that army suffers from is it's so inflexible. When you pull the boys with a tank-based yeah. army, it is one of the slowest blobs of immobility, and you don't really understand this until you play with this all in a protoss player that refuses to fight you front on and just like goes around behind and chips at you from behind you're always worried about the zealot stalker flank coming in and clearing your tanks from behind but then if you're spreading bio behind your army you're not pushing in as deep your tanks have to siege whenever they think there's a fight that's about to happen and then it takes them forever to unsiege and move around and all of this buys you time stops him from reinforcing his army gets you some free kills so you can kind of use this you see zerg do this all the time where it's like you go around you cut off the reinforcement you go for kind of the counter attack that forces them to group up their units at home a little bit and then you just turn it into a flanking army so you get kind of double value out of the one army assuming you can hold off the straight shove into your base at home which is kind of reliant on colossus and stutter stepping and batteries that first colossus getting jumped on by the marines was a really big problem so he needed to get either one more force field on the ramp when he tried to do the the, the hold at the front middle choke point or he needed to pull back to his battery just a little bit earlier if jc did either of those um, or came with some zealots from behind. Like I said, I do think that could have been a simpler hold. The question is, after such a stressful game, are you really in a calm enough mental state to like make those really minute adjustments that usually only come after studying a replay for a good 10, 15 minutes? He doesn't get to see everything we do. So we're going to see what happens in game two. Well, we get into it. And we're going to start off down in the bottom left-hand side with the blue Terran player. It is Coffee. Playing for Mystery Gaming. His opponent, formerly of the ID, Mystery, a very good Protoss player. He's had moments where he has won the Chinese region in years past. Now in the combined Asian region, looking for another shot at it. In the top right, it's Jaishi. I'm excited to see Alcyne because that definitely feels like a step away from that potential of an SCV pull or the super aggressive play for Coffee, so... Yes, Coffee is that kind of guy. So then how does he make that happen on a map like Alcyone? Because again, like I say, it is normal to kind of SCV pull on this map. It's that little bit larger. You generally see the more macro focus games here. That's something Coffee's okay to go into. He is at least going to open double gas, so the pressure will be on from the start. We'll see how heavy it'll be with what he builds next. Getting scouted when you're going for that 3RX build feels pretty terrible. Terrible. I, I think, you know, losing a game sucks like that as Coffee. On the other hand, I think you feel pretty confident going, hey, man, I got my 3RX scouted. I, I ended up pushing really late. Probably shouldn't have worked. Almost did. Like, hey, that's not too bad. We're going to have even different range of timings available. Now, the Double Gas build also has 3RX marine tank timings that you can do, and they hit so fast. You have next to no economy off them. You know, your, your command center is quite delayed off of the double gas opening. So they are even more committed, but it is something that demands an even bigger response from Protoss. So we'll see if Coffee does stick with kind of the same format, but just sped up a little bit, or if he's going to change it up drastically and uh, maybe go for some Widow Mine Harass, maybe get a Liberator in there. We've seen a lot of Liberators so far. So 
I wouldn't mind seeing the, the Liberators. They haven't really found the mark so far today, though, have they? No, Libs have been quite crap, quite crap today, to be honest, haven't they? They've just been... Uh, <laughs> they've, just, they've just not been that good, even when they've kind of sieged up and got a couple kills. Yeah, they've not been amazing. It's, uh, we'll see if Coffee wants to go that route or not. Uh, currently just getting his factory finishing. CC will build high ground as well. It's very common because you're just saying, no, nope, no nonsense, not going to deal with you trying to delay, delay that or anything. So just builds that high ground, builds that safely. We'll get a Helene now to join this Reaper on the scouting process. And Jay, she's not going to waste time. He goes straight into the Twilight Council. So, okay, I I'm seeing a pattern today. We haven't really seen much Stargate play in PBT. Um, if that's something regionally where none of the Protoss players are doing it, that can be taken advantage of. And I'm kind of thinking back to my basics. I'm like, I know it's bad if you only do one opening. Normally, historically, it was proxy Hellions. Mm -hmm. It was really like, it, it could do crazy damage if you don't have like Oracles or Phoenix, right? If it catches you off guard, uh, you can you can really run in and get out of control with some of those more aggressive openings. In this case, though, it's going to be Reaper Hellion. Three Reapers and a Hellion, maybe two Hellions. There is a third gateway unit building. It was a big delay in starting it. But if he has two Stalkers in the depth, he should be okay. But hey, is that adept going to be able to survive is the real question. Yeah, it's going to get caught immediately. It does get the shade out, but it's on the bottom left. So that's not going to be back at home to help defend unless we expend a recall or something. And uh, one Marine actually going to come down here. That adept is low. Going to have a shield regen reset. And now going to be backed into the corner. That Marine's going to go for a Marine does get that kill. The wall off is here though, Pig. And so three Reapers and two Hellions will just hit the wall and not much else. Yeah, good idea to just go for the full wall. Plan is to cancel that gateway once the battery's up. Great defense by our Protoss player. Jay Shi's looking clean and no doubt thinking about a third Nexus in the follow through. Now we do already have Tech Labs building at home and it is three barracks without a starport. I mean, it's funny because like I said, I, I found out about this coffee build in like 2019, <laughs> something like that. I was like, this is a cool build. <laughs> 2024 coffee's like, I still am the expert of three racks with tank <laughs> variations, man. He's he's like, I, I know how to kill people with this. Dude, is he going no stim, no shields, double marauder concussive shells? Get what? Shields. Yeah, that, that's that wild. That is crazy. And it, oh, he doesn't have medivac, so he doesn't want to stim. How, yeah. how, how funny is that? <laughs> I, and, and yet it's actually going to be good against a blinker, right? Because it's going to be so stalker heavy. Having this amount of marauders could make this a very difficult defense for uh, for Jayshi. So, yeah, Coffee has potential, man. I mean, we will see how quickly he goes. I think it's going to be a factor. He's obviously got combat shield on the way. It's not going to be done just yet. The stalkers now do show that blink and go on top of one of those Hellions. Get that kill here. Oh. But even that, just Coffee knowing where this army is and kind of dragging it to the upper left. Maybe making a move for him to get across the map. He's waiting for the third. No, he's moving out now. Yeah, not waiting for the third tank. Now is the go time. No SCVs for repair. It's a pretty vicious timing attack, but on the other hand, you do have... Oh, only two gate. Okay, I was going to say, you've got charge coming in. That's going to be done soon. And I'm like, yeah, you don't actually have much with it. There we go. SCVs are coming across the map as well. There's only a third gateway coming in. There are immortals being built as well as batteries. Good positioning for Jayshi. The question is, can his production truly handle such a, a very committed push? The Stalkers are getting great value so far. The concussive shells, though, does force him to be a little bit more conservative with his blink micro. I can't wait to see what the hell goes on here. This is a very committed push for Coffee. He's going to siege his tanks back here battery overcharge goes down and it's gonna be of course no stims to worry about you might be wondering where's the stim remember stim is not being made with this push this is i'm gonna build bunkers i'm gonna siege my tanks and i'm gonna give you a bloody hard time the stalkers Ooh. blink forward on the tanks a crazy move but i think it's worth it if he can get both but he only gets one tank yeah one tank is rough because this other tank's still firing you give up all your stalkers for that that was going to happen because of the fact it's so marauder heavy and that just means that this fight is continuing to go the way of coffee jay she just can't get the units up Immortals, in theory, is still good here because they do bonus damage to pretty much everything that exists, but we've lost one. The new one's not going to be here for a bit as uh, JC tries to replay recovery. I mean, to be fair, if JC gives up his third, is that the worst thing in the world? Because he is ahead by no. a lot of workers, so he can survive on two bases. You're 100% right, Wardy. I mean, that's it. You might be like, how are these pushes so strong? There's a rule in StarCraft. If what your opponents build, it seems too good. 
it means they're giving up something you don't realize. And in this case, it's any semblance of an economy behind it. Coffee's economy sucks. He pulled the boys, like a bunch of them. He never had that many to begin with. Remember, this was off a double gas opening with an already delayed expansion. But if he gets that Robo, that would be massive. The Robo, second Immortal will get out. The Zealots are so good at tanking. Dude, Immortal Zealot shreds this army so hard. Oh. It's so, oh, the Immortals are gonna clear the tanks. The tanks are gonna go down. That's a hold, I think, just barely. It's so close. I know this tank surviving again, just one of the tanks staying alive is such a big deal, but we are gonna get Zealots on it. We will kill the Zed tank off. The Robo facility, like I said, still alive, but low HP. So if that gets finished off and we can't build more Immortals, I do really worry is, I mean, maybe we battery it up or something. Oh, Robo, oh, super battery last no second charge. is going to save it. Oh, my God. No it's way. actually going to live for now. I mean, Zealot's still moving through. There's just not DPS to clean out Zealots easily. That's the problem that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's a good position, though. The Zealots really can't get in with an Immortal there, though. I think you can just click shift click the Marauders down. Because once the Immortals yeah. in range of the Marauders and the tanks, like, the Zealots just don't die. And, and there's nothing to kill the Immortal either. Yeah, that is huge. Now yeah. he can break out and Jay she's fine. How, how crazy is that, right? It looks so stressful, but Zealots and Immortals counter this so hard, yeah. as you pointed out earlier. And, and the new SCVs arrive too late, man. He's like, oh, I can finish the bunker. Oh gosh, I've got nothing to put inside it. Remember, there's no plus one weapons. The eBay's just started. The starport's just begun. There's, there's, there's levels of commitment. You know, when you've got 32 workers and four SCVs on the front and no starport and no eBay, there's a reason why this push hits so hard. Or this 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 push just just gets in there, and actually it does get a few zealots as well. But Jay Shi, I mean, he's going Templar Archives to spend gas, taking a Nexus and a gas, maybe a little dangerous. And uh, overall, though, Jay Shi's now got got such a powerful spot, and Coffee just has no follow through. These pushes are the very definition of all in. Yeah. Yep. The, the, there's no follow up to these, right? I mean, you are so committed. We're gonna add two more barracks. Never think about third CC here, says Coffee. Jay, she's going to go Storm. That just feels... Well, it's just so risky. Because if you're Storm, you're only going to have a couple high temple. If your Storm misses, it's a lot of investment that doesn't go anywhere. And maybe that gives Coffee one more chance. But, well, I guess if a Storm does hit, it's going to be pretty brutal for Coffee. He does see the high temple for the first time there as he moves on to that third base location. He sees what's up. And he is going to start moving out once again. First Medivac's on the way, but only the first. And there's already units that are hurting out on the map. So that's going to be busy healing from the very first moments of his life. Um, yeah, Coffee's going to send it here, and obviously every attack feels like it could very well be the last one from him. The SCVs are pulling once more. Jayshi, I think he's going to have Storm for this pick. Yeah, the Observers have seen everything. He's been chrono-boosting Storm the moment he saw it move out. It's going to be ready in a few seconds. Uh, about 10 seconds out, and, and that's going to be good enough. Siege tanks, Marauders, and Marines gathering up on the front, taking a good position. But here comes the Zealot Immortal Storm. He's going to try and storm across these weak units. Zealots, even storming the SCVs. Yeah, it storms his own Zealots as well, but it's worth it to clear the meat shield. The tanks focusing down the High Templar was a very smooth move for Coffee, but I don't think he has enough meat behind it. The Immortal line stands strong. The Immortals cleanse their tanks. 19 workers down. Coffee's going to have to tap out some cool two base all ends. But you have to give it to Jayshi. Good scouting, good reactions, and good scrappy fighting. Slowly giving up ground, taking fights, and then giving up the third base when needed. Giving up the third base a second time, and then a third time, and then a fourth time in game one. <laughs> and eventually surviving with Immortals, Zealots, and Archons. Very well played by Jayshi. It was a, a very impressive uh, series, like you say. That first game became way more stressful than we initially ever imagined it could have been. Um, but he kept it alive, he kept it going, he kept his game you know, within reach. Gave himself the chance, and he was able to deliver in that game too as well. It was stressful, it was close, it was so nearly there for Coffee, but you're right. When it comes down to what was built, Immortals and Zealots, and the Marauders just don't get rid of those units at all. And that uh, became the issue, which means that Yeshi, or Yeshi is going to take another win, and that is the day of Protoss so far, Pig. We have just had all the Protoss players beating the Terrans. Firefly over XY, Lemon over Oliveira, the upset. Yeshi over Coffee, and uh, yeah. PVT, very Protoss favored today. Coming up next, Cyan versus Has PVP, our last 1-0 versus 1-0 match before we head into the 0-1 matches on the second half of this Asia region. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back with it in just a few.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody. As we get ready to go into PvP action here, uh, we're all in the lobby and we're all set to go. It is time for Hass vs. Science. Kind of fun PvP pick. Heck yeah, dude. I mean, you show me a Hass game and... Honestly, you know it's going to be fun. It's going to be a little bit unpredictable. It will be exciting because Hass is a man who I was just telling you before. I mean, honestly, I used to think PvP was a matchup which is is based on uh, deep strategic knowledge. But I've interviewed Hass about 20 times over the last few years. And do you know what his answer is every time when I ask him about this matchup? No matter what the question is, anything to do with a PvP matchup, he says, I just got lucky. It's just a coin flip. That's what PvP is. And I'm like, no, no, no. Your builds were well prepared. You had strategy. He, he gives nothing away. Either the man truly believes it because his answer is so consistent, or he, he's actually just hiding his secrets. I don't know for sure. I know that when you watch Hass play, you go, what is he doing? Is this a real build? Oh my god. That's a really, really nasty build. And pretty much everyone in this region is afraid of him. They know that over the last few years, he has just, I think, if anything, become even filthier in terms of his builds, his surprises, his little just nasty tricks that he tries to pull out. But uh, going up against such a solid player in terms of the red Protoss, it's going to be very hard for him. So introducing our red player in the top left of the map, one of China's finest, it is Cyan. And already with the probe moving across the map from the upper right, our blue Protoss is Hass. Proxy in the natural. This is going to be interesting. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and these two are pretty matched, uh, well matched historically in terms of pro play as well. So we're going to see a proxy gate come in behind the natural on this uh, short rush distance map. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to be safe. I'm going to scout after my gateway, but <laughs> he's not going to have that much time to respond. A couple of gateways will go down. Uh, is it going to be two or three? I think it's going to be a three gate proxy, but it could just be two gate into a gas and a cyber core. No, he's not probing. It's going to be three gate zealot. My lord. Oh, two, two gate, gate forge, forge even. Oh. <laughs> All right. Plastic, mineral only, cannons and zealots. This is hard to stop. Oh, and on this version of the map, cannons can reach the gas and almost to the minerals from the low ground. There's a really nasty... Oh, those cannons can get so deep in this position. This is going to be hard to stop. Pass does wall off Cyan from pulling to the low ground, saying, you know what? Just two probes, no worries. And he's going to use that to provide a bit of high ground vision. A gateway gets cancelled to create an opening, having to build his own forges, Cyan. But if you lose gas control, you can't play Stargate versus Stargate. This is looking very scary for Cyan. If this turns into a, a proxy Stargate afterwards, which it often does, yeah. then that could be very problematic. Not to mention, even just the Zealots is the real problem for now. Just stabilizing against the Zealots is going to be tough. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Those probes are pulled. They're trying to get rid of the cannons, but the Zealots are going to be here soon to fight. And that's going to be a big part of the problem as well. Our first cannon does have to cancel. Hass goes and doubles down on another cannon to the side. The Zealot will come across, try and shoot down these probes, but we have gotten rid of both the initial cannons. So that is a slowdown. We're going to go for the next one as well. But again, the Zealot will try and defend this here. Is it enough? Now actually a Zealot from Cyan able to come through, and he is going to get rid of this cannon as well. So he's really delaying the setup, and that gives him a chance to get his own cannons in range, and that means that his own oh. cannons will be online. That's going to be huge the as long as he holds his wall, and that Zealot goes down now, oh. but I think he's done enough, Big. I think so. He's got he's to just target his cannon on Hass's cannons. Hass cancels them, realizing, okay, we're not going to get those cannons up. Back out, probe up, and just run the Zealots and the probes, and he's got two probe, two Zealots got inside the main. And the Adept is building, but it's not ready yet. He can deny a lot of mining time. He's going to try and build cannons behind the mineral line. <laughs> oh, no. Slayan is losing so much mining. He's already down 14 probes against 17. Gases are building behind this. Dude, Hass going for a nasty cannon rush on Ghost River. Cyan trying to hide in the pocket. The Adept will eventually deal with it, but I think Cyan needs to run to the natural. I don't think he can lose any more probes. He's trying to engage and surround this, but the Zealots and the probes are doing so much. I mean, this is a disaster. Losing 12 workers here. For two yes some zealots go down yes you put your gateways on the front but there's already a cyber core at home there's a full wall off in case the adept comes across the map and can you seriously depower that proxy with just one adept i don't think so which means he's just going to be able to chrono stalkers out of it if he wants haswell and he's got such a big eco advantage this is such a tough spot for cyan yeah this is um th th this this is difficult i mean the only benefit now is that it's going to be very hard for has to do much else this cannon will deal damage units as they come in although the zealots will actually get through and the adept went on the map so we need the store gonna pop out to help full wall off here from Hass, so there's not going to be access available for cyan 
and that means he can't do too much on the other side, and yeah, it turns into a weird situation. Sai has a way faster warp gate. Is that something you can utilize at all? I mean, he's sitting on, what, a single gateway? So, not really even, you know? But he can't he can't wall off as well. He can't yeah. wall off right now, because there's two openings. So, unless he goes and builds two buildings, which is very expensive, these adapts, they're going to shade man. in. Like, you're going to lose so many probes. Your economy's already weak. He's trying to get a shield banter in the front, but that doesn't wall off either side. And he's going to go, oh gosh, I'm about to take so much damage. This dog is just running back to the mineral line. The probes need to run. He cannot stay in range of that. He's got to get these probes out. Already two of them going down. This is damage he can't afford to take right now. Yeah, every single probe is just going to hurt you so much. You're already behind on the economy. Now losing workers on top of it. One adept shades out. There's two new adepts building as well. And now a robo facility starts back at home from Haas. So he gets some tech down. Something that Zion can't really even think of affording just yet. Oh, dude, another shade getting in. Oh, but is that actually wall off on the left? No, he can just walk straight through, but he was trying wow. to go south there. So a slight miss micro for Haas. Nice little uh, uh, kind of just dodgy block by Cyan, but Cyan is dead. He's, he's just lost too much economy at this point. I mean, he's got a few stalkers like, uh, uh, maybe I'm being a bit hyperbolic there because uh, technically you could do some stuff because the production's depowered now. That is something, but... The thing is, there's just no pressure on Haas. Like, you just need to build units at home steadily, and Cyan's going to take three, four minutes just to rebuild his economy, during which time you can expand, you can do a one-base kind of three-gate robo-wall in, and uh, Cyan, I mean, there's, there's no way you can do counter damage here, so it's a very rough position to be in. It all just comes off that quick proxy-gate cannon rush combo. Really well played by Haas, and I love the pylon block to deny, the, to deny the probes getting to the low ground. That's really what set him up for success this game. Yep. <clears throat> no, absolutely. It is, uh, it, it's, it's really been a, uh, a crazy game. And, and leading to this point now, Immortal Pop and Prism on the way. Haas is going to find himself a game one victory. There was honestly a moment as well where I really felt as though Sion had, like, held it off, but just the access to the main base was so brutal. And, uh, with Wolfgate done, Prism out, Immortal coming across the map. There's no defense possible here from Sion, who's still just been struggling on workers this entire time. This is going to be very, very tough, if if, if, if just strong, straight up impossible. So, looking as though Haas is going to have himself game number one. And uh, Asia continues to be as wild as ever. Egg? I think pulling workers off gas onto minerals would have been a bit better here for Cyan. Like, I know you need some tech, but I, I mm -hmm. think putting six workers on gas when you had only ten on probes for a little bit was a bit too much. Like, I think minerals is the most important thing to recover, and he realizes that now, but... I mean, he needed, he needed just to optimize everything to have a chance of getting back in this game. And, you know, it's like there's, there's no room for error when you've had a start like this. He's got four Stalkers, a cannon, a battery, and a dream. That prism for Haas is frightening. Yep. Now, the micro potential here is just obviously absolutely huge. The immortal firepower is massive. We get one force wheel down. It's already going to block out a Stalker. The oh. battery's already running out of energy. Stalker's just having a bad time. And this prism will be able to just Great. stand and warp in as well. Another Stalker derps through. And Pass just takes absolutely every part of this fight that he needs to. He can walk up this ramp. There is no stopping him. It's not bad to be an immortal, but then it's one immortal with, with no micro potential because the prism is here from Cyan. Uh, so, sorry, from Haas. It's just so powerful compared to what Cyan can muster up. And that is going to be GG. Haas takes game number one on the back of the two gate forge. Is it going to be Nexus first? Is it going to be some form of weird, you know, three gate robo proxy? Or is he just going to build his gateways in your natural and rush you? The range of Haas is second to none. His weakness as a player, and it's a very glaring one, is playing a standard game. He cannot really do that at a very high level. And that's always been his weakness. But when you have 50 different types of weird that you can do that are all requiring different responses, it's tough. And you'd think a gate scout usually pretty safe. But in this case, Cyan's like, probably should have pylon scouted. Uh, not something you normally want to do in a PvP, but against Haas, you might feel like, oh, you need to actually do this just because it's so frustrating dealing with all these curveballs that Haas throws your way. Yep, I'm just going to be a moment here for uh, Haas to reset his VPN and we'll be off into this game number two and to see what curveball he's going to throw next because you're right, it's never one straight tra trajectory for Haas. It's never just down the normal road. It is almost always something a little bit funky, a little bit different, and uh, I think that's what makes it exciting to watch, because you know something's going to happen. You know it's going to be some kind of weird, and yet it's the good kind of weird, because your opponent, even, even though the opponent knows it's likely coming, they're not going to be able to stop it all the time. So, yeah, has taken this game number it's, one. Cool to see. Yeah. 
I, I just, I, I hope to see, I wish there was more Zergs playing. I'm kind of sad, like, Lemon, for instance, is playing, you know, Protoss this season and stuff, because I'm like, dude, Hass's PvZ is, like, one of the craziest, most entertaining, weird things. Like, I, I just remember, like, that there's so many things, there's so many times in StarCraft where Hass has made me go, oh, that's not a good thing you're doing. And then I get to the end of the game and I go, that's kind of good in its own weird way. Like, if you haven't seen that a bunch of times, you don't know the exact response. It doesn't quite work. Like, I remember, you know, we, we saw Speed Prism Disruptor. We're like, oh, cool. He might go for like a two base push with like sentries and stalkers. And he's like, no, 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 it's eight gate charge with two disruptors. And I pull off gas completely. And I'm like, you can do this? Like, <laughs> disruptor charge lot all in? And he's like, yeah, but it's really hard to stop. You know, in PVT, he's famous for, of course, bringing out the uh, 110 probe, a billion bases, just two gases, nothing but zealots and stalkers, double forge. He was doing that for a long time beating top players for a couple of weeks until they figured it out. Um, it's it's really one of those things. He's always got new tricks. The Nexus first meta a few years ago started in the Taiwanese region uh, before the regions were combined with Hass and, and Nice going back and forth with Nexus first wars and really struggling to actually beat it, even when you open up with like a very quick proxy robo. So the range is going to be something for Cyan to get a hold of. And Cyan, more scouting oriented, a bit more defensive oriented. You know, he's 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 a father. He has multiple kids, Cyan. He's he's a macro dad. He wants to scout and react. House, on the other hand, is your just unashamed uh, bachelor. He's got his anime waifu posters on his wall. He's ready to cheese the heck out of this and go back to, uh, to, to playing some fun, uh, you know, anime visual novel style games. It's going to be fun. You know, it's kind of cool though to see Haas doing well as also because it feels like Haas kind of simmered down a little bit over the past couple of seasons of the Asia region. You know, I feel like his results weren't as Haas level as we're used to seeing, right? From him being kind of the champ of Taiwan for a long time until Nice took over that mantle. So, um... There was a rumor in the Taiwanese scene that he wasn't really practicing a few years ago. And yeah. he was kind of like, oh, I'm not that, you know, into the game. I'm basically just rocking up and seeing if my old skill and builds can get me through. And he was still beating everybody. And like, I remember he like, he, he'd actually lost to Nice a few seasons when this rumor started going around. And I remember speaking to Nice and stuff and Nice was like, oh yeah, you know, he's not practicing like very much. I think Rex is going to beat him this season. I don't think I'll even need to beat him. And then like he beat everybody because Hass's style is, is not necessarily about having a ton of prep. It's about having a good intuition to how to catch your opponents off guard and, and then knowing how to leverage that. And he still has such a deep bag of tricks that he was able to do that. I don't know what the status is in terms of how hardcore he's training these days. His results definitely did fall off a little bit. I know he was like dropping series to like Mio Mika in the regionals and a few other players who he used to dominate. Um, but I feel like when you're a competitive guy like Haas, you do that for a while and it, it kind of stokes the fire a little bit. And you come back after losing a few seasons earlier than you feel you should have and you, you maybe have a few fresh tricks up your sleeve. Yeah. I also felt as though Hass almost started playing more normally as well, where I was like, it's like, whoa, why isn't Hass like proxying every game? So it's like, here he is. He puts the proxy out game one. I'm like, okay, <laughs> my boy's back. As uh, we have had some issues with the map getting set up, but uh, okay, I was just about to say Cyan is not set as Protoss, but he fixed that in time. Um, but yeah, we had some issues with the map getting set up, but we're good now. It's going to be Oceanborn for map two. Hass has a 1 0 lead, and we'll see if he's going to keep on bringing the crazy going into uh, map number two of this. Hass and Cyan. All right, here we go. Oceanborn's going to be a good map. There's a giant squid floating around this map. We'll see if that factors into it. It shouldn't really. It doesn't actually affect the gameplay. It's literally just a shadow animation. But we are going to be getting straight on into the map. And in the bottom right side, already up one game in this series with a cheesy opening. Might be time to hit for him to mix it up with some greed. In the bottom right, it's Hass. And the top left, looking to bring it back from Mystery Gaming. It is Cyan. Hass is, of course, playing for Psystorm right now. Both a fantastic uh, American-based team, as well as a great ability that he does like to spam out against Terrans occasionally. Going to be going for a no-scout opening. Both players going for the gate on the high ground, a more conservative approach, and it's Cyan, who's a bit more scouting-oriented. Hass, who's happy to take the, uh, the, the risk, skip that. I really do embrace, I uh, think he embraces that, that, like I said, the coin flip nature of PvP. He... He leans into it. Other players do everything they can to mitigate randomness and variance. Whereas, I mean, Hass in general has always been a gambler. So he's he's happy to try to, you know, he tries to stack the odds in his favor. He tries to catch his opponent off guard. But it's a lot of, I don't think you'll be ready for this. If you are, it's really bad for me. But I think I can catch you off guard. And uh, Cyan, on the other hand, he's, he's going to be looking to feel things out. So, so far, 
already a little bit ahead in the pro production is uh, Cyan. So no second Chrono going down here for Haas. He's uh, saving his energy for now. Could be a sign of something. Like, oh, that leads into a faster four gate potentially. If you Chrono Warp Gate, could be a double Chrono on two Adepts across the map. So a few different options that you can do with that extra Chrono. And already it's something for Cyan to think about. Why, why did you not Chrono your probes a second time? Yeah. Little things, right? Just in PvP, there's little bits of energy that aren't spent. And in Mirror Matchup, those do make differences. They do enable different things to happen. So this is information you want to pick up on and figure out. You see two Adepts, the choice from Haas in terms of initial units versus the Double Stalker from Cyan. So Haas definitely wants to get out on the map, try and shade Adepts by, try and cause trouble. Cyan very much so, just going for that more straight up setup. But there's the Proxy Robo, bottom left from Haas as well. So the Proxy is there. And that's where that warp, uh, Chrono Boost is going to be going to. This is a scary one, man. We've seen, I honestly, anyone who's played enough PvP is haunted by Proxy Robo. Oh, good scout though, dude. Great scout. He sees it. Already got a few stalkers, more building. And Defensive Robo is usually the standard here. However, yeah, Defensive Robo does go down for Cyan. We saw this exact same matchup in GSL recently here over Stats and... It doesn't necessarily mean you're safe. I really liked uh, State's commentary of that match. He was pointing out, you know, you can see it, but if they get a forward position on your low ground, they can force field you in your base. They could pick up the gateways from the low ground using their prism. You've already got a pylon exposed on the low ground. So as Cyan, you don't want to just stay alive. You want to be able to control this space outside your base. And I think one advantage he has is four stalkers against two adepts. The stalkers are better at fighting right now, right? They are a more solid unit for engaging and he's going to go across the map. Oh, this is a really good move. Because what you do is you run in the main, you kill like 10 probes and then you either force them to recall or you recall home. Problem, Haas has actually prepared for it. He's walled off with a gateway. So you can just see the level of understanding of these situations is big. Nonetheless, you can depower those gates from across the wall off. These stalkers still could force a big reaction. This game could get real messy, but there's a sentry at home for Cyan. His stalkers are ready to go in. He's holding back for now. Pass poking forwards with his immortal, his adepts as well. Both sides getting ready to go. This game's about to hit the fan. It's all wearing up here. As the warp gates move in, they're going to see the probe. Now the stalker's showing up, and this means that you're in some trouble there as Haas, because again, if you lose that pylon, you lose power to your gateways. You kind of got to make a move. The defensive setup obviously just looks a lot better for Cyan. He's got a lot more in place already. We are building a replacement pylon here, but is that going to be enough? We lose power for a moment. The stalker's trying to buy some time, and for the moment, that is going to work out. Haas is bringing his army back home, Pig, which means he's going to come all the way back. And Cyan with his own Robo now in production. He's got an Immortal out. He's going to match in the Prism as well. So he's getting all of that added together. Good damage on the Prism. That, that could come into factor later. You want to get these units out, though. At some point, he has to just stop running and recall, or he's going to lose them all. Cyan has to make that call, and he's got to make that call soon. He does make it. Well done. Dude, not even losing a single Stalker. Of great time-buying tactics. And now he goes for an Immortal Stalker drop as well. Dude, Cyan is, is really clever at staying on the high ground while counterattacking and chronoing an observer now is Haas. He needs to build more pylons. He's a little supply blocked right now and he does go for another pylon at home. This is a very even game. 23 probes for Haas. He's actually adding another one. 24 for Cyan. The counter drop could be huge. How is Haas going to deal with this? Yep, he is going to have to uh, deal with the, the pressure while still trying to hold map control and... That is the problem. Cyan is taking the risk again across the map, but I think it's going to be a worthwhile risk. It looks like it's going to pay off. Haas is going to have two Stalkers here, but again, that Immortal, it's just such a problem. It's not easy to fight against at all. The Warp and Adept, which will be a little bit tankier against the Immortal, but still not ideal. you got to be able to fight, because otherwise you lose this pile and you lose your gateway power, then you're in trouble. He's going to kill a gateway on the other side of the map at the same time, but now he has no Warp-ins, and again, with that Prism Micro, these units just do not die, and that just means that this is so powerful. And Cyan couldn't win work force there. Field. Force field oh, gets the kill. Oh, he gets it. Huge Dude, that, that was huge. That is so big, right? That, that force field. Because I was like, look, the way Haas is sieging that while frantically microing at home, he's open to it. Like, units can get picked up. He gets a gateway. Losing an immortal, not worth it. An immortal costs three times as much as a gateway. It's a super expensive unit. Not only that, Cyan has Phoenix on the way. We, we learned this many years ago back when parting was doing tons of proxies. In this scenario, a lot of people think expanding is how you get ahead, but it's not. It's getting Phoenix because Phoenix can disable immortals while costing way less money. 
they also can shoot down Warp Prism, which is the most important unit in this game. So having Phoenix out now, each Phoenix you build is huge. Hass is going to have to try to focus them down with his Stalkers. Easier said than done. Immortal comes back in, trying to depower these gateways yet again, going for these Stalkers. Doesn't manage to pick them off. Good micro by Hass. I got to say, Hass is micro. You know, sometimes people throw shade at his mechanics, but his his micro when it comes to small unit skirmishes is second to none. He is very, very practiced in these scenarios, but he just needs a few more units. And without those gateways being actually powered, he can't really warp anything else in here. Yeah, the fact that these gateways keep getting depowered is like the biggest issue, right? You just consistently missing out. You consistently end up in trouble here. And uh, that is indeed becoming more and more of a problem. Phoenix are on the way from a sign as well. So he's oh. going to actually have a pretty good response to all of this. Oh, we're going to get the catch oh. on the double immortal. That's the force field. Can we oh, no pick him there? Yeah. Oh, the Phoenix overcharge, though. though, dude. Battery overcharge is huge. Not to mention the Phoenix disables. The immortal, it's like, ha ha, I trapped your immortal on top of the ramp. It's stuck fighting me. The immortal did so much damage for Cyan with battery overcharge. That was huge. Like, like it, it could have been a disaster losing two immortals. It turned into a t perfectly fine engagement for Cyan. Maybe not the best, but he's still out of units lost, and now he's dropping the Robo. Oh, Recall is not available to save this. Pass has lost so many pylons, guys. He's lost four. That's pylon number five going down. He's going to get number six and get out of there. This is a disaster for Hass. Cyan, picture-perfect response. I mean, the Prism can repower that gateway. It's just slightly out of range. Oh, did he loses the Prism? No, it's only two stalkers. They can't take care of it. But uh, wow. ne either way, a uh, problem. I the thing is, because now he can't get a probe out of his base unless he sends his prism home. So what does he do? Does he leave the prism here? Or does he give up powering the robot? Or does he give up having the prism on the front? He has to make a terrible decision now. Cyan is putting him in, in an awful spot. Yeah, Cyan's playing it wonderfully. He's taking the advantage of being the player without a proxy on the map, right? So he has so many places he can hit and punish his opponent. I think there's got to be careful there. House had a couple units go in different directions. Looks like Haas is just going to try and commit to send it, but yeah, obviously that is not necessarily looking as though it's going to be ideal. The Phoenix can take out all of the power units here, just really give you no DPS in this army. This does not look great for Mortal, seems great until the Phoenix take them all out of it, so let's see what Haas can do. He books forward, he gets a force field for a single Stalker. That ain't a bad start, but there's such a long way to go right now. Four Immortals, a bunch of sentries, Adept, Stalkers, and that War Prism out front. It's a big army, but the spread from Cyan is near perfect. He's going to have his own zoning force fields. The Adept shading into the main is a way of trying to force your opponent's hand, right? But there's plenty of units in the main waiting for that with the Phoenix. Able to pick those up just way too easily, not to mention Adepts of his own. Cyan has an expansion. He's got Phoenix that can disable the Immortals. When push comes to shove, if he just picks up all the Immortals, he's just got so much more going for him in this army. Not to mention similar army supply. Battery is here. Prism saves the Immortal. Good few pickoffs for Haas, but he's losing some of his own units as well. Oh, does get himself an Immortal. Not bad. That's two for one so far this game in terms of overall Immortal trades, but the disable from the Phoenix is going to be huge. Picking up those units. The battery overcharge is massive. The Prism doing its work. The Prism is going to go down on Hass's side, and that means Cyan has complete control. A perfect shutdown of the Proxy Robo. That was as clinical as they come. Yeah, really just took it step by step. Really was, again, abusing Hass. Not being able to defend at home. Not being able to defend the Robo facility as well. Got his own defense up in a great way. And that is going to tie us up here. Yeah, Cyan is going to hold off against the proxy shenanigans of Haas. And we get to go to a game at three in this series. And we got to love that, uh, Pig. Because today's uh, game has been actually very fun, very competitive, very back and forth. A lot of close holds and all the rest of it. Now Cyan and Haas going to end up going to a game three. It's going to be our Cyan as well. Definitely room for crazy here. Yeah, there's gold bases. And uh, I mean... <laughs> It really does feel like there's certain players who are a bit more cheeky, creative, cheesy, some would say, hyper-aggressive, some would call Haas. And it does feel a little bit like a gold base is a bright light for a mosquito, you know, at night. It's 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 like, you you, you know, let's just, oh, it's summer, the, the mosquitoes are out, let's just leave the door open, leave the fly screen wide open, turn a bright light on, seems like a good idea. Haas, he's going to want to take the gold base in some way, whether it's very aggressive opening, you get Cyan turtling up a bit, and then you take the gold behind it, rushing to it. It's something that Cyan will have in the forefront of his mind. Haas might do the 300 IQ move and just completely ignore the gold base. Uh, maybe go for the rich gas. There's purple gas bases on this as well, up on the other side, which is something players don't think about as much in the early stages. But that also can lead to some really nice, like, Archon heavy compositions and that sort of thing. Uh, I definitely think sentries will be on the menu as something that you want to be building to get 
early scouting after your initial probe as Cyan. And uh, I, I just can't wait to see what they're going to bring out. I, I definitely think Cyan feels confident after the last game. Do you think he scouts immediately after Pylon, or is it just another gate scout once again? Um, you have to flip a coin. I feel like, you honestly, you just scout as early as possible. I feel like Cyan's more comfortable as long as the game goes on if you live. The earlier you scout, yeah. yeah, it's a bit of an eco disadvantage if he doesn't do anything, but, like, the information, the ability to kind of just know, I think is such a huge deal against Hass, who clearly today is playing aggressively as well, right? You know, if it was one of those yeah. days where Hass was maybe playing a bit more normally and sometimes doing something crazy, but two games, he's been really all-out aggressive. I think you scout as early as possible, get that info, and get yourself to the comfortable stage of the game as safely as you can. I agree, and because of that, I think the peak decision making for Haas is really to mimic a normal game for the first three or four minutes, yeah. and and then you know sneak in the sneaky shift, but but disguise it, really disguise it, because so far it's been fastest rush possible. Game one, caught him off guard, great execution, gets good enough position. Game two, yet again, second fastest rush possible. Proxy Robo gets scouted, manages to get deflected that time, just barely. Uh, game three, I think it's like, okay, let's, let's, okay, it's two gate on the high ground. I'm making a sentry and a stalker. I'm doing my own sentry hallucination scouting. But then at some point we sneak in a dark shrine or we sneak in a gold base, you know, we, we do something like that. So for me, I'm looking for misdirection from Haas because both of Haas's builds have completely lacked misdirection so far. They've been in your face and obvious. And if you do that three times in a row, we've already seen Cyan level up from game one to game two. You do it in the third game, and I think it's going to be a rough uh, happenstance. So for me, this is very much decided on how well Haas can trick Cyan. Yeah, trickery is the, the name of the game. And to be fair, if there's anyone that can be trickery, we know Haas is, you know, cheesy and all the rest. But sometimes to be able to do that, you need to be able to do it while, again, feigning that normality. Make your opponent play into something else to empower your attacks. So I've got to imagine that is going to be part of the idea here as we count on down Alcyone. Is going to be the map. Let me uh, get this one up and running. Scion versus Haas PvP action. We kick this off in just a couple of moments and get underway with this uh, final game of the series. Figure out who's going to be 2 0 in this group and who's going to be at 1 1 at the end of this matchup. As we are going to start out in the bottom left hand side with the mystery game in Red Protoss player, Scion. And in the top right, in the blue, representing Psystorm, it is Haas. So far, both players just going for the high ground pylon. No one gate expands, and that is fair enough. Uh, Cyan's always been one of my favorite players. Like, you know, he's a bit older now. Like I said, he's a dad. He has kids. He's, you know, he, he says, like, sometimes he does struggle to find the time with, with young ones around to, like, get his practice in before these tournaments. But um, he's, he's a very 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 like lovely player i mean most of the players are in starcraft but uh, i've always struck by cyan with how much effort he makes to uh to try and communicate and, and say hello to everybody and if he does get stuck on his english he'll pull his phone out and you can have like a, a bit of a conversation with him where you just kind of have to translate things once in a while but his english is actually really quite good and it's improved over the years with all the different events he's been to um maybe not quite as good as Oliveira's because he has you know actual super fluent english <laughs> he'll say oh you know my english isn't strong at all then you talk to him and you're like you sound like you you speak english like every day <laughs> man like it's actually kind of crazy <laughs> yeah that's uh that's really true i i love that it's like oh sorry my english is not gonna mic i think you speak better english than most of the people i meet in my own country man like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. a lot of people i grew up around that you yeah. you got a bit of bit of a more uh, technical knowledge of the language than they do the the, the grammar is a little bit more correct <laughs> uh. well uh, this pvp was starting off normal and there's the proxy so obviously sign will notice there's a pylon missing right so you're like okay doesn't look like a proxy though right more like a, a you can't find this yeah pylon. It's exactly a fake proxy i think right yeah so it has to get inside worried and then not actually doing anything yet so that's what i like but i mean i was thinking misdirection pretend to play normal and then do the weird but instead he's pretending to play weird and actually doing the normal and that's even better in my opinion mm -hmm. oh no absolutely yeah and I think Haas is good enough to play normal as well, right? So if you can just throw your opponent off a little bit, it may not be as strong as the styles, but, you know, if you throw your opponent off a little bit, you make them uncomfortable, then you play a bit more normal. Potential there as well. Sign open Stargate alongside Adepts. One of the safe openings. You're going to get a lot of information with this, a lot of map control, potential to harass, but you're going to have the potential to build defensive units as well if necessary. So he puts you in a good spot all around. 
Double so. Stalker coming in behind that. A double adept for Cyan. Twilight Council's on the way for Hass. I mean, one of Hass's old best all ins was one base blink. I mean, there were. There, I remember thinking this is this is way too late. It never works, and he would do so much magic with one base blink because he just knows the the moments really good. He has fantastic micro where he'll do things like oh. I know now I have enough stalkers to one shot a stalker, runs in, kills three stalkers without losing a single one, gets out of there. He'll go, oh, this is the exact right stalker count to one shot an immortal or a void ray. Bam, you know, commit to it or two shot it. He really knows those numbers deeply because his early game expertise is so deep in this matchup. But playing against three gate robo, you know, you need time to let blink work. You need time and mobility and running around and oh, hello. Does mm -hmm. catch the proxy. Yeah, nice, nice little catch. This looks catch. like a pretty committed Three gate robo, right? Like this is super committed from Cyan. He doesn't have to go all in with it, but it looks like he wants to do the classic. This is like the butt always build. I mean, Hass has played about a thousand games against this. The question is, <laughs> does he know that this is what it is? Because I mean, he's going three gate. It's one base first, one base. Blink in the long run is way better tech than robo, but that's in the long run. In the immediate time, having a prism and immortals usually does give you an advantage. Yeah. No, Prism and, and like you say, just the numbers immediately will help out a little bit more. But we're already over halfway done to Blink. I mean, Hass, he's flown quite a lot of minerals. I keep seeing a Pro go into the low ground. I think he's going to expand, but he's actually expanding on the gold base. That obviously is not going to immediately help him either. That is money spent not quite on this setup. There's a couple sentries warp in. The Prism already coming across. We are going to see this gold, so Sion is already going to have an initial target here. He's going to know some, you know, one location he can focus on. He's not going to show the prism yet, doesn't oh, fly man. over it because the Nexus has low vision when it's building. So yeah, well played by Cyan in that regard too. Dude, all the information gathering from Cyan is huge. Hass's info is so much lower in this game. He comes in, does immediately uh, lose that as well. So it feels like these Adepts could get big damage, but I actually like that Cyan's just waiting because he's like, mm, if I go in now, you're probably just going to clean them up. I'll kill two or three probes. But if I wait, send the Adepts in the main while I'm attacking elsewhere, that's when I can find big damage. And building a second Immortal, right? Just just waiting for more units and then moving out with an army that is going to destroy in, in a frontal fight. Stalkers have to counterattack. If Hass sees this moving out, counterattacks with his Stalkers, defends at home with some warp ins, he can win just because blink mobility is hands down the better thing. But he doesn't have the information right now. Cyan does. And Cyan is the one who's got all of the initiative. Pass. He's in the top left corner of the map with next to no map vision. He's so blind right now and it's really costing him. Cyan knows what's going on. He's well prepared. That being said, there is a stalker and a battery in the main. Pass is mentally prepared at least for a base trade. Yep. It is going to be the uh, the mental prep, which is good. I mean, honestly, again, having Blink right now gives you so much kind of uh, ability. It's just a numbers game. We're going to recall the Stalkers just for the oh, Prism to leave. And now the third, uh, well, now it's uh, on third base. The gold base is going to go down. So Cyan just jumps on this. That's going to be a denial. And yeah, Haas is now without the Nexus and still struggling to supply. And he's actually supply blocked as well on top of everything. Yeah, that's, that's very, very costly. Now, he's going to send some Stalkers across. If he dove in for the counterattack with his Stalkers, it would have been much better. Because, you know, having ramp control, Cyan with Force Fits, you can't really pick at him using your Blink here. It's going to be very tough. You can try, but easier said than done, right? He's just like, oh, yeah, let's let's get back from here. He just used his Blink. He's got to be careful, man. Once you use your Blink, you can get trapped. And we are going to see some good Prism Micro so far. Gateway does get picked off. Cyan's doing pretty well. We'd like to see Cyan maybe take an expansion of his own. The Stalker counterattack, though, that is enough to one-shot workers. There's no real prep at home for this. Those Stalkers are going to get in the main, but he's going to go for it himself. Oh, me, oh, my. Very big commitment from Cyan. He's got the Immortal Staying Power. Massive damage going down behind this, but look at that. Battery Overcharge is just going to get sniped. The Prism goes down almost instantly. Diving on the Immortals. One Immortal does go down. Has with some great focus fire, but he's losing so many units at the same time. Yep, I'm just going to be uh, seeing Cyan able to take this big fight, is able to get a lot done. Cyan just has the numbers still in this base, knocking down Stalker after Stalker, and it looks as though Cyan is just going to have enough to stick around. He continues to fight. A few Stalkers on the other side from Hass have done great. Cyan has basically no economy left, but again, if neither player has economy, larger army should typically win, and that's 35 to 14 army supply. Don't think Blink's going to save you here, and obviously... There is just, you know, the fact that you can sit here and kill these uh, buildings, so you do have to then attack in. I'm just going to be seeing the pylon get knocked down. The other structure's looking to be in trouble. This does seem as though Cyan is on the verge of finding a victory here in game number three and closing out this series in his favor. Feels like Cyan knew what Haas was thinking 
Whereas Haas was like, oh, I guess he's kind of paranoid. I'll take a gold base. And, and then it felt like Cyan was just one step ahead at each each phase of this game, where he was a bit more prepared. Stalker's tried to blink in, and doing blink like that aggressively, not going to work. But he, he didn't want to lose the base trade, so he kind of goes for it. If he could somehow have picked off the Stalkers, he could have out micro those Adepts and Sentries, of course, but Cyan had more of everything, and he does navigate that so well. I think, you know, knowing to do, like, just a small technical counterattack with the Prism and the two Adepts, but then not just diving it in and committing until his immortal push was ready to come forward, forces the recall, gets the base, gets the forward position, and Cyan committed incredibly hard to a very delayed one base play, something a lot of players wouldn't be like comfortable going that far into like two immortals and a prism and all this stuff on one base, but he knew against Haas, hey, build a big army for ultra safety, turn that into aggression to stop him pivoting into something else, and it worked just very, very well. The moment Haas recalled, I feel like he lost that game. If he's instead just warped in, ran the Stalkers into the base, I think he might have been able to win that, especially with like force fields at home. But, you know, hindsight's 2020, And as we said, Cyan had way better scouting. Haas just didn't have enough vision that game. Yeah, no, just uh, making the better plays, playing out slightly better. And I think the player we kind of, I expected to win kind of came through in the end. Haas definitely opened the series in where I was like, hey, here's my curveballs and here's I'm going to try and make it happen but not enough in the end. We're halfway through this Asia region today. Firefly, Lemon, Yeishi, and Cyan all net themselves. 2-0 scorelines going into Swiss round three, so they will be playing a combination of each other to try and make playoffs, where XY, Oliveira, Coffee, and Haas will fall to 1-1, one and one, which is the set of players that they're hoping to be, uh, the next guys are hoping to kind of meet with because that would mean winning their next matchup. Second half of the day will be Nice versus Masaki, Maxhead versus SCV, Jim versus Nanami, and Mio Micah versus Silky. So a little PVZ before we head into a string of mirror matchups. So we'll get into all of that very soon. More StarCraft action coming straight up just after a quick break.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We're back with the second half of the Asia Regionals as it is time for us to head into these matches where players are 0 and 1 in the group. So fighting to, again, stay alive. Obviously, 0-2 is not out. It's three losses to be dropped out of the event. But obviously, you do not really want to be down on two losses because that means you just got to win, win, win. One bad matchup. I mean... You know, Oliver is 1-1 one one right now. Who knows what could happen further down the line. So you just want to avoid those guys as long as possible. Get a win on the board would be great a day. As uh, we are ready. I'm just going to sneak back from the lobby. I'll get you in here. And we are going to be set to go into some PvZ. As it's Nice versus Masaki. Uh, nice is down here because Lemon beat him. Which was a little bit of a shock to me, right? And, you know, we talked about that earlier. So Nice is one of the guys I did not expect to be 0-1. Tough run from Masaki. who faces Oliver around 1 now. Like, Nice round 2. Like, that is not great. <laughs> the the beauty of the Swiss format is, you know, you do start to... to it, it should round out, right? In terms of, of, okay, you've used up all your bad luck here at the start. If you if you do lose to nice, you're 0-2. You're playing other people who are 0-2 and probably from losing to worse opponents than you have. So <laughs> the, it always balances out given enough rounds because we only do a, you know, a five-round sort of format. It's, it's not a huge amount to, to make up for that variance. So definitely a rough run, but you know what? Forged in Fire is always where I think the most exciting tournament storylines begin. I, uh, you know, part of why I love watching Rainer and I'm a big, big fan of him is the number of times that guy's been down 0-2, yeah. to 2 about to be eliminated and then Brings he comes back and round after round, his world championship was all of three twos all the way and that sort of thing. And there's just something about when a player has to kind of get their hands dirty first. So if Masaki loses Oliveira, Loses map one here versus nice, wins two games in a row. You know, that would be the beginning of a fantastic comeback story. Well, let's see what we can do. We are heading on into it. It is PvP time. Uh, sorry, PvZ time. And uh, we are going to start off in the bottom left with our Red Protoss player. This is nice. <laughs> He's on. We're on Dynasty. Uh, this player didn't veto this map. So, Mizaki, show me some magic, mate. This map is meant to be pretty grossly Protoss favored. Show me what you got. In the top right, it's Mizaki playing for teams so far away. I cannot wait to see what he's got in store because this map is. Well, we're, we're doing a 14 gas, 14 pool. Is it? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, he's yeah. rallied that drone to that spawning okay. pool. What the? Okay. What the? This is a bizarre opening. And interestingly, Nice is walling the front. A lot of people wall the front, but still take the gold. So then mm. they just get the third base for free. Um, I do think Protoss naturally has an advantage because the gold base, you know, being easy to take and then being able to harass with things like oracles. You can't really harass the gold base if they have flying units, right? You get over there with like an early couple of roaches, there's a void ray overhead or, or a few oracles, you know, unless you move queens over there as well, it's very tough. Whereas Zerg uh, taking the gold base is incredibly vulnerable to adept harass. And it looked like he wanted to go that direction, but seeing the probe, he changes his mind. Misaki does go to the front side and we'll just take that hatchery there. Alrighty, so he puts the hatchery down in that little ground position and just switches that up a little bit. And again, just kind of playing around what his opponent is seeing, playing around where his opponent is at. Just little things for the moment as we do see the cyber core and the nexus and everything coming through as well. So nice, just getting set up. He's also not going to take that gold, not going to take that what? risk of pointing it out on the map as we take another gas. Oh, okay. What? Second <laughs> <laughs> the lair. Okay, so so is this is this swarm host Nidus? Is this Mutilus? Is this just straight to Hydra's? Masaki is doing something incredibly cheeky, and he cannot let Nice see this lair. Six more, eight more links on the way. Wait, are we just ling flooding? You don't have link speed. This, what? This is the lair ling flood, pig. It's something new. It's a slow zergling ling flood where he's just going to use dropper lords to yeah. bury them in the base. He'll, he'll start ling speed, right, with his next hundred gas. Yeah, yeah, ling speed. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, so he's going to elevate lings in. He'll he'll drop on the top left uh, of next to the natural, and he'll elevate straight into the gold base. Uh, come in from both sides. Maybe not on the top side. Maybe just the bottom. If you hold position the overlord right on the ledge, you can load into it from the low ground and unload on the high ground. Uh, you need to be in the perfect position to do it, though. You could do it over the gold minerals or over that ledge. Um, but that's basically it. It's just a Ling Flood all in. And uh, Nice is already sensing, like, dude, you went for a super early pull. Nidus Worm as well. <laughs> oh, my Lord. All in of all, of all all ins, mate. I don't know. That is a super, super vicious move. But Nice is in survival mode right now. Nice is not taking any chances. This is like three all ins for the price of one or so, you know. It's... Uh... 
<laughs> it's getting a bit crazy up in here. Nidus, finally the limit speed <laughs> gonna be coming through. Um, we're gonna we're gonna send in a couple of moments and just try to go for this. Losing that overlord. Yeah. It's it's kind of, it's it kind of checkmates this build though, right? And now I this overlord so. being you got vision, you you just can't. It's you, over. you have to run up to the wall. You have to just throw it on his face. He can just pull probes. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is a very good hold by Nice. I think Nice really showed good scouting info. The moment you see like a fourteen pull, you really you don't take any chances, and that's exactly what Nice did. Shield battery, non-stop gateway unit production, shuts down the Nidus, and Masaki will have to tap out. Great hold by Nice. Really good scouting and response and. I think Misaki just got a bit cheeky trying to fly that Overlord across the gold into the back. The moment that got found, it's like, ah, oh, no, why'd I move that Overlord over there? Because if he doesn't do that, you've got such extreme different areas you can throw the Nidus, you're going to get it up. And Nice will have to micro very well in his main and his natural to survive. But the Overlord goes down and it's a checkmate. Yeah. Cool, cool idea. But Sometimes proper scouting just kind of kills it, and that's, that's very much so just what happens. The scouting was there, the scouting was good, and that is going to be that. So Indeed. Get really I, fun I, I love it, man. I, I, I don't know. It's, it, it's cool to see something like that mixed in. I do think it's, it's a tough, awkward map, but what was smart about that is like, hey, you can't cover the, all three bases, right, with that front low ground wall off. So, so it did, it did make sense. I would have liked to see the elevator as well to lead into it with the Nidus more as a reinforce, personally. I do think the elevator's more budget. It hits harder, it hits faster, it's harder to stop. It's just a bit harder to execute as the Zerg. So it's kind of a bummer that he didn't go for that, in my opinion. But uh, you know yeah. what? It's, uh, you know, it, it's a throwaway. It was the map you, like I said, it's really bad for Zerg. So what are you going to show us? The problem is that when you let a map that's favored against your race through, your opponent's like, I better scout for all ins because I know he doesn't want to play a standard macro game on a map that's so favored for my race. Yep. No, you don't want to be uh, playing the macro game in that sort of situation. So we're going to go to Oceanborn, by the way, for map number two. So we're going to get that one readied up here. Get this started up in just a second and uh, see whether or not Misagi will have something to show for us against Nice. I mean, again, feels like a tough matchup, feels like a tough time. We'll see what's uh, going to go down. As I mean, it, I would imagine he's going to have something kind of stored up for us, right? Something a little bit different. I can only guess. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of Masaki's play. So obviously suffering against the Hellbat timings from Oliveira yesterday is a rough one. But it's Oliveira. What do you expect? It's, you know, you got to cut some corners and sometimes you get called out. Uh, I do think, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what you can bring because nice can play very turtly he can also lean into the aggression and after that last game i wouldn't be surprised if nice i mean back in the day he was a big fan of core before nexus in pvz and he just like chrono those two adepts over so early and look for crazy damage and bam there's an oracle behind it and his third base he'd be happy to delay to five minutes which is really weird in pvz he'd be like oh that's a late third and it's like well yeah the man sacrificed six adepts in and killed 23 drones and his two oracles have killed a queen and like you know so, so Nice might do that, and I think that's a very good way if you feel you're stronger than your opponent or you can out-multitask them for a Protoss player to really lean on their opponent and force mistakes. Like we said, it's going to be Ocean Born. We can get the map loading up right now. Can Misaki have some sort of an impact? He's not had a great set of games. I mean, when he played against Oliver, he kind of just died to Hellbats a couple of times. He built drones, and, and drones did not help him fight off the Hellbat attack. So we will see what uh, we'll see how this goes down as we ready up game. Number two, it is going to be in the bottom right-hand corner. The red Protoss player, it is nice, at a 1-0 lead. And in the top left, in the blue, try to cheesy game one. Didn't quite work out. Time to reset. It's map two for Masaki. Whenever you or anyone of us introduces and we go, it's nice. I always feel, I always hear it in Cyril's voice from 2017. <laughs> yeah. You know, up there on that stage. How does it feel to be in your first finals? It's nice. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is one of my, one of my favorite pro gamer responses. A classic, especially in the StarCraft you've seen at this point, right? Just the Cyrilisms of the world. Yeah. So it's always cool to see as well, because Harold was so young then, and now he's always got a bit more banter. He's always a bit more joking in all of his interactions, having a bit of fun, as are all the players. We've seen them all kind of grow up in front of us. Nice players had some fantastically exciting matches. I mean, a couple of Katowice's in the world, uh, in, in a row, 
uh, Nice vs. Spirit, I remember, being just one of the craziest series ever. Like, so Nice had some some kind of qualifying, getting close to qualifying to groups at Katowice for a few years in a row and playing some of the craziest games getting there. Um, nice is kind of funny because, like, he's so much better at macro than Haas, mm -hmm. but then he'll just switch gears when he thinks, like, his opponent's, like, a bit of a favorite and just play like Haas, basically. Just do the dirtiest, cheekiest, cheesiest builds. So, so Nice, I feel like, yeah, he's a man of extremes. Extremely good defensive player, extremely aggressive in your face play. He can do it all to a certain extent, and uh, it does really depend on what he thinks will work best in the heat of the moment. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I actually always felt as though Nice was really able to develop more than Haas, and then he really did become that overall kind of just stronger player, right, than Haas, and ended up kind of being, you know, better than him. That's why it was cool to see Haas kind of popping a little bit at the start of this, uh, at the start of today, and or earlier today, and just seeing him kind of winning the game, and just already being 1-0 in the group was kind of neat, so I like that, as we get ourselves. This uh, setup under yeah, nice, nice truly surpassed him against Zerg and Terran, like by far, I would say. Way more consistent. But in PvP, Haas is always kind of like he'd lose two seasons to Nice and we'd be like, oh, Haas is done, Nice is the new king, and Haas would beat him like two, three seasons in a row, and we'd be like, okay, never count Haas out in the PvP, you know. And Nice you could see would be frustrated because he'd be like, I don't think this guy practices that hard. Like, you know, I practice so many hours every day and I've, <laughs> I memorize my builds and has drags me into deep water and always mm -hmm. finds a way to be about 50% versus me in head to head, no matter how much effort I put in. It's a, it's a frustrating thing, but you know, StarCraft's about many different factors. It's such a, a wide ranging set of skills that you can reach into as a player. Now, third base is on the way, but lots of gas being mined by Misaki. And that to me is very peculiar. Because it's it's why yeah. are we not pulled off gas? Are we rushing lair for hydras? It kind of feels like a Mia Mica build. Yeah, you, you, and you don't even rush the lair. You're just like you're gonna get the lair at some point, but it's like not a rush. It's just you want so much gas later on, and the hydras come through. So, guess we will. Uh, yeah, this see. feels exactly like that sort of style, doesn't it? Like the lair and the second gas go down. Basically, like I'm gonna have four lings, three queens, no extra queens, creep tumors for losers. I'll get like one creep tumor because why would I spread creep? There's no way it can get to the other side by six minutes when my Hydra timing's gonna hit. And you know what? Void Ray's kind of not great against Hydra timings. It doesn't really do a lot of damage against Hydra's or Lings. Um, third Nexus, you know, it, it, it feels like this is good against Ling Floods, what Nice is doing, you know, having the Void Ray and the Depths for Safety, but needs to get wind of what's going on because these Hydras are gonna be hitting so early in the game, assuming it is Hydras. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Spy is an option. Uh, Nidus Ling, again, off more work is, is technically an option as well. But uh, Masaki is definitely a cheeky player. I'm, I'm getting a sense that Masaki, playing against Nice in this matchup, does not want to play a straight up game. No, I get the feeling of that as well. Hydra Den dropping down, all the Lings coming up. He just wants to send it. He wants to do something cheeky. He wants to be aggressive. This is uh, becoming very apparent what the plan is going to be. Unless you have Ooh, our good, good Lings, going to get us around. Yeah, I don't think it's a great trade though so far. These Adepts are slaughtering him. The Void Ray has done so much. Like, yes, the Adepts will go down, but if you don't get the cancel, I don't think it's particularly worth it as the Zerg, usually. That being said, if you can stop, like, batteries getting up, your Hydras, that's good. It just feels like the Hydras are a bit later than you would like. They're only starting at five minutes. He does need more damage with these links. Getting the batteries killed would be great. No cancel on that one. Other uh, battery is taking a lot of damage, but the depth positioning solid and... Dude, this is a lot of links into the meat grinder. This is not cheap. Yes, he's doing damage, but the Oracle is making it expensive. Not to mention the Void Rage. New batteries go down immediately. There's more links here, but there's only like seven Hydras coming. I don't even know if that's enough to overwhelm the Void Rays. No, it, it doesn't feel like you're right. And with Glaives on the way as well, I feel like Glaives is such a perfect setup against this because you're just going to have the DPS against Hydras, the DPS against Lings. You are going to be absolutely popping, so... That feels uh, fantastic as another battery or so comes through. He just gets into position already. Yeah, all of that uh, oh, sad and scary moment. First Hydras are scary, man. You just remember the Lings do, t I mean, the depth count, the, the Glaives isn't here. Battery overcharge, though, forces him back. Good pullback. He wants that Hydra. Does tap the Hydra. Nice with a bit of focus fire there. But he's got more Adept swapping in. Shades are finished, and even without the battery anymore, that's a lot of adept void ray. Nice is down about 20 army supply. Oh, he leaves his door open. Nice move by Misaki. 
Misaki ain't gonna go down without a fight. He is attacking the Twilight Council with quite a few Lings, though. Not really doing quite as much as he could have. A few probes go down in the natural. Six probes falling. The Hydra Ling on the front. Hydras do find themselves a Void Ray, or at least a bit of damage on that Void Ray. And nice, he's got so many Adepts, though, and Misaki realizes that Adept count is absolutely fearsome. I wouldn't mind a Baneling Nest. You're already deep in there. I think a Baneling Nest might be necessary, not to mention a Groove Spines upgrade. He can't actually afford Groove Spines, can he? He doesn't really have any spare gas. Misaki's gonna pull back and try to build up to the next wave. And uh, yeah, Baneling Nest, there we go. It's a little delayed. So the problem is that it's gonna take so long to get that. Oh, it was a bit earlier. I think the Banelings could be a big surprise. Yeah, no, I, and the thing is, everything he has kind of sucks against Banes as well, right? The Adepts would have to split apart, then the Lings have a better time as well. A bit of splash on those Adepts, and maybe you give yourself a chance. But uh, yeah, at this point, maybe, well, yeah. just a bit too late. Oracle's going to see. Not a lot of drones coming out. Not a lot of gases here. <laughs> the Adepts are going across the map. Oh, does Nice not realize? He might not realize that this is actually yeah, such a big all-in round two from Misaki. Shade home, bro. Shade home. Yep. Oh. Mm. I mean, he might be able here. to just win the fight aggressively. It's just unnecessarily greedy, right? And <laughs> Lings and Adepts run past each other. Yeah, I feel like this is one of those situations where you kind of need to be... Um... Yeah, like you say, it's just not necessary. And, and even if you trade out okay, like you just want to be at home. Because this is a lot of army supply from your opponent. This is nice. He actually sees the mate Banes morphing, so he's very aware of this ahead of time now as well. So now at least you know these Banes are coming through. 15 of he's them. He's not pre-spreading. No, he's, he's going to pre-spread a little bit here. These Adepts, I mean, you can shoot down some of them, but he's staying very clumped. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh this is dangerous. Pulling into a tight corner. These Banelings, they, they could be massive. Pulling into a corner. A crazy move for nice Misaki. The Banelings need to get in there, man. The Banelings are getting some massive hits. Done it. I, I, nice pulling into a corner. A crazy move. And Misaki says, mate, I've got explosives, dude. Volatile bursts all over those adapts. Wow. And uh, Misaki with a surprise game to tie up the series. GG. Yeah, I kind of felt like Nice did all the things right until he just sort of didn't. Um, he saw the Banes and he was almost like, oh, I actually don't have a good answer for this. So he, he has a couple sentries added in, but then only two force fields. And that's obviously just nowhere near enough. I mean, if he has like four or five centuries, you got two rounds of force fields off, yeah. you buy enough time, sure. But like two force fields, you buy yourself a few seconds. That just ain't good enough. So, yeah. Exactly. No, like I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, oh, I would never do this, like sentry reliance, because I know I'd mess it up. But I'm like, yeah, if you, if you, I've seen players do this. You know, you're like, no, I got, I got six force fields. We can like full block them, kill a whole bunch of the lings and banes, whoop in a few more sentries, block them a second time. By that point, half my opponent's army's gone. You know, like, hey, we're actually good. But uh, I think he had the numbers to just pre-spread, you know, have batteries, have units spread out a little bit. Um, it was interesting, though, because he was going charge and immortals. And for me, I was like, Robo Bay and Stalkers seems to be like a bit more of what I would focus on in that scenario, because you just want ranged units that can kind of fight with batteries healing them without, you know, getting just surrounded and blown up by Banes. And you want splash damage and anti-light splash damage would be amazing, right? So it was a little bit weird. It felt like Nice got a little bit... Uh, lost in the follow-up like he wasn't fully realizing hey you're just building more hydroling and going and then even when the adepts came back and saw all the banelings morphing he still was just a little bit too slow to adapt to that so definitely got a bit unconfident masaki steals a map now we're going to go into crimson court a map with a rich gas base up front very dangerous to take it um the sides of the map kind of cut off i think for all intensive purposes this plays as a reasonably standard map and i think nice will be happy to slow things down Easy game one. Map two, he was far ahead. Let's not take any chances. Let's scout well. Let's stop and react. Masaki has not shown any willingness to play a macro game. There's no reason to think he's going to do it now. No, uh, Masaki's going to send it. Absolutely right. I mean, this has just been clearly his plan in ZVP. He just wants to just go be aggressive. And hey, it worked in game two, right? So we'll see what Tricky has up his sleeve. As nice, you want to play something standard, safe. Make sure you're not going to put yourself in any kind of trouble. Just give yourself the best possible shot at this one, so you can only imagine that that is going to become the plan as we get uh, game number three. Ready in just a moment, we're just missing nice from our lobby, and we'll be off and away into it, okay? Oh, man. I'm excited. I mean, nice now finds a bit of pressure. This is the, the litmus test for what nice is showing up this season. Are you going to be able to handle the pressure, mate? Because... You know, I don't think uh, as nice you're expecting to drop maps to Masaki. I think you're expecting to get a 2-0 here. You've lost a map. And this is where you got to kind of not not get cocky, not get arrogant. Go, okay, made a mistake, clean it up. 
let's go into the next game. Let's try and reset our mentality. Sometimes taking a minute break for a bathroom, this or that, or checking the replay quickly can help a player out there. So it's always advisable to do so. And uh, yeah, I think Masaki, we, we've shown a Hydra Ling all in of three bits. I think it was a little delayed, his attack. So I think if he wants to do that vein, I'd like to be a bit more Mio Mika style where it hits just a bit of a sharper timing with the Hydras. Um, on the other hand, if we want to go extremely all in, I mean, the classic is the Ling Flood with the drone, the drone drill, right? Yeah. If you can hide some drones, get them around the first Adept with a bunch of Zerglings, Adept comes into shade, he goes, oh, this base is kind of empty, looks back, drones have just drilled through the other Adept in the wall, Lings are flooded in, you can't wall off because the drones are blocking, and then by the time the Adept dies, the, the floodgates are open, the Lings are in tier base, and it's a disaster from there, and that's a classic build order, which has always had a chance of catching a Protoss off guard, so we'll see if Misaki can pull out something like that. Yep, possibilities for sure. And as we get ourselves into this momentarily, like we've been saying, just a couple of moments, we'll be heading our way in. And what would you like to see nice to you then if, like, you know, he's going to be against this yeah. juicy guy? Are we just going to play super standard, I... like Stargate, Scout a lot? <laughs> Definitely Stargate, Wall Off, Chrono the first Adept across the map. But even before that, the probe has to hang around and count the lava. Yeah, Wait, like when that spawning pool finishes, do you have any lava saved up? Because if you do, that could be eight Zerglings building, you know, any, any, the real little detailed signs of aggression. Hey, wait a second. You, you, your gas is mining really early. Your link speed's starting literally the second your pool's finishing. That's not normal. Oh, you, you pulled guys off onto, you took your gas like 10, 15 seconds early. Oh, okay. I need to like, just leave my gateway units at home and chrono two or three adepts, you know, like, just take safety precautions where needed in game one on dynasty he did a great job of that like just adept in wall battery stalker count around your base make sure you're super safe that's what you got to do so keep doing that don't need to risk anything too crazy if you really want to lean on the opponent i don't mind core first because then your adepts get in your opponent's face and they can't hide anything if you go cyber core first adept pressure all right, well, we'll see what the choice is going to be. As the red Protoss on the upper right, we're expecting him to need to play safe. It is going to be nice. In the bottom left side, with a nice transition into Banelings, you know, I, I, I Misaki in the bottom left side of the map. I, I said, you know, you the call for Banelings because I was yeah. like, well, this isn't working. But it, I didn't really think it would work. I was like, this might yeah. be the best of the bad options. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, uh, you can't really drone up from here. You know, you've got no creep, three queens, you got a low economy. Nice is going to just overwhelm you if you give him too much time. But it, it did work out. And I, I like the way that Mizaki had that patience. A lot of players like, I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going, you know, and they just kind of run into the meat grinder. But having that kind of visual understanding to go, this fight is turning south. If I commit in here, it's 100% game over. Let's back off, look for another play. It was well executed. And a hatchery first here. Nice comes in with a gate scout. Sees that and just goes, okay, no worries. We're just playing a pretty chilled game so far. Gas and pool are at the standard timing. Nothing early there. And he's going to try and harass these minerals. We'll see how Misaki deals with that. So far, good drone micro. Very good drone micro. Yeah, really good details yep. so far from Misaki. Keeping those drones stacked, just keep the minerals mining as best as you possibly can. Don't let your opponent do too much of the disruption with this probe. And uh, there's one drone that gets pushed to the other mineral patch, but yeah, uh, as Cybercore comes down from Nice, he will get himself settled. And we wait to see why Misaki is going to take us, because again, it really is in my eyes Misaki that's going to be the one changing things up, doing things a bit wildly. Definitely kind of making this question what the hell's going on in this game at some point, so uh, kind of expecting that to come through is the moment of course it is like you say normal hatch timing at least and that's you know even more than we've had in some of the games yeah no this is a good start you know pretty solid i i, I do want to see the pulling off gas though if we're going to hit such a late timing uh if you're going to hit that late you you can absolutely optimize that you don't need to leave three workers on gas so there we go yeah. pulling off gas yeah, yeah this is this is way more more like a normal build and this is it if you throw two cheesy games out there and then you play a macro game it's very surprising Remember, what was I saying? There's no reason to think he's going to play a macro game. He's going to cheese again, scout for it, be safe, and your win is nice. But Masaki so far is showing all the signs of a just standard macro game. And that's exactly what you want to do. Purple Gas is going down, though. Nice. Purple Gas base. That gets scouted, and uh, immediately Nice is going to be like, okay. Now, that is a sign of greed. You want to be aggressive with your Adepts and Oracles and punish it. On the other hand, it's also a big sign of aggression. A lot of Zergs aren't going to be comfortable playing a standard game defending that purple gas base. 
they're going to use that to get a little bit of a boost and then shove with ravages or hydras or something like that so i would expect seeing that some sort of 40 to 50 drone all in to come out of misaki probably hitting us at about six minutes nice is going void ray again so he really seems to feel like more safe when he's got the void ray just as his bit of insurance i like the void ray against the ling flood stuff i don't like it so much against like the queen walks or the early hydra pushes mm -hmm. but it seems like nice is like yeah this guy is ling floods you know that sort of stuff i want that void ray for safety we'll see how he navigates forwards you just have to be wary because it's such an expensive unit if you delay your gateways and your blink and stuff too long you could end up kind of stuck in this position where you just don't have the meat the basic units to actually defend the push when it comes yep no having the uh the basic is like you know actually just having that kind of like numbers kind of factor in your side is uh, typically going to be very helpful so imagine that will be a factor too as we get settled in and just see where things are going to be heading for the next queen couple walk. moments so, i'm thinking i'm thinking queen walk yeah. i don't know if it will be but this is not that many queens but i think you know roach horn here you can make a crazy amount of ravages off this because this is effectively four gas with these uh, three gases, because the purple counts as two. Oracle only gets one drone so far. Oh, he goes back in for more. Nice, greedy. <laughs> Takes a bit of damage, but does slow down the purple gas mining a little. And I, I would not be surprised to see Misaki Queen walk. The thing is, because Nice took that base tucked away to the right, it's so much safer against this. And I, I don't know if Misaki's really been scouting at all. Like, in fact, he hasn't really. So I don't even know if he realizes, hey, there's no third base where you might think there is one. And he's getting ready to walk right now, you know, an extra, a few more overlords are needed. And it's just, we're going to see Ravages, Queens walking. It's a great push in general, but Nice knows about this. He's already got batteries building. The question is, what does he have on the ground to defend? He's only got two gates. Oh gosh, okay, he's got a third mm. gate coming out. He needs stalkers though. He needs actual he's fighting units. units. He's got like a ton of batteries and no actual army. Yeah, you, you mentioned it, right? So you've got a couple of void rays, but you need the meat. You need the beef. You need, you need everything that's going to be there to kind of help you survive this and give the void rays a chance to do damage. His army is coming from Misaki. We're going to lose a bunch of drones to the Oracle as well. So a little bit of something there. The Queen's going to get onto these Void Rays for a couple of moments. Our battery's still coming up. Things on the Ravager. The Queen as well all coming through. I'm just going to be having a couple oh. more Stalkers warping in. But, I mean, we are just going straight for the Natural as well. Because that's where you want to be. The heart of this army before the, you know, the numbers are there. The, the Void Rays are going to overwhelm the Queens. He's got three Void Rays plus battery healing. And there's, there's no transfusers because there's no nothing. So, so the Void Rays can actually just beat these Queens and win the game. But Nice needs to go out and fight. There's no reason for him to sit back with his Void Rays. He's kind of microing his whole army as one right now, which is a little bit lazy. Like four Void Rays just wreck this. And yeah, just it's too few Queens. If it was five or six Queens, maybe. But you know what? There's, there's It was a calculation. Oh, are you going to be too light on ground units? Yeah, he's too light on ground units. It doesn't matter if you've got air superiority and not enough Queens to beat it. Oh, that battery overcharge the Adepts are holding. Nice, it's an alternate defense to what we were expecting, but it's perfect. That was exactly what you needed. I love that base on the right side of that map. If you had a base out front in the open, that's way harder to do. But with that thick wall off to buy time, the early batteries, Nice prepares really well and absolutely redeems himself from the mistake of game two. Yep, very nicely done. As we get ourselves uh, into that victory formation, he really kind of just tightens up the defense, does not make mistakes. And uh, again, for a moment, it's just like, well, does he have enough? And it's like, well, actually, yeah, there's just not enough queen power even. So what he did have enough of was absolutely going to be enough. And Misaki chose a little bit of life, which is nice because, again, he did not look great in his opening matchup or anything. And now we're going to head ourselves into our next round of action, which is going to be the mirror matchups, pig. His mirror matchups the rest of the day, by the way. PvP, PvP is EVZ. Me and Mike Kasilke will wrap things up. Max Ed versus SCV will be up next. So we're going to be heading into that fun China versus China PvP. That will be coming up in just a few once again. So this four to five minute break. We'll be right back. More StarCraft on the other side of it.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody, as more uh, action continues our way. Now we're going to be heading into this next matchup in just a couple of moments. Get this one on the go, as it is going to be time for that. Uh, PvP, so we're back to the mirror matchups here, Pig. It's PvP, as it's going to be Maxed against SCV. Uh, well said, the players seem to be set. And it's going to be Gold Nora to open up with uh, Chinese PvP. You know, one thing I've definitely noticed in this region so far is that these guys are not loving the sentry change as much as the Europeans have been, for example. Because uh, in Europe, <laughs> a lot of people have been playing this, you know, the new sentry. In China, they're like, wait, the sentry yeah. change? Never, <laughs> what are you on about? No, it's only there as a counter to Archons now. If you go too many Archons, <laughs> they'll walk in a big round of sentries and get you, man. But otherwise, no, no, no. None of this silly sentry expand. I want you to build six sentries and a nexus and some probes. Losers. <laughs> uh, no, warp prisms and everything still doing very well. I mean, the sentries are good. Like, it's made the two gate expand stronger than ever, in my opinion, right? Like, the sentries are fantastic. So I am a little surprised we haven't seen a little bit more of it. That being said, they've been mixed in to the cheesy strategies, right? The immortals on the low ground and that sort of stuff. I, I'm curious to see what comes out. What's the, what's the next evolution here is we do have our match already underway. Absolutely no dilly dallying. I can't wait, mate. Down in the bottom right side. I haven't seen too much of his play yet. So I'm really keen to see what he's got in store for us. It is a Protoss player playing S SCV. <laughs> mm hmm and in the upper left-hand side, a tried and tested veteran of the Chinese scene. The red Protoss player is still part of Victor's gaming. It is Maxed. Ten years on that team, I think, something like that. Maxed, dude. I mean, what a beast. Maxed's been at it for so long. And I remember a few years ago, I was like, oh, you know, people were like, oh, you know, he's, he's a bit older, a bit slower, not real a contender. And he came in there and he was like, oh, I'm just going to do like mech Protoss PvP and like weird just like i'm gonna make just immortals into carriers and i was like what is this like <laughs> then, then that was just a one-off and then the next season he was back to playing normal protoss and i was like okay like max Ed's actually just a cool guy he's got a lot of esports experience and really really knows how to uh stay calm under pressure scv not as experienced not as deep into the scene as him but uh definitely a player who started to show some real potential as well so i'm really keen to see kind of what he what he brings out you know losing 2-0 to jg yesterday in the pvp it could happen to anyone. JC is one of the, the best players in the entire groups here. So I think SCV's uh, got his work cut out for him, though. Golden Aura is a big map. Max said generally a player who's very good at getting up to three base and then really, you know, controlling those huge armies at a very high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, the, this honestly could be, again, especially in a region like China, PvP can be very aggressive, but they can also end up in those very kind of wonky games where you end up going into the disruptors. You end up taking those longer, bigger trades and those longer games in general. So we'll see what the, the plans become. Max has definitely never shied away from a, a longer game or a, a larger challenge in that regard. So yeah, very excited to see because this should be fairly intriguing as we get this up and running. A couple stalkers coming through on both sides. The warp gate's coming up as well and getting this all underway the moment as you do see a couple of probes gonna keep on moving around a couple more stalkers coming about as well these two haven't actually played since last year's uh, esl masters and it was a two to one in favor of uh, scv then so it's been a while since they played in a competitive format good to have that history of having the most recent victory there and this double stalker at first double stalker as you pointed out pylon at the front he wants to see if there's any adepts coming out you know, and, and Max said's like, well, I'm just not going to show you what I'm doing. Two stalkers into two sentries. There is a probe down here. It's hanging out, ready to take a nexus. Pylon gets cancelled. Nice job hiding that information. Meanwhile, SCV goes for an expansion of his own. But no sentries until... Okay, one sentry finally starts for SCV. Dude, that's that's bizarre. If you're playing a defensive expand, going three stalkers before sentry? Like, <laughs> I understand if you're going proxy robo, but I'm totally with you. I'm like, yeah, man, this region is not loving the sentry change at all. <laughs> Yeah, no, they are. They are really not because, I mean, it was the first day of the Reese Regionals. We're like, man, I'm so excited to see the new Sentry in PvP. Proceed to not see any new Sentry at all for, like, a bunch of games. So, um, yeah. That's Max just, said, uh, though, he's, he's going to make goes. up for it now. He's he's you the think? guy. He's like, you know what? You, you guys man. have been missing out. I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> uh, okay, I'd be down for that. Like I said, I'd be down to see the new Sentry. I think the new Sentry has made this matchup yeah, pretty cool. A little bit of, you know, breath of fresh air and everything, so... 
definitely down to see a little bit more of it as we just have an access the robo facility all coming about here as well and mm, yeah. robo first for scv it's like very safe but it's also not the best transition because your blink is so late so mm -hmm. that getting scouted by max said you have to be a bit more worried about like a prism attack uh especially with force fields right but because you've got your blink coming up so early i actually think max Ed's in a great position he even sees the adepts oh seeing those adepts coming is great so you should send some stalkers out, try and catch these adepts ahead of time, keep warping in more stalkers at home. And Max said, he's actually gonna send his own adepts to counterattack. He's been quite greedy on the unit production. Just two stalkers, two sentries, and finally adding two adepts. Yeah, um, just taking a little while to kind of get that on the way. And uh, that's gonna be on its way, way with it now. He's also gonna be the one to the forge. Obviously, SCV is cranking out an immortal. So two very different styles. Max said with his much more active style, where it's like, okay, I'm going to have Blink, I'm going to be able to move around the map, there's a lot I can do there. The SCV much more so with this setup, where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to just play into the Immortal, the more defensive basic army setup and all the rest of it. So, continue to build to that. These couple of Adepts shade up to the high ground, moving into the main base. Again, trying to see a little bit more of what's going on. Another Stalker gets warped in right now. The only addendum I'd make is, you said more defensive. It's definitely more immobile the yes, robo but it true. can turn into a powerful all-in so I, mm -hmm. I know that's kind of what you meant not, not meaning to like uh backseat or anything but i'm like it's one of those things where it's like it, it could lead into a big all-in he takes a third nexus though so no you're it's, it's absolutely just going to be a very totally safe robo play as you pointed out which is the more likely option usually you know doing a two base robo all-in is super late max has got a big lead on the upgrades but it's a bit scary for him to just drop a third as fast so i think you know he's gonna maybe wait for another hallucination to really confirm what's happening and actually scv is making quite a lot of sentries now so late in the game five and a half minutes wow yes the stalkers are gonna get rid of that prism so prism just dies that's obviously not great to just give that up so easily so not exactly ideal there you can see this nexus dropping down to the third base for a couple more gates coming up the twilight council is building as well and we just take a moment or two to see what the next step will be again the couple gateways coming now the robo facility getting produced through just uh little bits and pieces establishing right now forge and the twilight council finishing on the side of scv and it's obviously just wants to set up to protect his third base more or less the same idea as what max Head is going for for the most part i think um getting active with these stalkers is pretty huge right you know you've got the faster blink they are already catching adepts is great but i mean you should be active with this and I would like to see Max Ed play a Gateway Man style and take a quick fourth as well. Because you see how like sentry and mortal focused your opponent is, just don't fight in front on. Just use your mobility. Like here, you can even run past and blink up the ramp. Like you can just run past and be very annoying. He's a bit too close, so better to just back off for now. But even just threatening that, I think you can really take a mineral advantage, drop a quick fourth, go into 10 gate charge, and the immortal sentry focus of your opponent goes really poorly for them. Like once you've got Archon Zealot mixed in. That it feels like the sentries and the immortals fall off really hard. Max said, though, he's actually saying, no, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go for my own immortals as well. And uh, it's actually more of a mass gateway transition for SCV. Uh, the SCV is yeah. going six more gates. I guess they're both going to eight total. So it's just better upgrades for Max Ed, but pretty much a mirrored situation. Just Max Ed has better upgrades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, just going to be uh, seeing Max Ed uh, way further ahead on, you know, initially that plus one and now moving in towards that plus two as well. So... He's going to be having that also investing into that charge, which is something as a pawn is not uh, going to be behind on too, because obviously initially we had that investment into the Robo rather than the Twilight and the Blink, so that's going to be a difference between these guys for a little bit as well. Just going to be seeing more gateways finishing up. Of course, the more gateways we have, the more production there is, the more dangerous this can all be as well, so getting into a, uh, a good little spot here, big. Yeah, proper macro game. This is this is so bizarre after what the PvPs we watched today. I'm like, what is this? This is Hass yeah. does not approve. Hass, Hass is watching this, shaking his head, getting these guys don't know how to flip a coin properly. What are they both doing? <laughs> trying to hedge their bets? This is crazy. So <laughs> I'm kind of like, I keep expecting a player to just make a big, you know, play to try and win the game, and I'm like, not. Nope, they're just trying to build advantages. Um, Max Ed's fourth is very slow. Like I said, like he could just go for a huge plus two timing, but. It does feel like he could easily have squeezed a fourth base in and you know he's on he's on the three gas timing of just mass zealot stalker immortal with plus two uh he's only got two immortals three on the other hand for scv scv hasn't really over probed the fourth though i, I do prefer scv's position you've got oh nice blink forward to try and catch from max ed will it cost though they're both just trading stalker for stalker here 
And a nice blink away for SCV. Overall, SCV has lost five stalkers for six of Max Heads. That being said, more adepts and a sentry were lost earlier in this game for SCV, so that does cost you. Yeah, and oh, good force fields here. Just going to get another couple of catches, and that is going to be SCV. Just pushing Max Head back down again. I think doing a pretty decent job of this altogether, Pig. Just holding Max Head off, not letting Max Head get too much done initially or anything along those lines. Keeping this nice and calm as we knock down one pylon around this right hand side. We are going to see the few stalkers moving across from SCV again. Going to try and come meet up here and get something done. Cool. Max Head's going for it. Wow. Okay. That's very brave. There's going to be all oh, good force fields for zoning for him. He did get the enemy observer snipe as well. SCV trying to push in, but those force fields keeping a lot of his army at bay. Max said, really trying to be very frustrating with his force field usage. He's trying to pick up these units a few at a time. That one immortal for SCV is just sitting out in the open. It's finally going to go down. Same time on the right side, the Zealot's happening as well. Force Field's trying to go down. Zealot's finally getting in there for SCV. Max said with the plus two versus plus one advantage, taking a pretty good fight. More Zealots coming in just when he needs them. He's got to focus those Immortals down on the left, though. Letting those survive for so long may be a slight mistake for Max said. That one red hit point Immortal is just asking to get clicked on. Yeah, it is so, so low. It's so easy to get rid of that. And if that goes down, it does feel like we're then missing a substantial amount of, you know, everything else that's uh, remaining here. So something to be watching for as we just have the fight getting ready to go again max is still thinking about Ooh. going and going in for this gonna find a panel on the right side I like that. the drop in the main really you know because you already created an awkward spot for scv now it's you got to defend two different angles and the scvs are gonna the results are gonna be dropping inside that main base and here we go cannon is there Ooh, nice whole position to try and limit the surface area great reaction scv all over it shuts that one down does have an army at the front defending as well. Plus three finally starts with Axe so he will continue the upgrade advantage. It, it is really about fighting right here and now for both of these guys. Oh, Blink gets punished. A couple of Stalkers do fall. But right now, the upgrades are even. Max Ed's Prism stuck in the back. Wouldn't mind him just sieging that up to make sure it doesn't get F2'd in. Three more probes building at a time for SCV. SCV is going to go Robo Bay as well. Would love a second Robo. I think in this sort of game, you've got these big kind of chunky ranged armies. Disruptor shots are just massive value makers. And it does feel like SCV has been a bit more comfortable going to the next step, whereas Max Head was like, no, no, I want to be in your face in the mid game. And I wonder how big those disruptors will be as this game goes. Yeah, disruptors are, are going to be a huge factor. And it does feel as though Max Head trying to be the aggressor is not quite working out for him. And if he now gets kind of caught up behind on the disruptor count as well, he's A, going to have to slow down even more because they're great defensive units. And and that's definitely not kind of boding well for kind of the whole setup here, honestly, for him. So I would say I'm a little bit concerned for... Um, I'm a little bit concerned here for Max. I feel like this is not quite going the way he wants it to. So... Yeah, it's, we'll, yeah, it's we'll not concerned. like he's way behind, but I feel no. the exact same thing as you, right, Wardy? It's like it's... Because he's not progressing, I guess, is the exactly. thing that I'm sensing. It's like, I'm like, if there was a Dark Shrine coming in, maybe he's thinking about doing a, a DT drop, he's taking the quicker fifth base, but fifth base is like a little behind, and he's still just making Mass Stalker immortal. And, and this sort of army really suffers against Disruptors. He does have, you know, a massive Zealot count, they both do. Disruptors are coming out, the plus three, so the upgrade advantage is disappearing for him. It feels like SCV is playing a more well rounded game of PvP, and, and Max out is kind of stalling just a little bit in the mid game he's, he's not out of plays yet he's still got a good army he's got those good force fields he showed he can use those really well no force fields available for scv see what those sentries can achieve in this scenario he does kind of split the positioning a little bit hold positions as zealots battery overcharge going down scv is going to try and deal with this i think the disruptor really makes things super tough though oh big ball of the zealots <laughs> Nicely done there. The first disruptor shot lands in a big way. SCV is kind of milling back and forwards a little though. Prism in the back does go down. Stalkers in the cannon with some zealot warpins will be able to deal with that. And I think SCV, even though he's been losing a lot more units, 1500 resources behind the units lost, he's managing to now push him back. And as there's a second disruptor, Max Ed has to get out of here and he's got to transition. And he's either got to go his own disruptors or make his way up to air. He can't really just stay attacking front on into disruptors, can he? No. Oh. Yeah, I mean, he's oh gonna gosh, he he's died. gonna try and send it, man. But I mean, I just do not think that this is still working out. From the longer this goes, the the less I like from it, you know. It just feels like this gets worse and worse given time. So, yeah, those immortals did start a step really nicely, though. They got a lot of hit on the store because it looked like it was a disaster of a fight. Good defensive pullback for him. Like he, he salvages it a mm. tiny bit, but oh no, more stalker comes in. 
Yeah, great, great decisiveness by SCV. And dude, SCV's played a proper macro game. Really good defense. And, and it just feels like Max Head doesn't have a next play. He's kind of going probes, yeah. he's rebuilding immortals, but there's no sign of him wanting to play the next unit set. And that's a scary thing in PvP. Because if your opponent knows you're not comfortable playing Disruptors or Sky Toss or DTs, you kind of end up like, oh, I really need to get advantages with Sentry Immortal Stalker. If I don't do that, what what am I going to do the longer the game goes? Well, you know, it's it's kind of tough. So I think this is a great position for SCV. Catches these Zealots in the south, though. Stalkers are going to dive in. Zealots will buy a bit of time here, and the Immortals, as they come down, should be able to defend this. Good micro by Max said to find what value he can. He's down 50 supply right now. And the cannon defense with the zealots on the right side up on the top scv dives in there on that base and is deflected disruptor shots taking out a few stalkers in the north of the map it looks like zealot stalker warp in does chase scv away but scv's got scv has map control adding more upgrades and uh it just seems to have the more well-rounded army with those four disruptors i mean max said with some good disruptor snipes admittedly but it's mm -hmm. uh it's what else is he going to do to take advantage of that and that so far the answer is not just going to keep microing these blink stalkers and zealots and see if i can catch you out and it is possible he's not out of this game but he definitely doesn't have any strategic advantages it's all about tactics max said he's going to have to tactically out position and catch scv off yeah he's going to have to outplay him but outplay him hard as well i mean you're asking him to do this with less units less supply I guess similar economies, but again, just also worse units when it comes to that. So less and worse. Maxed really has to do some outplaying, out positioning for sure. Right now, those zealots are just kind of bullying him around, pushing him back a certain direction, and just making sure that he can't actually commit through it all. So that's definitely going decently as the stalker still getting chased back. The zealots are going to hold that down the low ground, and we are going to nexus into the bottom left corner. So SCV just takes further advantage of this map control pig. He knows his advantage. He knows he's got it, and he's just going to keep on pushing it. Not messing around. SCV is looking proper European right now, man. Yeah. Went ahead, get more ahead. There's no urgency with like, I got to go win the game. It's I'll harass with the store because I'll push you back. I'll look for good trades, but it, it never feels like there's a rush to it. SCV is really impressive. Uh, disrupt the shots, you know, picking him off, baiting him into those. And the Stalkers in the top are going to blink in. Oh, warping in Stalkers. Yeah, I'll one shot those. No worries. Runs away from the Immortals. That's a great choice. And he drives a wedge up in between these bases. That shield battery can get clicked down very quickly the moment he decides to. But he says, ah, oh, you know what? Oh, big zealot flank, actually. Great move for Max. Those nice. disruptors are recharging right now. But oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> the disruptors. Oh, it's disgusting. As Max is going to lose everything here, that might just be enough to get the GG out of him because he's also losing a fight to the top side. It is going to be called GG, and SCV is going to take map number one of this best of three. And he is going to go ahead in the PvP after a very comfortable, calm, collected game fig. Like, he just, he was so happy to be, like, in the lead and just kind of in control. He felt no immediate pressure. He didn't have to go super soon or anything along those lines. Well, that was just a really solo game from him. Um, and like I said, just very convincing stuff. Like, it never really felt as though he was kind of feeling threatened or dangered or anything. So, he just played at his own pace, and that's such a kind of privilege to have in a mirror matchup, especially where you're just like, cool, I can kind of do my own thing. I'm not really worried about what you're getting up to or how it's going. So, yeah, really nice for, uh, for SCV. He plays a great game, number one. And Max, I definitely felt, like I say, it was desperation without being fully, like, on a timer, I suppose. Because he was always like, oh, if I have to tech up, like, I'm in trouble. So he tried so hard to make it work off of the other, you know, the units just pushing in repeatedly. Um, and that obviously yeah. just was not meant to be. It's so funny because, you know, the, the, this is like a um, definitely like Max Ed was at his peak, I think, at Heart of the Swarm. I remember competing against him back in the day. And Sentry Stalker was like that mid game was very prolonged yeah. in Heart of the Swarm because the economy built up kind of slower, I guess. And uh, But then you could sit on your, your three bases and it was kind of hard to secure a fourth and onwards. And you'd see a lot of force field Stalker usage. And I, I've almost forgot you could even do these sorts of pushes where he's like, I'm like, we're doing a stalker and model sentry push at like nine minutes with like just that i'm like oh yeah like these force field splits were really good but scv was just you know hanging in there good enough with his own defensive force fields and positioning to not get outplayed enough there and, and like i said i think the earlier blink could have been used by max ed to take a much earlier fourth and a much earlier fifth with the hallucination scouting that he had so maybe an earlier century extra third or fourth century to have a few more hallucinations Pushing that greed could have been a nice way to, to, to get that edge. Um, felt a little conservative, maybe, in terms of how he built up. And if you know SCV is such a defensive player, pushing more all-in or more greedy is the way you take advantage of a middle-of-the-road player, right? 
Yeah. You know, this guy's a bit too middle of the road. Let's like surprise him with the most all in build or go really quite greedy. Either of those extremes. But if you yourself kind of go down the straight middle of the road, you're going to find yourself in an even situation. And the guy who's then more comfortable just progressing to the next stage and just slowly building up is going to be the one who's favored. And we saw that's clearly SCV in this strategy. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just waiting for the players to join the lobby here. And uh, we'll see if Max said, do you think Max had just kind of says, right, let's turn it into like a one base attack now or something like much more timing focused, like much more heavily committed, even if that's even off of two bases, does it go like a bit more aggro rather than just taking that third Nexus this time? I wouldn't mind a similar matchup of openings, but maybe like a proxy gate for the fourth gateway, uh, okay. you know, do like the four gate blink pressure, try yeah. and deny the third while you're taking your own third. It's not a massive variance in the build order. But sometimes it's just, oh, I have 12 Blink Stalkers at your third. You only have like eight or nine. And I just run in and start one-shotting your Stalkers. And it's, you know, snowballs really quickly. Just something with a bit more of a sharp edge to it. And um, maybe skip your Robo, you know. Hey, let's hope I scout Dark Shrine. If he sneaks one in the corner of the map, maybe I just lose. But I'm happy to flip that coin a little bit to a certain extent. Take that risk. We'll, we'll go for, you know, Blink upgrades straight into charge get the prism in the back of the main with our first zealots timing while our stalkers and zealots jump on the third at the front we have a faster fourth behind it as well because we've we've skipped all this extra tech and that sort of stuff you could even skip a forge if you're willing to play that style and go super all in so i wouldn't mind some of those early mid-game timing attacks out of max head as a way to really bring this back into his area of expertise all right yeah no that's kind of what i was wondering like if you think he's got that kind of ability in him and Kind of worth you. We're going to set the Ocean Ball and then for game number two and see if Max had will make those tweaks. And we'll see if SCV just wants to try and stay as that defensive Protoss again as we head into round two of this one. We are going to be starting in the bottom right hand side with the player who is up a map here in the best of three in the blue from Mystery Gaming. It's SCV. And in the top left side of the map, the veteran, the old man of Chinese StarCraft, who will not go quietly into that good night. It is, of course, Invictus Gaming's Max said. He's about he's about out about my age, I think. So just a bit of a bit of a jokey joke there. We are older in terms of gaming terms. You know, back in the day, it was they said, uh, especially in the Korean scene in Brood War, they're like, oh, if you're 24, you're too old. <laughs> you know, like your your reaction speed's too slow and stuff. And I was like. I, I don't think that's the case at all. <laughs> I think just a lot of people as they get older split their focus or lose their passion or whatever. It's, you know, it's hard mm -hmm. to maintain a, a career in any competition as young guns come up and they've learnt more than you. You know, a lot of people get to a phase where they're really good and they stop evolving at whatever thing they're good at, right? Yeah. It's very hard to keep reinventing yourself and relearning the basics and updating them. Like, that's why we see pro players these days. We say this player is really good, but their openings are a bit out of date. Or there's this certain mechanic they just don't use because they've never taken the time to, like, relearn the more modern, more efficient mechanics, right? Like, uh, a lot of the players have, like, you know, the button they hold down to spam gather commands on the minerals to occupy the mineral patch with the worker harass. You can see Dark doesn't use that at all. He's just like, no, nah, I just click on it. I just click it. And they just can't compete with a guy holding down a button to spam <laughs> yeah. 100 clicks a second. So mm -hmm. that's why he always loses the little worker versus worker duel on the mineral patch usually. Um, and it's like, okay, fair enough, but he still finds ways to win. And it's just interesting to see because a guy, you know, like Max said, uh, who's been at it for this long, and a lot of the players have, you've seen almost all the players who've been playing since Wings of Liberty reinvent themselves multiple times in their career, relearn certain mechanics, relearn certain things. and. It's, uh, it's always cool to see one of the old dogs hanging in there and still giving all these young guns a run for their money. No, it, it really is. Especially in a game as aged as SC2, where even, like, the newer players are, like, a, you know, from, like, five years ago now, right? Like, you really have to do a, a rain check sometimes where it's like, oh, my God, like, he, he started playing when? Like, I have to double-check things. Um, it, it definitely is just interesting to see someone like Max, who's been here from the beginning, who still grinds it out and is still... Trying his best. Obviously, you know, he casts as well. He's uh, one of the Chinese casters for a lot of the Chinese events yeah. and stuff. You know, he's involved in all that. So he's not just kind of focused on playing too, and yet he still is able to stay competitive. But again, he, like you say, your focus slips and, you know, not necessarily always in a bad way. Like I say, sometimes he's just casting. and he's not playing full time all the time nowadays. Yeah. So it does have that impact to it versus these guys who are still kind of gunning for like, oh, maybe I can still make it. Maybe I can be the best. They will take every edge that they can get learn every new thing and uh, put all that time in. It's uh, fun to see. 
I mean, anyone out there who has kids knows it's time to bring out that dad, dad energy when you get to this situation, right? You're like, yeah, I love you, son, but uh, I'm going to keep beating you as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, <and laughs> I will keep making you work for it because I, I am competitive and I'm not ready to pass over the torch just yet. And I feel I get that energy with a lot of the older pro gamers where like they end up in these bad positions because the younger players have some like real advantages over them. But then they dig deep into their experience and they find a way to like leverage this weird position often digging into like old experience from like 10 years ago in like metas which mm -hmm. these young kids have never played in and they go what is this situation i'm in and the old dog's like oh i remember 2013 you know yeah. gold league series invitational where i did this up against jiguar in the round of eight or whatever you know and then like the young kids like i've never seen a guy do this strategy like what the heck do i even do <laughs> here so Always interested to see what goes on. Uh, double Oracle opening, by the way. And there is two Stalkers in the main, which is enough to defend with limited damage. It feels like a very safe build for Max Ed, but goes for the Rally of Probes. Great move for SCV. Knows his opponent's going to be prepared, so he goes for the safe damage. Oh, what, a, what a zoom in today here. We've got three. Three Probes. Very nice. Ooh, barely gets out. Yeah, I was going to say, free probes is nice, but obviously we'd love to keep the Oracle alive with so much map control you gain off of that, so generally something you don't want to let slip away. Couple gates still coming up, that blink coming in on both sides as well. Those Oracles still positioned up to the top for a couple of moments. We just... I was talking about four gate blink would be a good thing. Um, uh, it looks like SCV's the one who's going to yeah. be much more aggressive this game, man. That's a scary timing on the four gate blink. Oh no, the main! The oh, main! Oh no, double Oracle! Yeah, you can't be letting that happen. That's in for four probes, and that is a huge deal as the Oracles now drop a revelation down as well. Stalkers will take a couple of shots there. And again, that blink just about to finish up from Max. Uh, so he's going to have blink sooner, but his opponent will have more gateways. Like you're mentioning, that's going to be a little bit more pressure available to you too. That could be a big deal. He is going to try and do his own forward gateway, but it's off two gate right now. So that's the thing is, is Max that doesn't have as much uh, production here. He's got more stalkers right now. Actually, this might be, I think this is a good enough timing. If he can get in there. Oh, the already oh moved out again. He keeps so moving out. Damage. Oh no. So Dude, that brings up to 13 probes. That's way too much damage. I mean, and the thing is, he's got to stop this battery getting up. But look, SCB has a lot of stalkers here. He's actually got a numbers advantage. SCB could take this fight. He's just afraid because he doesn't have Blink. So understandably wary. Waiting for Blink might be the better call. Pylon's supply blocked him. That's a big problem right now. Max Ed's getting some real damage. He's going to get rid of that third. Nice move from Max Ed. I would say that's enough success already usually. But because he lost so many probes, he is still behind. That main base is defended this time. Long Stalker's gonna blink in the main. Deep power the blink at 99%. Oh, no. oh, that's actually so cute. Gets himself a Stalker for a Stalker. Does blink back most of his own Stalkers. There we go, we'll pull back. And he needs to get out of there because remember, that Oracle's waiting. As soon as Probe's transferred to that third, that's gonna go down potentially. Oracle does fly through there. Nice force fields on the low ground. He can't keep committing to this though. You know that blink's gonna come up soon. Getting some damage here is good, but Max said, I think is maybe going a bit too deep. That's what we were waiting for. That was the big mistake there from Max Ed, going just a bit too deep, trying to rely on that force field. Definitely a strategy from the old years. For those who don't know, and Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm, basically 50% of Protoss victories involved force fielding their opponent in or outside yeah. of their base. <laughs> Max Ed did that a lot, so he, he brought brought back the old tricks as we were talking about. Yeah, he, he dug deep for that one for sure. Let's say, um, well, big, uh, Big catch here for SCV again. A bunch of uh, kills. He's got one Oracle that's coming around the back again. Still looking to maybe try and cause some trouble with that over the next couple of moments. So, oh, big fight on the front though. At the oh, same stasis. Time. That's why he's distracted. Yeah, huge yeah, stasis. Big fight distraction. On the front. Well played by uh, SCV to set that up. Really nicely done, man. His thirds are going to be almost halfway rebuilt. I feel like he doesn't know about the game. That's where like a few adepts could come in and do some damage, but. Definitely a worker lead for SCV. The base is coming up. You've got charge and a robo coming in. I like that SCV is playing no forge. I think in this sort of game, squeezing a forge in is kind of scary and dangerous because it takes so long to give you any value. And SCV is like, no, nah, no, nah, I want value right now. In the long run, that's going to cost him, but that's, you know, only in the wrong, long run. Adept's coming in from the left. Oracle's pinning him in the back of the main and the Stalkers on the front at the same time. That being said, good reaction by Max Ed. Only loses three probes there and he's got his own depth counterattack at the same time. This game is getting a messy. Quick recall here for SCV. SCV is taking no chances and shuts those adepts down. Up eight workers, charges on the way. Oracle goes in as well. SCV is being so nasty this game. Man, he's playing so well with the Oracle and everything, right? Like he is 
He's killing it. I, I love how he's playing. He gets very excited to continue seeing more games from him as the event continues. As he's, uh, yeah, he's playing his heart out right now. Playing some great stuff with that Oracle, keeping the aggression going. Adds a ton of gateways here. His charge is going to be online for him soon. We're going to be into this very aggro, kind of heavy gateway style very shortly. He's going to be trilling an upgrade. And his opponent's already setting up the Robo as well, so maybe falling behind a little bit there. Adept does get a few probes there. Five probes in total. Not bad for Max Ed. Uh, I think Max Ed's going to... He's got the upgrade advantage on the way, you know? So, so the longer he, he treads water in the scenario, he's now got the worker advantage. Like, like there is real potential here. Let's see if he's finally going to find that gateway and be like, wait, 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 wait. You built your gateway that close to my third and I'm only just finding it? Oh, finally clearing that up will help out. And uh, lots of gateways coming in for both sides. Charge and Robo of his own coming in for Max Ed. I like that he delayed it. Uh, SCV's got plus one attack of his own now starting, as well as the fourth Nexus. SCV's definitely shown more comfort rushing that fourth than Max said. And, uh, you know, we talked about it a bit, but old habits do high hard, die hard, and definitely it was an adjustment coming from Heart of the Swarm to Legacy of the Void going, wait, we can take a fourth before 10 minutes? And now, nowadays you're like, oh, we can take a fourth at 5.45 if we're max packs. Like, mm -hmm. it's so early that you expand. Max said still sitting on three base. The SCV's got the numbers, man. This is a scary moment in this game. Yup, he has got a lot of units. They're here right now. They're very ready to fight, that's for certain. And uh, we are kind of just seeing them not quite commit through just yet, but it feels like any moment he can pull the trigger and really send this a little bit. And make this a very scary situation. So, SCV continues to get set up, continues to move into position here. And just sets I mean, out the, the frame. He's taking the fourth as well, by the way. Yeah, he's got the fourth and double four to play full mass gateway style. Max Ed's had good defensive blink micro. He needs to get back to the batteries, though. I like the overcharge there. He's got to pull back maybe some of his weak stalkers for that. Just let that battery heal himself up. He's up in workers, but if he doesn't have his own fourth base building, you're playing gateway man versus gateway man. And and as your opponent out expands you, that could be really good. But CV has stalled on the probes. Max Ed's hanging in there. He has been pinned back in his corner, but I like this. Dropping a couple zealots. Battery will be able to slow down their damage as the prism goes up into the main base. I don't know about the prism committing to the main though. Yeah, good good choice to pull back. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, you're gonna lose your four zealots. You only got two probes. He's gonna dive the natural. This is a crazy move for Max Ed. This is wild. Is, yep. this, is he gonna recall out? What is he? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He's so deep. Yeah, he needs to be careful, man, because now you're gonna get blinked on top of... Whoa, SCV steps back. I actually don't think he needed to that. He could have stood and fought. He really could have just been fine to take a bit of a better fight, but... It was his opponent an opportunity. Now Max said shows the bottom left with the Prism play as well, so gets that on the go. That's going to be a bit of a factor too, as we actually do blink one more time on the right-hand side. SCV about to be down on upgrades again. He never started his plus two attack, so while he caught up in plus one, Max said is now about to finish plus two, and that is going to be, once again, a way for Max said to win out in these, what, you know, what is right now, quite frankly, just very gateway unit heavy trades, so the upgrades really go a long way. Max Ed did a good job of pinning him. I kept thinking, oh gosh, he's about to overcommit. But no, he pulled back at the right times. So he didn't overcommit. Prism's still up. He's got a 17 army supply deficit. That's what's worrying, is the fact that it looks like he thinks he's going to win with these fights. And plus two is good, but I don't know if it's going to make up the 17 army supply. It's it's a big army advantage for SCV, and SCV's realizing that. He's going to blink forward. Max Ed here, acting like the bully in this scenario, but he's actually got the army that should be cowering. He should be getting mm -hmm. out of there as quick as possible. Zealot counterattack on the south again, but SCV... You know, all, all, all things, uh, you know, uh, added up. It seems to be defending okay, but it's hard to tally it up. So I keep checking the units lost tab, and it's about a thousand resource advantage to Max Ed in the units lost. He's up eight probes. If he transfers to his fourth, which he hasn't done yet, then that's going to be huge. You know, the, the workers are oversaturated on his natural and his third massively. He's got a big worker advantage. He's actually taking the army supply advantage for the first time in this game, but these stalkers are a little bit outnumbered. He's got to be careful. A lot of his zealots are massing out to the left. Yeah, when you do obviously get closer and closer to SCV catching up, upgrade rise as well, so that does also feel like something of a factor oh. here, given time as we are going to be seeing more warpings coming through. Zelt stuck in the back as we're being shown, and this is actually getting a little bit wild as we have ourselves, what, the Zelt here from Maxa trying to join in as well? So this does get crazy across the board. And Getting the immortal was huge as well. Just about really good focus fire. 
Yeah, Max that's kicking it, man. He's doing really, really good. He's way up in, in economy once he transfers, but he's just not transferring. It's like he really wants to win with these timings. This is clearly Max Ed's specialty, is mid-game blink timings, but the upgrade deficit's about to disappear. The tail end of that fight, very bad for, for Max Ed, even though it started going well his way. It's still about a thousand resources lost in his favor. He's still probing, but he's just been forgetting to transfer workers. And honestly, with his work account, he could have a fifth base up. He's got so many workers and nowhere for most of them to mine from. He's gonna start a dark shrine. This is what we're talking about with Max Ed has that mid-game timing attack specialty. We need it. We need a fifth base for him and to just keep transferring probes around. If he does that, I mean, he's doing a good job of keeping SCV pinned. SCV never built enough workers to match him in that regard, yet the income is not that different. It's only a few hundred minerals a minute. Max Ed's thinking about taking the fifth base. He's gonna keep shoving with the stalkers. It's such a dangerous push angle again. Yep, Ooh. he's constantly putting himself in danger, man, as we blink forwards here. And it's just given SCV a chance to utilize this larger army. I mean, we're on the way to the Dark Templar. That's cool because that might just be enough to kind of knock SCV down a little bit once again. Stalkers here will likely get this prison before the warp in, so this will not go and do as much as Max had wanted to. Oh, wow, well, 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 yeah. keep on warping in. Stalker's still taking damage in the plus three attack. Corona boosting up off that forge. Plus one armor finishes for SCV. That's big. That really matters, especially in Zealot versus Zealot. The armor upgrades cancel the attack upgrades. Stalkers, the attack upgrades are a bit more important. The Stalker blink forward, very ambitious for SCV. He's got the numbers though, big numbers advantage now, and everything's starting to fall apart. With that prism going down, his army not being reinforced for Max Ed, he's just lost a lot of his important units. Look at his work account, 74, but like I said, no fifth base. So a lot of them aren't mining effectively. He's starting a gas transition now, but it feels like SCV here is just a little bit more comfortable flowing through the game. In this case, it's not the Disruptor, it's the Double Forge transition. He has forgotten second uh, armor upgrade, but that's just because Max Ed's been so in his face. I do like the DT addition for Max Ed. He's trying to get some Dark Templar to run those along the south of the map. Problem is, there are a few observers out, and I think the observer is actually going to see them coming through that middle bottom of the map. The DT is going to run right past this observer. Yep, they're going to run straight through, so we see it. If we're paying attention, we are going to chase with the army, the observer, and see just when we go to run down those DTs. So SCV trying to shut off this potential harassment of Max that does not really want to be losing any more workers. Uh, problem is DTs go everywhere, although Cannon over here, that's going to be a defense already, so that's a good start. Cannon's just in the mineralize in general, make this a much easier defense than it would have been otherwise, so that's going to help you out. That puts you in the right sort of position. Sets you up in the right Max Ed's making a second forge. I, I don't know if that really does anything because he's already finished plus three. So armor and shields at the same time is not a very effective investment. Um, mm. I think disruptors would be so much more powerful. Like if we're planning to play a longer game, disruptors are other game changes. But Max Ed has shown he really does not feel comfortable with those. And I think SCV, if he can yeah. kind of round out this with a bit of a gas transition, the disruptor transition he looked so good within the last game. He's already got the upgrade advantage for the first time in this game in about 20 seconds, and uh, even more so when his plus two armor kicks in. SCV's adding blink DT tech. He's got a bit more progression, even though he's way down on the workers. Max Ed just took such a long time to take that fifth base. And now as SCV sets up for his own Zealot counterattacks in the north, he's still got a bigger army in the middle of the map, which he's had for most of this game. And the Stalker Zealot of Max had, uh, is now out upgraded for the first time. Yep. Uh, there's going to be a, uh, a factor as well that these upgrades have finally turned around. Something that we have to say has not happened throughout the course of this so far. We blink in as Max had again playing aggressively. Gets rid of that battery immediately. SCV has so many units across the map and he's doing very good damage. But then obviously he needs to be able to hold on here as well. And that currently is not happening. So... This could be the you know one of these turning points. As we have yeah, ourselves. absolutely. I mean, good, good stalker well. micro, but he's losing the third and a lot of probes at it. Great stalker micro, though. That's going to give him value over time. You can see this, the army supply just dips there for Max Ed as all the zealots go down, and that's the the, the just focus on that micro for SCV. His own zealots got cleaned up on Max Ed's side of the map, though. Max Ed has still got that worker advantage, and he killed the Nexus, whereas SCV didn't. So you know, if Max Ed can stabilize. He definitely could still do very well in this game. He's got his own double forge up, but he's not really using it. He's all about the micro in the middle of the map. SCV has blink DT, but no splash damage. No Archons, no Disruptors, nothing like that. Now, you might be wondering why no Archons to counter the Zealots. The reason is these guys are so heavy on Stalkers and Archons are so short range, they will get focused down pretty quickly and no one really has a, an excess of gas. So unless you have like a big gas bank, you don't really want to focus on Archons unless your opponent's amassing Zealots, in which case you're like, oh, okay, let's get some Archons for the splash damage. So it's more of a Stalker battle with some Zealot support, some Zealot run-bys. Both players looking for DT harass. 
but a very much a mirror matchup. SEV still up 18 army supply. Max said, now with his fifth base mining is gonna be a beautiful economic advantage. He's still he's got a massive excess of probes, but you know what? Big skirmish in the fight. This could turn into an all out brawl that decides the game. The stalker count for SCV is so magnificent. Good. 35 to 24, massive stalker advantage and plus two armor. Yep, he just has the extra upgrades. He has the extra numbers and he is winning through the middle of the map right now as we speak. GG is going to be called and that is going to do it as you are going to see SCV taking the win here and is going to be on the 2 and 0 oh over Max said to put him at 1 and 1 in this group stage again worth noting where we're at in the group because it is uh, becoming rather important. So uh, there you Indeed. Go. Well played by SCV. Indeed man. it is. Full series. Max, I mean, SCV looked really great. Like just very, I mean, that's like a hard game to stay calm in. Max had so in your face after. I mean, the early game was, I think, in his map control, but man, he he got, yeah, really, really good at just hanging in there, fighting back, and just a little bit more of an all-encompassing sort of thing, whereas it is kind of funny. Like, if you look at the latter years of StarCraft 2 to the early and middle years, the player's macro is much better. There is much more breadth for every player. You get a lot more people who are very expert at the early game or just expert at the mid game, and they had, like, a smaller tool set that they were deeper experts at in Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm. Legacy of the Void these days, 2024 players, they just, the new generation are good at so many areas and so many different transitions. You might be like, this guy's not really that good at an air swap, but he's still done it thousands of times and is still very, like, so much better. Whereas the players back in, 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 in the older days were just not as flexible. And I think you could see that with SCV, being willing to go disruptors, go blink DTs, play the double forge style, good variety and just a bit more comfort spreading water in the game, whereas Max Head was like, I got to get it done with these Blink Stalker timings. Yep, and definitely a uh, a notable difference there. And uh, you're talking about players from the older generation peak. We got Jim playing next. He's going to be taking on Nanami, kind of another setup where it's like a newer name versus a very old name. Jim was probably alongside Max Head, the guy, you know, from China back in the day. Like, those were the two pros players yeah. to watch out for. So... Uh, very cool, uh, you know, we're talking about kind of bringing out the data energy. Maybe that's what Jim's going to bring here. It is PvP. <laughs> it is coming up next, guys. We'll be back with more StarCraft 2. Two matches remain in Asia, but don't forget there's also eight best of threes coming up in Americas later on. So there's loads of StarCraft 2 still to come here in the ESL as a Team Masters Regionals.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We're getting to the end of our matches here in the Asia region, Swiss round two. And we've been going at it for a few hours now, and we've got a couple matches left. It's going to be PvP up next, Pig, with Nanami taking on Jim again. Another of these old-timers that we're saying just before we slipped off over to the break. With uh, Jim coming through against, again, a bit of a newer name in, in Nanami. It's kind of funny because Max had's like proper 36 years old, born 87. Jim was so good at such a young age. I was looking at it. I'm like, he's only like 28 years old. And I'm like, really? I thought you were wow. older than that. Like, oh, yeah, right. He was like 16 and he was killing it. Like, right. When he was hitting his, his just, you know, unstoppable sort of form. So it's kind of funny. Nanami, like we said, another young one born just in 2003. So. Uh, you know, a baby compared to some of these older ones. Uh, was that five years after StarCraft 1 came out, you know, being born? So <laughs> definitely a, a newer player to the top level, but players showed some really good performances and some nice progress. Historically, the two players only played once. They played late last year in the Winter Regionals, and it was a 2-0 for Jim. So there's not a lot of history for us to look into. It is, of course, yet again, another PvP and a matchup where we're going to very quickly, no doubt, figure out what the player's intentions are and what their specialties are. Down at the bottom right side, he was hailed as the Protoss Hope of China for quite a while back in Heart of the Swarm and Early Legacy. It is Jim. Taking on our red Protoss on the other left-hand side of the map we have from Mystery Gaming, it is Nanami. Now, uh, it is going to be just high ground wall offs for both sides on Oceanborn. Pretty standard right now. And uh, we did see a little bit more sentry usage in that last series. Not a crazy amount, but a few more hallucinations flying across. A little bit more of that sentry damage. We'll see what comes out here between these two as they do scout at the same time. Uh, Oceanborn's a map which we saw in that last game. You know, there's not that much room across the map. And uh, you can see if you're fighting, it can be a non stop stalker brawl. Prisms have lots of dead space to work around in the back as well, if they want to kind of just uh, be annoying back there. And uh, we'll see exactly how the players want to progress. So far, second gate comes down, and neither side faking a second pylon out of the map or anything like that. They're just going right on in there to see what the other guy is doing. When you've got both players focusing and prioritizing on their scouting, that is uh, kind of a sign that they want to not necessarily just try and catch their opponent off guard, but play a bit more... Uh, differently now jim's going straight on to gas for only 14 workers on minerals three on one gas two on the other about to be three that to me says stargate build doesn't have to be but definitely tends to be in that direction whereas nanami has been very mineral focused keep the full saturation on minerals and then rally into the gases which means usually kind of i want to get the nexus up i want to be just a couple of basic gateway units maybe a bit more stalker focused than sentry opening uh sentry focused in the opening as well yep no definitely a couple different ways to uh to look at all that two adepts already on the way from Nanami, and you can see Jim again a sentry immediately. So, whoa, a sentry opening pig in Asia. It's, it's happening. I've seen them. Wild. It's, Jim they believes in the sentry. Now, I mean, adepts don't do bonus to light as well. Not only do sentries do bonus damage to shields now, six plus four to shields, which is great, but you've also got they're not light, so adepts actually take forever to kill them, whereas adepts used to be the natural predator of the sentry. So, Four adepts coming in. Whoa, hello. It's going to catch Jim's probe as these adepts shade out. At least Jim knows there's two adepts coming and he starts another sentry. Oh, dude, this is exact. I would love to see a six adept first six sentry opening. Like, this is exactly like... <laughs> would you like to see the patch changes, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> this could potentially be exactly that. If we see a big fight between sentries and the new adepts, you know, can you still get enough adepts to just one-shot a sentry if you get, like, six or so? I don't think so. I mean, a sentry has 80 hit points and Adept yeah. does, what is it, like 10 damage? I think it is, without the bonus to light. Yeah, I, that sounds about right to me. It's, uh, yeah, no, I think that's good. Yeah, check. maybe you can two-shot it even with battery healing than with six Adepts, but uh, yeah, we'll see how 10. it goes. The Adepts, yeah, the, the, the sentry's going to scout. I mean, the hallucinations already scouts and sees sees what's going on. So, I mean, Jim's like, okay, cool, it's Robo, but also non-stop adepts. Um, I imagine we're going to warp in two stalkers the moment that warp gate finishes in a second. Extra pylons on the way. Twilight Council's building. 
And these adepts don't really have that much chance. Pylon on the front. Oh, it is going to be an eight adept timing. Wow. Oh, it's an eight adept timing. Wow, that's a big commitment, mate. Yeah, he's going to send it. I mean, you wouldn't think that this is as good now. The adepts are going to get through, but obviously will not commit. Two stalkers do begin to warp in. Blink starts up from Jim. He just needs numbers. He needs damage output. And these adepts, so eight of them come one. through. Oh. I think they have one armor, so they should survive a single volley. But the adepts are just going to stay on the low ground. Oh my god, he goes for the pylon. Okay. This is a crazy move. You don't want to get trapped by force field, though. Ooh, Ooh. good trap for Jim. Gets rid of one of these adepts. Great wall off with the gateway. Dude, Jim's defense is on point. Jim's looking tight. Ooh. Oh, force field would have been good there to maybe trap some of those adepts. He does trap a few of them. Quite a few probes going down. But is that worth losing so many adepts is the question. The probes don't even try to run away. I'm a little surprised at that. I thought Jim would pull the probes away to deny the easy targets. Five adepts for eight probes. Not a terrible trade for Jim, but you've got to be careful losing economy because economy is the main thing in StarCraft. It is what you turn into everything else. And look at that. Sentry's kind of blocking, actually, but the Stalker's a little slow to react there. Definitely Nanami being annoying. Jim's in trouble. If he loses too many more probes, he's going to have to do a very vicious counterattack, which could work. But you don't want to be forced into a position in StarCraft. You never want to be in a spot where you have to go do damage to them. And he is indeed in a position where that is something that he would like to do. Pylon sees the third Nexus go down. Looks like Jim's just going to try and macro out of this, but he's going to need a lot of chronos on those probes if he wants that to work out. Yeah, and then that means up, you know, 10 workers. I, I initially did think, I was like, man, well, Jim's killing all these adepts. He's going to have a good time on the counter with that blink, but... The more probes that he lost, the less powerful that timing was going to end up being. And now, as Blink is done, he's just taking a third base. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't hate it in terms of, like, I don't think you can necessarily do something across the map. But I do hate it because you're taking a third when down 10 workers here. It's actually going to be potentially a push yeah. from an army with an immortal or two that could be very powerful as well. So there's just a lot of threat I mean, here in the future oh. for Jim. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the Stalker should, should have been on the other side. He should have sent something over because now he's both not in position to defend the Prism and he's not doing any counter aggression. And that is crazy damage. Oh, he's not running probes again? I, I think both times <laughs> running probes is the counter to the depths, but he's not running them. Yeah. He's not doing anything, mate. He's just sat there. Nine, nine more workers lost. The damage from Nanami is through the roof and... As he gets another Immortal up, it just gets safer and safer for him. I mean, I guess the problem for Nanami is he did not take a third, so Jim now has a third. Nanami knows this. He's adding six more gateways. He's just going to go for one massive timing at some stage of this. Yeah, man's not man's not making blink this game. N Nanami's not making blink. This is just going to be charge and go. <laughs> maybe maybe even adding a few arcs. There might be a third Nexus that comes up kind of delayed, but I don't think Nanami's going to be probing it very much. I think it's going to be a transitional third at best. So, uh, yeah, Jim's trying to recover on three base, trying to make his own charge. I, I kind of, I'm always torn in this position if I've taken this much damage in early PvP where I'm like, okay, I mean, you, you did kill the Prism. You caught a lot of Adepts. Nanami lost more units and didn't get a third base off it. So, like, there is an argument that Jim can just be very efficient with Stalker defense and get back into the game. The problem is going to be Archons coming in. Like, Archons, if you go too heavy on the Zealots, the Archons will do very well. You know, the, the sentries, the Gaisha, the three immortals, if they ever land hits on your stalkers, the density of Nanami's value in his army is quite high. And Jim still hasn't dealt with that pylon below his third base. He, he does know about it. I'm a little surprised that he hasn't dealt with that just yet. As Mafu's pointing out, he has seen it. Yep, it is. It is there. It is chilling. And we do have ourselves the, uh, the charge. Coming up from uh, an army, that's going to be pretty much the trigger to go. He has so much gas, by the way, and there we have the High Templars warping in, so he can spend that gas, and that's really going to power up his army supply. It's 60 to 33, almost doubling here, uh, and with all the timing windows kind of coming together at once, an army is getting set to go and looking to kill Jim, punish him for going to that third base, and punish him for all that damage he took earlier in the game. Jim doesn't seem to see the Zealots warping in at his third. This is crazy. It's... It's been in vision the whole time. <laughs> he, he's going to not react. Jim being a little bit slow to the, the, the pull here, the pull the trigger, and he's on a move command as well. Jim definitely having a rough start to today's games. And the Zealot Archon does come forward, trying to take down the battery. With the battery overcharge not even available, Jim's eight gateways just finished. His cannons aren't quite ready. He was trying to build a cannon in every base, but he is just getting absolutely mauled. The Nami with the heavy adept pressure into a swarming two-base charge of immortal arc on timing attack a big way to just overwhelm your opponent and that was brutally efficient as a finishing blow
So an army did uh, really just identify, hey, look, I did a lot of damage. You're going to try and get back in the game by playing macro? No, I'm not, not having that. So he just shuts that down right from the very get-go, and Anami takes that first opening map. And it's going to be up by one. Here against Jim, obviously, again, they're both 0-1 in the group. It's an important series to kind of, you know, set up week two for yourselves. But yeah, Nanami obviously taking the lead here, and uh, we'll see what Jim adjusts in game two. It did feel as though the potential to defend properly was there from Jim. Like, if he pulled the probes away initially, that first adept attack is nowhere near as bad. He could have caught them with the sentries and force fields a little better. Yeah. Potential was there, but the execution was lacking in. It's almost like he's allergic to selecting his probes because he just could not pull them away multiple times over different attacks, and he just let them sit there and take the, the entirety of the damage, so... It, it kind of when the adepts committed into the natural the first time i think he actually had two force fields and i thought he could actually block behind the minerals and in the minerals and kind of mm. trap those adepts and just kill them all because there wasn't enough to get through the battery damage unless they're one-shotting probes right um but then they were able to just kind of shuffle through the mineral line and kill a ton of probes and it was surprising because even at that point it was like just just click the probes to the left side of the mineral line at the very least you know or, or your third base or something like that and i i that's the thing is like I guess as a Zerg player, primarily, you know, I've played a lot of PvP and stuff, but I mean, you learn very quickly in the early days of Legacy of the Void when Adept Rise came around, run drones away. And then that was really nailed in after Zest beat Serral at Katowice with, you know, he ushered in the year of non-stop Glaive Adept openings back in 2020, I think it was. And that was like, oh, okay. Every, every player has played against it a billion times. But it is surprising because I mean, six Adept openings, eight Adept openings, it was always like, like the wall offs were great. Like it felt like Jim's early game was so clean with the pylons, the batteries, then going for gateway wall off to make sure they couldn't focus it down. It was just the not pulling the probes away that was a bit confusing. And then after that damage, it felt like he was just a little bit shook. You know, when the minimap awareness disappears like that to the point where there's a red dot on your minimap next to your third and you just don't notice it for over a minute, that's something we only see when a player is like, their adrenaline's pumping like crazy. Or they're in Silver League, you know, it's it's one of those two things. <laughs> so I think Jim's maybe just having a bit of an off day or he's just going to have to try and refocus this game because not seeing the pilot in the third to me shows that he's, he's a little bit distracted today and he's going to need to just totally get his mind in the right spot now to get back on track. Well, it's going to be game number two. We'll see if he can get his mind in the right spot. It's Ghost River. We saw Crazy Cannon Rush on this map earlier from, uh, from Haas. We'll see if the PvP has any shenanigans for us this time around as we get into it right here. Ghost River it is here, and we get into game number two. See if Jim, like you say, can refocus, get back on track, or if Nanami is just going to run away with it in these next few moments. It's a good skill check opening from Nanami in game one. You know, hey, let's open up with a bunch of adepts, get in there, give him a hard time. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, whenever I play against that in a PvP, I'm kind of going to myself like, oh gosh, oh. I know this takes a refined response and I know at some point I'm going to not put that gateway down in the wall and I'm going to let the adepts in or something like that. It's it's often like when you play it's that you're like, I defended well, I killed an adept, I defended, I killed another two adepts, haven't lost many probes yet. And then, then they get in and kill 10 probes and you're like, ah, oh, an oracle flies in and everything falls apart. So I'm sure Jim uh, frustrated after that first game as we do get the famous, uh, your load screen goes to about 40% and then it just sits there and you go, oh, did someone drop? Did someone lag out? And then I've about... once been on this screen for five minutes, and then it's finished loading. Yeah. Usually it's like someone crashes, and then they just, they don't actually, like, close their client when it's crashed. Because when they, they close out of the crash, it usually loads for instantly for everyone, but then, oh. yeah, it's a, it's a thing. Some people just don't realize that their game's crashed, even though it's, like, a drink, like spinning wheel in the middle of the screen and stuff. But, yeah. Yeah. We, we are just a little stuck right now. That's all right. Uh, it's going to be Ghost River PvP, though. Nanami showed heavy pressure in game one. The two base timing might not be the, you know, fanciest way to finish things off, but if you're far ahead, like, it's very safe if you think your opponent's going to desperately counter push. Like, ah, oh, if I take a third, Blink Stalkers run in, you can open yourself up to problems, right? But if you sit on two base with a battery, immortal sentries, make your forge, make your plus one, make your eight gates, it's not a bad play. I do hope to see a few more disruptors at some point today. I was very excited seeing those from SCV in the previous series, but we'll see how we go. Uh, Marpu pointing out that the players are playing with uh, using, you know, VPNs and things. There can be different internet issues that happen, of course, trying to make sure they do get the best connections to the servers. So fair enough. We'll uh, just take a minute to sort this one out. And 
Uh, don't forget, guys, that uh, technology is the vehicle of esports, and uh, much like sometimes it rains or, or other weather events cancel sporting events, uh, sometimes here with gaming events, uh, we we have to have delays in things just uh, due to technological issues. So thank you for your patience. We appreciate, it, I guess. Yeah, really. At at some point, this is just gonna crash out, or so. Just need to figure out what the situation is. I know it's been uh, we've actually had pretty pretty generally kind of quick going movement lately but uh all in this event but today's been a little bit slower here and there so um that's gonna be one thing that we're just kind of sitting and waiting on as well there's the referee but nanami's afk so i think we're just gonna jump out get this hosted again and go for round two pick referee uh yeah. it's uh it's always always someone i mean to be fair at least this isn't one of those bloody weekly lobbies we get to the finals of eu and there's 37 people in the lobby and every time, every time Kevin goes, pig, stop making everyone lag from Australia. I'm like, it's not me. I was casting every other game. It's one of the other 37 casters in this lobby, but no one knows who it is and they're not going to own up to it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, at least it's just a few of us in this one, which is much less chance for technical issues. But it is what it is. Uh, looks like we're getting the remake now. They're going to host that one up. Yep. But no doubt be ready to start another PvP. Extra chance for Jim to kind of give himself a shot of coffee here, get himself perked up and awake for the next game. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I'm just going to try and get this ready to go. I mean, Jim is, uh, let's see, I'm a bit nerve wracking, man. You about to load into your game and you're like, it freezes and you have to regame. You're like, oh man, I was so ready yeah. to go. So, uh, yeah. It is what it is, man. Um, as the players get into it, they get another chance though. At least there was no, uh, it's always annoying when it, it dies two minutes into the game or something like that, you know, and like you've scouted each other's openings or something, because then it's like, ah, now we have to resume from replay because we really don't want different spawns or anything else to happen. And players sometimes giving away what they, they started with and then they want to change it up because the other player has too much time to like think about it and plan and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. PVP coming up, gang. Um. Okay, so outside of that early game stuff, we did see a bit of Oracle opening earlier today as well. So let's explain some fundamentals of PvP to kill a bit of time while we get this one set up. Uh, basically, the old school triangle that was always described of counters in PvP is Robo counters, Twilight, Twi Twilight counters, Stargate, Stargate counters, Robo. And basically what that means is like, hey, if there's Phoenix and Oracles, they're gonna harass the heck out of you. Robo does nothing that shoots up. Phoenix counter prisms, uh, Phoenix can pick up Immortals. Basically, Robo sucks against that. However, Immortals and Prisms can do very well against Blink, especially in the early stages. But the longer it goes, Blink is the more well-rounded and standard upgrade because it gives you so much mobility, the ability to blink in, blink out, run around, do counterattacks and all that sort of stuff. And of course, if you've got a quick blink, you can shut down Oracles and Phoenix and really give them very little chance to harass you. But that's a very much a simplification. So you've got obviously windows where the four blinks done, you know, basically the Oracle can get in and do a ton of damage. And and if the Oracles get a bunch of damage, they set themselves up to get their own Blink behind and you go to that middle stage. But Blink is the most standard. Robo makes you much less mobile. You, you kind of centralize your power wherever your Immortals and your Prism are and you can't move around too much. You can't cover multiple areas. Blink's a bit more mobile. And Stargate, of course, is the ultimate high-speed mobile scouting opening, but it gives you almost no power with your frontal army. So it's going to give you disadvantages in the early fights. You need to find better scouting, better harassment to make that worthwhile. Hopefully that explains some stuff as we're finally getting into game. Thank you everyone for bearing with us as we uh, fill a bit of time there. But it looks like we're going into game two. Lost game one after a bit of inattention. In the top left side in the blue, we've got Jim. And it's up right up a map. It is going to be Nanami. And up an ultimate series of Asia today. Who will take the win? Who will close us out? Questions being asked. All right. So, I mean, this map, I, I you know, you know what I haven't seen yet is anyone open the top minerals for a sneaky push. And it's, it's, I guess it's, it's only really something that comes in later in the game. But I, I, I keep thinking on this map, like at some point, are we going to see someone open up that that slightly faster push path and use that? Yeah, probably not. Not in PvP. If there's a matchup for it, probably not this one. Very early scout for Jim. Is he going to fake cannon rush? This map does have a nasty cannon spot we found out about mm -hmm. earlier. Remember Hass doing the proxy gate. I wonder if he's going to put down a pile and just try and scare him. I think seeing such an early probe for Nanami, he can't really get much of a reaction anyway. Yeah. And he ends up maybe just doing this because he's worried about 
being on the receiving end of that cannon rush. He just wants to be super safe. Yeah. I'm just going to be seeing the gates on both sides then. So both players are going to get that scout off early and see. Okay, nothing crazy here just yet. Oh. That probe goes down, though. Usually the probe sticks around a long time. So that's now Jim. Yeah. Just with less information than he should usually have for the foreseeable future in this game. That is a big deal. Jim also two games in a row now has put three workers on one gas while there's none on the other. So it's just a little bit inefficient. For those who don't know, when you have a third worker on gas, they have to wait a little bit for the other guy to finish mining. So the third worker is a bit less efficient than the other two. You do want to go two on each and then the third, something that everyone used to be really detail oriented on, including I'm pretty sure I've seen Jim do that many times, but recently a bunch of players have been really lazy on that. So I'm like, I'm like, Jim, no, you're one of the old dogs. You know not to do this. It's the young kids that are lazy with this, not the old dogs, but uh, falling into that habit. Hero, Hero likes to do that one sometimes. I'm always like, no, Hero. But uh, Stalker Sentry for an army, double Stalker for Jim. Interesting to see an army look like he's in a bit more of a defensive stance. I do wonder if Jim pulls out an all in or something at some point. He's making it look like an expand build so far. Once the double Stalker's out, we'll see some decisions though. Yep, those two Stalkers are about to pop. So out they come and we'll see what the next choice of this is going to be. Sentry on the way from Nanami back at home, so he's putting his money there rather than any sort of tech structure at all. And Jim does start up two more stalks, so we'll have a lot of firing power on the map. We'll be able to wander across and throw some shots, but we'll see if that ever ends up being enough here. Jim did Jim did run over with a second probe to, to throw down another pylon to block the expansion. A bit of damage goes down that sentry, adding a significant amount of damage these days. Remember That's that crazy. plus 40 shield yeah. helps burn through those very quickly. We, we used to call it the the light bulb attack you know the flash the flashlight like it's just shining a light on the unit going hey i'm totally tickling you you know the tickle beam many disrespectful names for the sentry's damage never again will we use that in pvp we we absolutely are fearful of its damage now it's like an actual gateway unit that does a fair bit two sentries two stalks more than enough oh god jim run to the right oh you get force fielded yeah you should have run to the right oh good catch find an army very well done so on point with these force fields has been uh, really able to kind of take me or make the most of them becoming such an important thing in pvp being good with your force fields because these sentries are better you're going to have them more often in the early game as this prism comes up here from jim and he is going to be getting set but as an army expands with a robo of his own i love that for him because it means he's going to have the way to you know a way to basically match jim in a lot of ways you know you get your own immortal out and you get you know, your own prism to micro the defensive setup here that's possible for Nanami looks good. Let's see what he builds. It is an immortal first. I think that's the right call. Get a real power unit out and honestly feel it's going to be difficult for Jim to do something. He's probably going to have to get quite creative with his push. We do have sentries, remember, so the force fields are a big factor as well when it comes to taking this fight and the position that the fight can take place in. I'm still kind of terrified for these stalkers. They're about to get force field one more time, but with the prism now here, that's less of a factor. And now you can use those sentries purely as just kind of defensive mechanisms. It's a lot of stalkers. Oh, oh. force field's there. Already going to catch, and the prism's too far away, so that stalker does go down. Dude, I, I don't know what Jim can do with this, because he doesn't have an immortal. There's an immortal out now for an army. Yeah. I mean, trying to get some adepts in the main might be the way to do it. Go go quickly, walk, warp three adepts in the main, get them in the middle line. Like, But I don't think pure stalker has any chance of overwhelming no. this. Not with the sentry damage, not with immortals and batteries. Pure stalker is beyond the pipe dream at this point. Look, every yeah. time one of these units goes down, the prism <laughs> almost dies as well. Dude, Nanami is all over this. Like, he's looking like a different caliber of Protoss player. No offense to Jim by any means. Nanami is clearly a player we should have our eye on. You know, this this younger generation of players coming up, they're very skilled, man. They, they put in the hours, they've practiced a lot. And even Nanami getting out front of his base like this, just looking for any pickoffs he can Prism's grab. Dead. Gets the prism. Yeah. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, and this is all with the expansion being up as well, right? So, yeah, Jim knows it. He realizes that this is not going anywhere for him. The one base is not going to work out in an army. Really on point in this series, Pig. Really exciting by a few of the players that we've seen today. Actually, we've seen a bunch of interesting uh, plays and so on. And kind of guys showing up like SCP looked really good. And we had uh, earlier on Lemon looking great. Just having some really exciting plays here in the, uh, the SLS Team Masters Regional Spring for Asia. And that's uh, and that's where the old time has taken a loss on the day, and it's just unfortunately for Jim now 0-2 in this group after 0-2 to Nanami. But Nanami puts himself in a better spot, and again, someone that was challenging for playoffs in previous uh, seasons is once again looking good. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's wild. <laughs> it's just just he's like, you know, I'm like, oh, Jim's got the experience, he's gonna do really well, and then I'm like, 
PvP is punishing. It is a knife's edge matchup, and Nanami is on another level. Likewise, we saw SCV in that previous matchup where Max Head looked good, and uh, SCV just looked great. Now Nanami just looked like entirely outclassing her, just so clean. And you know what was funny? He didn't even like have hallucinations because he was using force fields to defend. But Nanami, like a lot of players will go, oh, I don't know if I'm being all in or not. What do I do? Nanami's like, no, no, I'm just gonna like keep making, make the battery for safety, keep making stalkers and sentries, defensive robo to be safe, probe, stop at 30 probes once we realize there's an all in coming. Just perfectly balanced. This is really, really well refined PVP. And those mirror matchups, especially the ones where if you aren't super tight on your builds, you get to see the skill difference very decisively. So shout out to Nanami, a player to keep our eye on in the rest of these groups. Yep, absolutely. As uh, with that said, we've got one match left today here in the Asia region. It's going to be Mio Mika taking on Silky. So we're going to head ourselves into that. We'll be back in just a few. And it's this last best of three for us.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We've made it to our last match of the Asia Regionals today. Round two is going to be wrapping up here as we get ready to go into Neomica versus Silky. We are ready to go into some ZVZ action. Uh, honestly, hard to pick a favorite here, Pig, because I feel like these are just two very aggressive players, kind of expecting both of them to uh, kind of show up with some aggression to kind of just be very feisty in this series in general. So we'll see how this goes. We'll see what uh, comes out of this as we get ready to go. It's going to be interesting. I mean, uh, Milky, uh, Milky. <laughs> that's the combination of these two <laughs> players. This is the Milky matchup. <laughs> uh, obviously, it's Mio Micah versus Silky. Silky uh, qualified barely over Honmono in one of the silliest series I've ever watched in my life. Um, that was a bizarre series of StarCraft. And, and Silky had to weather the storm of madness. Like, Honmono is the craziest Terran player. Mio Micah is one of the craziest Zerg players. Hey, if Silky can beat Honmono, if he can now beat Mio Micah, that's Silky becomes the, the weirdo slayer, the, the guy who can beat the players that play so often meta and strange, and that would be really good. I do think Silky's a solid macro player when compared to Mio Micah, even though you might normally think of Silky as a more aggressive guy just because Mio Micah is so, so odd. Um, I do expect Silky to be a little more defensive, but we'll see what happens. It's ZVZ. It's wild. We're going to go into the first map on Oceanborn. And uh, man, what an exciting match this is going to be, hey? Uh, we've got... Oh, sorry. Just getting a bit confused with the player camera. There we go. Down here in the bottom right side in the red. It is none other than the Vietnamese wizard, the mastermind, the only man that beat Maru on his way to win 2018 WESG. It is Mio Micah. <laughs> 2 0 him with double hydrogen. Never forget. Yep. Mio Maker was the, the king of that day. As in the top left, our blue Zerg player. It is going to be Silky. Aggressive Chinese Zerg who continues to come out with all sorts of, of wild stuff lately. Yeah, some some surviving against Han Mono. Dude, I mean, that was just crazy. He lost like 30 drones to a Hellion run by and, and somehow came back in the final game of that series. So some real clutch play there. Um, now, basically, Silky, I think, will be a bit more reactive, is playing a bit more standard with a hatchery first, whereas Mio Micah is going for his pool first that he likes to do. Now, there's a few, a few things. I feel like Mio Micah has been on a bit of a downswing recently. His MMR has dropped. He used to be like, you know, he'd go on in these NA ladder sprees, and NA ladder was a bit more active then as well. I'd say there was more high-level players at that time, and he'd be like 70 wins, one loss. Like, he was just, you know, very scary, very scary in the Korean ladder as well. Lately, it feels like he's changed his builds up a bit, and... Some things he's still as confident as ever, but there are certain matchups like ZVZ where it feels like he used to always open up very heavy on queens, like four queens every game, and he was kind of immune to a lot of pressures and he'd like walk queens across with certain attack timings. He's moved away from that, and it does feel a little bit more like it's, um, if you have really good scouting, you can figure out what he's doing and counter it. So we'll see if Silky can, can do that. Uh, definitely Mio maybe being slightly less confusing i think to, to his opponent scouting than he used to be it used to be very hard to read because you'd scout something and he'd do the complete opposite thing realizing that you've scouted them and that you'd expect it but we'll see how he comes out i'm sure he's prepared heavily for these regionals and i am always keen to see what special source he's bringing yeah there's almost always something kind of funky and fun going on Mia Micah always has a, a fun set of builds and you see his few links showing up now. Shouldn't be able to do too much. All the links are silky ran past, so these things get to go in the main base. Queens are not ready yet, and this is going to be drone in trouble here, Pick. I mean, we jumped in. One drone already hurting. Now the drones pull in general, but this is a lot of lost mining time for silky. I mean, now we let you lose a drone and lost mining time. What a great set of four links. Just, just really causing <laughs> trouble. Yeah, maybe Silky not as familiar with Mio as he should be, because Mio does this every game. Uh, pull first into four link pressure every game. Oh, and Silky's Overlord, he was oh, so distracted, no. he loses an Overlord, throws a Roach Horn? Whoa, Silky, so, uh, so, so Mio Micah does that in front, Silky's in a little bit of trouble now. Definitely not paying attention, and now having very limited map vision. Roach Ling aggression could come out of Mio very hard. Did Silky actually see the Roach Horn with his vision with the Lings, or did they go into the main first? I think he saw it. So, uh, yeah, it looks like he did there. No, he didn't no, he actually. Didn't. Oh, my yeah. bad. He didn't find it. It's um, a little unlucky, so it doesn't get that information as we've got a lot of gas to spend on Roach's two links. We're about to finish, so we'll have a few more links popping as well. Minerals are going to be the, the hold pack on the uh, Mio Micah's 
Roach production. If he wants to build Roaches straight away, he gets one more Overlord readying up as well. And Silky, his own Roach Roar coming down, getting ready very soon. Massling coming out for me. The thing is, Silky's doing the same thing just slightly later. Silky just needs to go home. His Overlords have not been fixed. I, I, can't, I don't know why Silky hasn't moved his Overlord further north. Because he's playing very blind right now. He should be defending, not attacking. But he doesn't have the information to know that. And he's running into the Queens on the other side of the map. He loses four drones at home. And he sacrifices a lot of Zerglings, taking a bad fight into the Queens. He needs to basically... The thing is, he's got a worker advantage. If he just builds Roaches and Lings and defends, he's just ahead in this game. Like, yeah. But he's got to realize what's happening. And Silky, after losing an Overlord, the most important thing in ZVZ is vision outside your opponent's base. And Silky's under so much panic playing against the oddness that is Mio Mika, that he's not fixed his basics of vision. Like, luckily the Lings see what's coming, but he's losing a lot of Lings just to get that info. And you can tell he's feeling the heat. A lot of players struggle when they play Mio because it's such a different rhythm to your normal Zerg versus Zerg. He's going to have to stabilize and he's got to do it soon. Silky is under pressure. He's got a two worker lead, but he's way down on army and he desperately needs to buy time to get out more roaches and Lings of his own. Mm-hmm. Yep, we absolutely need that as we have ourselves a spine crawler coming up. Five more roaches producing three. We have our Ling Roach arriving. I mean, so I'm surprised getting close and Mio Mike looks at the front door and says, okay, I'm going to back away. I'm taking my third base. So he's not going to commit through here at all. He's just going to fall back home. And Mio Mike will just uh, say, okay, you know what? Fast third base for me. His work counts dead even. So on we go. Third base for both sides. Silky's down a few workers that are a little bit behind in the momentum. I think, Asoki, you want to move across the map here to the halfway point, feign like you're counterattacking, but actually drone up behind it. He's actually saying, no, I'm just going to straight up mass units. Interesting. So I think Silky's basically hoping Mio will over drone, tech up, and then he can go kill him with his own Ravager Link. And you know what? Mio's making an Evo, a gas, a lair, more drones. All of these things are fine as long as he stops droning and starts making army soon, which he has not started doing it. He sees a big army. There we go. Back to Roaches for Mio. He needs to mass army now, realizing, whoa, that's a big force that Silky's building. He's got the Ling advantage, though. Oh, Silky, you cannot fight with less Zerglings. That looks like it's going to be potentially a third base snipe. Lots of Lings coming out, though, for Silky as well. Mio just leaves a few Lings attacking the hatchery. Good split of his units. Good angle for Silky, though. Silky does actually get the concave there. But as more Lings come over, Mio does get himself the cancel. Silky's kind of a little bit haphazard in the engage. Roaches do go in on the other side. It's an army supply lead for Mio Micah right now. If he can bring the Lings back and wrap around behind these, he should absolutely slay. Right now, his Roaches are a little outnumbered, but the Queens are helping out with Transfuse. And as the Lings come in from behind, there's no escape for these Roaches. Mio Micah putting this game in exactly where he wanted it to go. And Silky struggling to deal with that. From the early Zerglings arriving, it felt like Silky panicked a little bit. The Overlord went down on the other side, never replaced the vision, and then was just reeling and kind of surprised by all the different attacks. Once Mio Micah gets an inch, he'll take a mile. You cannot give him that sort of momentum early on, or he's an unstoppable force. Yeah, no, this is... Um... Yeah, no, Mio Micah just gets in your head and if you give him an inch he will take a mile and, and silky just never really mentally recovered i feel like from the very start of this game losing an overlord losing a drone drone pull against the lings he was just not ready at all we've seen silky be better than this in the past um but yeah this this was not exactly ideal so we're gonna hop on into game number two we are gonna swap to singapore server which means we just got your server hop to the americas oh so okay cool, cool. hosted so we will be on that I just take us a couple of extra moments to get into this game number two. Uh, that was a pretty swift uh, my, my game of CVZ. It's my favorite server, the Singapore server, man. That's what we used to have before the Australian server existed. The good old Southeast Asian server still has. I mean, it's actually crazy because I remember the ping used to be like 145 from Australia. And these days I have like, a, I don't know, 90, 90, like 100 ping at most to it. It's really nice because uh, whenever I'm playing against any of these guys in the Asian region, any of the Korean players, we get to play with nice low ping, really responsive. For Mio, he's in Vietnam. He's he's not far from, from Singapore at all. So he's got fantastic ping to Singapore. And uh, it's going to be pretty good for Silky as well, of course. It's not like China's very far from uh, from Singapore geographically. I mean, compared to me, I mean, I feel like everything's right next door when it comes to uh, my comparison, right? Living in Australia, like I think, I think Singapore's next door for me and it's solid eight hour flight away so <laughs> it is it is a, a bit Not of a different perspective door. that i have yeah. i'm like less than 200 ping oh instant reaction this is great yeah 
All right, um, we're going to head into uh, this next game in just a couple of moments while they get that figured out and get this hostage up. And, uh, yeah, we get ourselves into game number two. Mio Mike with a 1-0 lead. Silky is obviously down. Needing to back this up. And again, to reiterate where we're at, these guys are all 0-1 and one in the group so far. So, for them, it really is important because they want to be 1-1. One and one. That gives you a better chance going into yeah. week three and into Swiss round three. So, that's uh, a big factor to think on as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely Mio is showing what he's been doing on the ladder recently in game one. I wouldn't be surprised if he does something very similar in game two, but just kind of changes the timings up a little bit. Uh, the delayed third has always been Mio's weakness. He, he delays his third for an insane amount of time. Um, I think one of the best openings against Mio is something where you really focus on just getting your natural saturated as early as possible. Um, and then make enough units to be safe before taking a third. And that's kind of the, the two goals, which sound simple in ZBZ, but are very difficult when you're playing against him. And it's funny because I actually learned this from playing Mio, because I actually felt he was, like I said, a scarier in this matchup six months to a year ago when he would saturate his natural faster than anybody else. Um, delay, while people were trying to rush third bases always versus him. And then he would kind of get you with the aggression while you're trying to drone up your third or defend it. Uh, because he'd just have a bit of mineral advantage off of his, his kind of nice solid queen openings and he'd try to push down any overlords he could. So I wouldn't mind, I think actually 15-15, normally not the greatest build unless you're planning to be very aggressive or defend someone who's highly aggressive in ZBZ. It's actually a perfect opening against Mio because you get your queens out early, you do drone both your bases up uh, way quicker. You can have your natural saturated by about 3 minutes 10 as opposed to about 3.30 with a lot of the normal 16 hatchery openings. Uh, and that gives you a big advantage, especially if you're not planning to rush the third, which, as we said, is always a conundrum against Mio. You can do it, but it's awkward because you often want Banelings to make up for being a bit down on Zerglings. If you do that, you're very weak to his roaches. Uh, we're going to be going into Ghost River for map two as well, a map where those bushes can explode across here very quickly. So I do wonder if Silky yeah. might try like a double Evo Roach Warren wall off, something to be like... I'm not playing the Zergling game. We're just going to wall off, try to get to two base roaches with roach speed, maybe slow the game down that way. Yeah, no, it, it's it's such an aggressive map that, yeah, maybe you do just kind of play defensively in a way that's like, you take that phase out of the game and then you just sort of slowly build up, take that third a bit slow, but with a larger army so you don't have to worry so much about the aggression a lot of the time. So, uh, just get ourselves ready to go into this. We have our couple of... Players join the lobby. Looks like there will be a moment or so to hop on in. And we're going to be going into game two of this in just a moment. Mio Mike is up 1-0 in this best of three again with server swap. It just takes a few extra moments to get ready. That's what is the current delay. Shouldn't be much longer. Looks like the players are in the player slots right now. We're going to be good to go. Game two and game three on Singapore. So uh, we won't need to hop servers after this yeah. game. Assuming there is a game three, if Silky can win this one. Silky just needs to race up. I'll just remind him in there as well. Uh... Yeah, he's at the Make bathroom, sure race okay. All yeah. right, cool, cool. Um, Mutalisks is something I haven't seen from Mio in a while. I would like to see Mutalisks personally. Not sure if this is the map for it though, but if they do get to map three, we might talk more about that. Ghost River's a bit too cramped, very dangerous trying to tech towards Mutalisks uh, on such a small map. And we'll see how we go. All right. uh, <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> i don't think that'll actually matter for us at all yeah i don't think um, it matters either but that that only matters for 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 him because he's hosting if you I host think, you go back okay. to the page you're on That's yeah funny. yeah a little bit of a uh, tech advice there yeah. i'm trying to get all right we're getting some information right but uh, we are finally yep. good to go so we should be able to jump into ghost river here <laughs> and get this all started up it is going to be game Number two of Mio Micah versus Silky. It is our last best of three of Asia. That's the last one for me and Pig. We're swapping casters after this. I believe it's Steadfast and Fear Dragon who are going to be coming through. So I'm going to be doing a little swap a on that one. And uh, Yeah, they're boring, yeah. boring in A region. Don't worry about those yeah. guys. If you're really bored, you can hang around for the C team players and casters to hop in. But it's, it's okay <laughs> after this series to just tune out. That's fine. Don't don't hang around. Those games, I mean, they're boring, boring. Game you know, goes. Astraea, Scarlet, ugh. Yuck, yuck. Oh, we're going to have boring here because we go straight into the pause on this <laughs> game, too. I imagine this is probably a hotkey thing, different server and Hotkey stuff, issue. So. One of the settings is different. Yeah. It's like exactly. my classic one. Yeah. It's like, oh, gosh, thumbnails have been being made on this computer. All my all my things are turned off <laughs> to make it look nice. Uh, <laughs> um, 
hotkeys as well is always a fun one you know if you've made the mistake of using your multiplayer hotkey profile and then loading up like a campaign or an arcade game that uses campaign type hotkeys and like you go back into multiplayer and you're like everything is bound differently now oh my gosh <laughs> this is why i always use a different hotkey profile for uh for campaign modes these days but i do occasionally forget it messes things up silky should be good to go and map two is about to be underway as we resume the game heck yeah let's get into it already a bit of a rough start for the player in the top left needs to just be more careful with the overlords as well as build zerglings to make sure you respect that pull first pressure in the top left side of the map it's silky and the 12 pool is down for our red zerg in the upper right up 1-0 the omica heavy pressure opening uh this is not the shortest rush distance in the map pool i don't i can't remember what it is but it's it's one of the other maps maybe crimson is, is, is it like a, a map that's surprisingly short that people don't think of as being that short but uh it's it's more that like when you're both on three base it's so quick to get across to each other on this map but uh 12 pool still still effective it can still absolutely catch your opponent off guard and it's such a good pressure build when your opponent looks a bit shaky like silky did in game one Sometimes you just lean on them. Like, like sometimes, you know, you beat like your friend in StarCraft. They go, why did you pick this strategy? And you go, honestly, I just felt it would make you micro a lot. And I thought I could make you panic and, and make mistakes. And sometimes that's it. Mio just built a queen before queen. he got his fifth and yeah. sixth lane. That was odd. <laughs> yeah, I that saw was odd. I saw him stop at four. Then the queen star. I was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe the lava queen. was just half a second late. And, and normally you'd go hatchery before queen as well, though. Yeah. But when you go queen before hatchery, you can um, potentially deny the overlord because it comes out surprisingly quickly. And like it also freaks them out because they see no hatchery and they panic with the overlord gets here so quick on this map. So I think he's trying to scare Silky. And if he could get the queen out beyond the overlord and hit it from the other side, he can shoo it deeper into his base. And if Silky reacts mm. slowly because Silky's busy microing, if the queen gets this overlord, it's massive and he's going for that. Yeah, Silky's already turned sense. it around. A great reaction by Silky. Really good details. Not making the same mistakes as last game. Well, the Lings will start to nibble up on this hatch and we will wait for the response from Silky. At some point, you will pull drones to try and defend against this because the last thing you want is to have your hatchery going down. Here come the drones, and this is where Mio Mika will try Ooh. to fight and get some damage done. Has the creep as the hatchery nice. finishes the chase, and he very nearly gets that first drone. He will get one drone now and then turns back onto the hatch. So, so far, so good. Hatch half HP, one drone down, a couple hurting, oh. and then more Lings here to fight than never before. You can't let the hatchery die in this scenario. You don't want to lose any drones either. So I think this is a good hold, honestly, by yeah, Silky. Could have gone a lot worse. Wait, wait, why? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I thought that was Mio building Zerglings. I was like, why is Mio still building Lynx? That makes no <laughs> sense. That's crazy. No, no, no. Just getting confused here, getting a bit loopy as we get we get a bit late in the night here in Australia. Uh, extra queens on the way. He's droning. He's expanding. And Silky's still making Lynx. What? Silky's yeah. just going to do a Ling flood all He's in. just going to kind of, kind of, he's like, you all in me, I all in you, buddy. Cool. <laughs> to be oh, honest, you so. brought this on yourself. You know, yeah. be careful you don't kick the wall too hard. It might come falling down on top of you, mate. That's, um, yeah, it's not a bad way to play because you don't really expect it in this scenario. But Silky, I think, had this plan from pretty quick, leaving guys on gas despite pulling so many drones to defend. Normally, you pull off gas completely in this scenario and uh, now pulls off only after the Ling speed, of course. So really well played. And hiding the Lings can be re very good. Um, Mio is making a Roach Warren, but it's not even in the wall. Oh, it is, but he cancels it because it was misplaced. He's trying to wall off. Wait, wait, does he sense what's going on? How does he know what's going on? Uh, Mio I... somehow somehow has sensed this. Yeah, Ooh. he's feeling it. He's got a bunch of his own lings across the map, by the way. They're going to run into trouble as he's having to pull his drones around. So he loses he all of his own right lings. Now. Yeah, he, he needs to just wall off and get the queens in position. The drones are going to move in, get the Evo chamber started. There's one we're waiting yeah, on the money. No minerals. That's not a wall oh, off. Queen, That's not queen, a wall queen. off, dude. Oh my god. Oh no, he needs he needs he needs more. Uh, yeah, he needs to build roaches as well, because otherwise he's got no damage. Two queens don't do a lot of damage. The the, the droning has to start now for Silky, realizing, oh gosh, this didn't actually surprise you as much as I wanted it to. And three queens on the front. Mio holds. He's okay. Puts a queen in the wall. I think roaches can squeeze through that wall. It's an awkward diagonal, so I'm not 100 percent sure. But he's back to mining, takes a second gas, and Silky is going to have to take a third and macro on up. The surprise all in does not pay off. I'm going to absolutely rewind this replay when we're over to figure out. Because it was weird that Mio was going for like three drones, Roach Warren and two more to build Evos before the Lings even ran in. So it felt like he sniffed something was going on. And uh, I'm really curious what his instincts were telling him there. But great spidey senses from Mio and good frantic wall off to stop Silky's all in. I still think Silky's in a good spot though. I think he's ahead after this but only marginally. 
Yeah, he's obviously going to be able to get a third hatch down sooner. Neil will take a slightly sooner plus one missiles, getting his own drone count, going to saturate two bases, and will eventually look to get out to base number three. Once he has the roaches, the, the main thing to note here is obviously no link speed from Silky, right? So as he has no link speed, he can't really do much to pressure a third, so it shouldn't take too long for me and Mike to push out to that third base. The problem is he doesn't necessarily uh, see that or realize that just yet, so... The seven roaches build up, those numbers start to increase, and we'll see what Mio Mike wants to do. Again, imagining he expands, but maybe there's some crazy world he wants to go get even more aggressive, although currently supply blocked. Well, laser for losers is not one thing we can tell, um, you know? Uh, <laughs> kind of makes sense for Silky, you can't really afford the lair, right? You're taking that third, you got a worker advantage, but you got you got to start making army. Because Mio is just massing Roach on 35 drones. It's a three gas plus one Roach timing. This is one of the slowest, clunkiest attacks ever. Silky's sending an Overlord into Sacrifice. And when he sees no lair, he's going to realize exactly what's up. Silky seeing this is huge. He's going to see it in a sec. And there we go, no lair. It, no more drones. Build a spine even, Silky. Just if you survive, you're in a good spot. But you've just got to survive. Mio Mika's build has zero flexibility. It is a slow, clunky blob of roaches that has to win the game or do massive damage. And I don't know. It feels like the army supply is a bit too close. There's the lings ready for the run by as well. I think Silky's in a great spot. Like, such a good idea sending that slow overlord in. Yep. Slow overlords. I'm just going to keep moving about. We're just going to see the roaches of Mio Mika continue over that left hand side. The roaches of Silky setting up two plus one missiles. It's not done just yet, so me and Micah has an upgrade lead to start this fight. This is why, you know, a spine would have just been nice. Something a little extra defensively as me and Micah gets a good start of this. But again, he's still got to reinforce from across the map. That ain't going to be easy. And now the plus one is about to be done from Silky. And the numbers are a bit too good here. Silky really maybe should have given up the third. He fought a bit too far out. And this is actually a great fight. 14 roaches for five so far. That's the trading you can write home about. That is disgusting. The lings as well. Not even having, you know, the, the, the ling speed here. Silky's kind of like, here's some slow zerglings, but it's not that much. I mean, that, they made up a fair bit of the army supply. And I mean, he's still up eight workers. So Silky still obviously like got better income. But the army is just so big for Mio. Do you ever catch up? It's going to be tough. Mio's got plus one. You don't have a roach speed advantage or anything like that. Good concave management for Silky. I like that coming in from multiple sides, but moving in is not good. You've got the lesser numbers. So you want to pull away and slow down the fight rather than move in and force the fight. So I think Mio has the numbers to just barely break through. His roaches are stuck behind each other, though. Yeah. Ooh, he's so just... he might have the numbers. The positioning's really good. And Mio with some awkward focus fire there. Yeah, his reinforcements are coming from a horrible direction as well. So he's going to lose the numbers advantage. And that means Silky is holding on. A few more roaches, a few more lings all gathering. We move over that left-hand side, ready to set up onto that third base. I do you see this uh, attack coming in again, but this time again, the numbers are much more evened out. The Ravager getting caught in the front as well. Mio Mika has not been able to take good enough fights, and Silky is going to come through, is going to chase down, is going to push this back, and he has held as Mio Mika just really fumbled the engagements. Yeah, definitely a few little bits of this Miss Micro, and maybe he just should have kept pushing when he had the numbers advantage. And it's always hard to say because the units rally so slowly. That's what's weak about this push from here is it, it reinforces so, so slowly, even on a small map like this and with a bit of creep spread. He's going to pull back and drone up a little here, but two base against three base, that just gives Silky a monumental advantage as those extra workers have already been working for so long. So, you know, Mio gets within two workers of his opponent, but two base first, three. The mineral income difference is about 400. Mineral difference is what matters, usually. You know, minerals is the main in resource. It's what gives you lots of raw units. We don't have any weird, like, gas-heavy units that are going to create some asymmetry, you know, some differences, some edges you can gain. Basically, just about ravages dropping biles and good defensive positioning. But Mio doesn't really spread concaves. He kind of blobs his way in, usually, and likes to just focus on focus firing. We'll see if he can pull that off here. I feel like setting up a concave like Silky did is the secret to success, but he's not doing it. Like I said, he prefers to micro in a blob, and that comes with some advantages, but it means you can't use your defender's advantage to get more hits off while your opponent's pushing in, and it's actually Silky who's taking concave. You do have a creep advantage, though. I like the way Mirror yeah. has the edge of the creep to himself. That gives him a lot more movement. Yeah, you can kind of, can kind of juke uh, back and forth with this a little bit, but Silky just says, okay, well... That ain't working, but he's also like, well, I also have the extra third already up. My drone count's already decent. He's on a faster lair now as well, so that's something he's just recognizing that he can fall back. Doesn't need to go pushing in immediately right now. That's obviously going to be great for him. 
There's four overlords in the middle are just asking for a bile. I think that's what Mapu was thinking looking at it. I know I was. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, they were sitting there all clumped up. It's like, mm. it just makes you want to get four Ravages and go get some overlord kills. A few Ravages are morphing for Silky. I think he's thinking the same thing. He's trying to do it secretly so he can, you know, surprise with the first four Ravages. Um, and does come down, does Mio to start getting the first snipes. Mio is down 13 workers now. Mio Micah is probably the most comfortable player with a giant economic advantage of any pro player I've ever seen. Most players kind of go, oh gosh, I've really got to do something to get back in this. Mio will just casually sit on 20 workers less than his opponent for five minutes with zero urgency. Most players feel urgency. Mio Micah wins sometimes because his opponent goes, well, you're so far behind, you need to make a play. And then when he doesn't make a play, they kind of mind game themselves and they go, Mm. Oh, maybe he's taking a muters or something and they, they kind of overthink it and they build 20 drones and he just is like, no, 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 I have 170 supply of roaches with like plus two in roach speed and he just kills them because he has so much more army than they expect and all their money's invested in all these different tech trees and upgrades and bases that haven't actually given them extra army. So honestly, Silky's not making that mistake. No, it's just 13 worker advantage, advantage on all the upgrades, bigger army, bigger economy and playing it very safe. Now, Roach Speed is. Uh, oh no. I'm getting these guys the quad kill. <laughs> Just a single <laughs> in the end. They're being big. No, this is a. Uh, I like what you say about kind of like you mind game yourself because Mio Micah plays in such a weird way, and it's, it's kind of true. Mio Micah is still here right now. Less drones just sitting. If you want the supply block, we'll continue to build itself into as much army as possible. Silky does have an army coming from the bottom side of this as well, and that's what he's going to be utilizing right now, coming in from that right hand side. And that's just going to get him straight on top of this hatch. So you might not be breaking onto the army, but you are going to get rid of the hatchery. And Silky just continues in his head to put Mio Micah into a little bit of a checkmate. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Silky can trade. Um, he's, he's just trying to be real patient, like chip away and make sure his numbers advantage gets there. You know, okay, Spire, you've got no answer for that. A lot of overlords going there. This is very sloppy from both players. Like the number of overlords they've both lost without trying to dodge or put them on patrol paths to me is, is a very uncharacteristic thing because I've, I've I've seen these guys dodge many corrosive biles, but I think this game just has them a bit nervous. Even with a slow overlord, you can you can dodge those biles if you react quick enough, but uh, at least some of them. Yeah, usually at least some. Nice. So far, well, not being quite so pretty as we do see Silky still trying to break up this ram. Mio Micah back down to two bases. The only thing I will say is that Mio Micah, if he does max out, would have a massive army. And maybe somehow, yeah. some way, could turn that into something. It's time to trade for Silky, I think. And, and yeah. because of that exact reason, his roaches on the right side need to come in. Silky's making the mistake of thinking the wind condition is killing the third base. It's Mio. He doesn't care about a third base. you got to trade your army now because you, your, your money is just banking. And, mm -hmm. and that's giving, like you said, it's time. Mio's finally building an army advantage. There's no reason why he should be getting an army advantage. I don't think Silky's going to lose this game. But it is a strategic mistake. When you have the money your max your opponent isn't, you want to trade them. As long as it's not an awful fight, it's just like maybe slightly negative for you, it's good. You've got a bigger economy. As long as you don't let him hyper max, you know, right now there's an 18 army supply advantage. Maybe Mio gets a good fight. Tons of roaches are on the right side of the map and Mio has a bigger army. Silky needs to needs to make sure these roaches are actually part of this. Yeah, you yeah, are going to take kind of two separate fights here. It was Mio Mike has a decent split apart. Again, up a bit of army supply. Silky's getting muted, by the way, well. I guess that is kind of a checkmate, right? Because these Mutas are going to be able to deal with this entire army. Even if Mio Kamaga comes across the map, this is looking as though it's going to be good enough. As this Roach Ravager runs right on through. Yeah, Roach is going for the counterattack. Nice move there for Silky. And you know what? You got Mutas to focus their Ravages. You got your own Roach Ravager on the ground. Roach counterattack going to kill Mio Micah's uh, Roach Horn and Evo Chamber wall off. This is a tough spot for Mio, you're on a timer. He does bile down the eggs, which is very cute, trying to stop any more muters and roaches from popping. But the muters just do not have an answer. Mio is making a good play of it, honestly. I like that he pounces really quickly on the Roach Ravager yeah. on the north, splits someone to the drones, but his own production is getting torn up as well. Yep, it was indeed, and he was uh, kind of out of options. Silky is able to close out the game, which we kind of knew was coming. We knew that this was very much so Silky's game, like you said. Very difficult to lose. Mio Micah definitely played kind of the best that he could. Like I say, like you say, like he played the best he could to his own style, which is to sit there, not kind of worry about being down the base. And you know, it was nearly, um, it was nearly kind of a bit of a funky situation, right? Where like maybe there would have been like if the Muners weren't quite ready, maybe Mio Micah could have had a chance. 
obviously in this case, uh, not the case, and we are going to go through to game number three. So, that map coming if up If everyone's here. in the lobby and I'm holding it up, you just let me know. I just really wanted to check if he saw the Ling flood <laughs> and mm. how he knew really quickly. So, if the players are ready to go, I'll hop over. But otherwise, I'm like, how did he know? And he really didn't see any sign of it, as far as I can tell, other than the fact that the Lings didn't go home. So I think, I don't think he knew about the Ling Flood. I think he just wanted to stop the Lings. He knew they were hiding for a run by, the ones that were on his side of the map. He said to himself, you know what? I'm going to go wall off here while my Lings go for their counter attack. And that way I'll block you with the Evo wall off. Your 10 Lings on my side do some damage to you. It was like a tricky little move. So I don't think he knew about the Ling Flood. But then once his Lings got in, he saw, oh, you're massing Lings at home. Okay, now I know. And that's why he went for the wall off a bit later. Because he was just a bit too slow the first time around to get it down. Well, we have our players readying up, so it looks as though we are going to be good to go in a moment here. Game 3 of Meal Mica versus Silky. Get this one kicked off, just waiting for everyone to be ready to go. <laughs> a, ran a random guy has snuck in. Oh, we've got a German caster in. Okay, no worries. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I do like that. Sometimes you're in a tournament game and you're like, who's this guy? <laughs> and some guy is just like, I'd like to make some gambling, please. <laughs> I'm going to sneak into this lobby. And you're like, no, no, no. But uh, yeah, anyways, uh, Mio, Micah, Silky on Golden Ore. It's a big map. We do expect uh, probably the pool first pressure again from Mio. It's not a great 12 pool map. So Silky's job here, I think, is good overlord positioning like in that last game. Make sure you build a few links to defend the early four Zergling pressure. And uh, I don't think the plan from game one was bad for Silky. It was just, you know, losing a few drones, mining time, and an Overlord and all your vision led to just mistakes stack stacking up. So go back to the game one game plan, but clean it up a little, improve the vision. And I think Silky has a pretty good chance of taking the two to one here. Let's see what we get. It's Golden Aura. It is our final map of Asia. Let's see if we get a little bit of a banger here to round us out. As in the top left-hand corner, the blue Zerg, it is Silky. And the bottom right side of the map, the red Zerg, the Chaos Master, the Zerg, Vietnamese Master of the Cheese, it is Mio Mica. Obviously, Mio Mica representing uh, Team Gosu as well. He's been looking pretty damn good. Uh, over the years, I uh, know it's really fun seeing him and like Harstam go back and forth in Valencia a couple of years ago. And a lot of the Protoss players really struggle to get a handle on Mio Mike. He had a very fun series with Australia in one of the uh, the Asian weekly EPT Cups recently. And it is back to that pool first, which we expect on a bigger map. As we said, this is his standard opening hatchery into a pool, into a gas. Silky going for the more traditional 16 hatchery into an 18 gas and a 17 pool. Not a bad way to play. Uh, definitely on a bigger map like this. But uh, as we said, Silky wants two overlords outside Mio's base and to build his own units to be ready for that four Zergring pressure that we're going to be expecting. Yep. Well, I got that set up. Mio Mika, like you say, doing what Mio Mika does. We'll see how well Silky prepares in comparison to previously. Let's just get this hatchery coming through. A couple of drones on either side. Extract no. up as well. No Zerglings from Mio as well. Oh, so yeah, I like this. I love it. A queen. Mind game. To, to be a successful player who does weird stuff, you need to like be like people like he always does this weird thing, and then right when the player is counting on it, you don't do it. You know, you got it. You got to have enough variance. And Mio's done that. He's changed his play up. He's like, no, I'm just droning. This is just a super economic pool first. That's fine. Um, technically, I think it puts you like half a drone behind against the hatch first build. Not a big deal at all, though. It's very similar in terms of where it ends up. You get your queen out earlier, your inject out earlier, and Silky is building eight lings. He's doing a ling flood again. He's going to do a bane bust, a 19 drone bane bust, because he hasn't pulled off gas. Super mm -hmm. quick ling speed. Went for the gas very yep. early, and he's just going to drop a bane ling nest and go all in himself. Yep. Mio tends to go late ling speed, late roach warren. And he only builds two queens lately. He used to build four queens and be rock solid against this. This time he is building three, but he cancels one. He cancels one and goes for a third. Mio's playing greedy. Silky's build is going to be very hard for Mio to stop. He will not have any of the tools that a normal player would have in this scenario. Uh, it's going to be a vicious 19 drone Ling Bane timing. He even kills a drone to make the Bane nest. So it's 18 drones, in fact. This is a vicious attack. Yep, it really is. It's going to be full commitment. This is going to be full send, Silky. 
Getting it ready. He's going to have a couple things already down the left side. Wants to morph the Balings in from there ASAP. As we're just going to be seeing the Ling Speed, Lings, and Bane Ness all continuing up for the moment. No Roach Warren in the wall, man. He can't even wall off emergency style. So Mio's in so much trouble. Uh, he's going to have just way less Lings and two Queens. Like, man, if he wins this game, I'm giving Mio a medal for surviving a situation he has no business surviving. Instantly drops the spine, starts more Lings, gets Queens on the ramp. I mean, these are the right things. Quick reaction. He might need to even hold position some drones in front of those Queens. And those Queens do need to get solid. He cancels his third hatch. Maybe another spine. He's got to start Roaches. He's got a Roach right now. Five Roaches already starting. Dude, quick response from Mio. Cancels mm -hmm. one of the Banelings as well. I'm very impressed with his response so far. He really does not have the tools you want. Nice micro on the Lings. The Banelings chasing after them. Mio's buying himself as much time yeah. as possible, but he's got to cancel the spines. The Queens are going down. The Roaches are about to pop. Will they be ready, though? The oh. Banelings going for that main mineral line. If those Banelings hit the mineral line, it's all over. Yeah. Oh, they slipped through. I oh. thought the were. Oh, my goodness. We Ooh. were going to see initially... I think a couple of those bases is going to get denied, but we missed targeted as Mio Mika. We get only five drones so far. Ling Flood continues to try and clean up these roaches at this point. So Silk is just going to send it. Obviously, if he does not end this here, and Mio Mika is going to get away with having Roach Ling on the map with pretty much a worker lead. And it is terrible for Silky. Two bases each for Mio Mika. A few drones ahead. Roaches ready and up and running is just such a big deal. And Silky realizing that he's going to start droning. And Mio Mika, for the moment, has held on. No queens, though, and that's huge. Four drone advantage seems big, but look, Silky's already closed the gap. Mm. Silky's been injecting this whole time, and that's the thing. That's the real difference maker is Silky hasn't missed injects. Silky's building a Roach Horn. I honestly think that's overly careful. I think Silky can drone up and take a third. The counterattack for Mio is going to be so delayed. It's going to take forever to get across this map. Attacking in here may seem like a crazy gamble, but if he can surround these Roaches in small numbers, he be good. He's got to move his Lings in, though. I think Silky needs to get the Baneling in and blow up those Lings. If he can get a full surround, he can push through, but he's taking a while. He's got to blow up a Baneling. There we go. Finally, he gets the surround. A little bit slow on moving his units forward from Silky. And overall, a fantastic hold from Mio. That could have gone a lot worse for him. It's still rough. Morphing a Ravager there is huge. Silky's up five workers. Silky's in a great position right now. Mio's looking like he is about to drop this series. It'd be a rough way to start this group, man. He does not want to be losing this series and be down so far in the points. But uh, Silky's just looking so on point. A sharp time to take advantage of a greedy Mio Mika. I think he anticipated that Mio would shift gears and try to play against his image this game. And it's a punishing build for Silky that sets himself up very well now with a five worker advantage and roaches of his own. Lings come across, he's gonna go through and put some damage out. We just gotta sell the roaches there. The Ling pulls back up to the high ground for a couple of moments. And just have ourselves and plenty of roaches coming up on either side for now. I mean, Silky just got himself that worker lead. His own switch into roaches has been very smooth as well, right? He's kept up the pressure, moved into his own roach production, and that's why I think Mio Mike will just struggle. It's still close enough, but definitely the edge to Silky still. I like that Mio's closed the work account. He's only down one. He is obviously way down in the roaches right now. You know, uh, seven, eight, including the Ravager uh, versus 13. So being down five roaches hurts. But th the other thing is that Silky can make Banelings and Mio can't. A few Banelings could make a big difference when you're so reliant on Zerglings for like kind of tanking in your front line and surrounding and whatnot. Lings do try to counterattack, but there's a lot of Lings already ready for Silky. So even if you get a drone or two, yeah, good choice to pull out for Mio. You don't want to throw these Lings away for free. He's got to use his defender's advantage as best he can. He's making mass Lings, not making many of his own Roaches or Ravages. And I think those are the more important unit. Three Ravages on the front for Silky. Silky wants his finishing blow. He's actually started droning behind it. But my gosh, what a commitment for Silky. Let's see if he can break through. Mio comes forward very far forward. Mio not going too defensive. He's trying to just shove it. Does wow. take some big biles across his front line, oh. though. The Roach Ravager doing very well for Silky. Those three Ravages in the back have just been splendid. Yeah, the Ravager Biles have been great. Every Bile seems to be connected on some Roaches, knocking HP off of them right now. So he has to stop it just for a second. He's got five more Roaches on the way. And if he reinforces that with Lings as well, I feel like he's again still just in a position to keep on trading now and keep on pushing through. We do stop for a couple of moments here, though, for a second. Mm -hmm. Up seven workers. I mean, Silky's just like... The thing is, this feels like such a gimmicky all-in situation to be in a Silky. And then you realize he's playing Mio Micah and you're like, no, this is a perfect macro game. Like, you you, you, you just have an army advantage and then you just squeeze a few workers in once in a while. Just occasionally squeeze a few drones in. 
Mio is so averse to building economy. And he's been behind for a long time in this game as well. So it's especially hard for him to do it where he's just like, no, nah, I'm just making roaches, ravages, links. He's trying to hide his numbers in the back. But I mean, it's it, the, the problem is your Mio Mica. You can't really hide the fact that you're, you're going to go for an all-in because when has Mio Mica ever built 10, 15, 20 drones in a row? Like it's, it's a given that maybe you're squeezing a few workers in his Mio, but you're never going to assume that Mio is building drones for minutes on end, which is why Silky's so cautious. Make an Evo, make three drones. You know, both players hunting each other's overlords as well. It feels like Silky has really struck the correct balance, and this is very much an anti Mio Mica style that he's executing really well. All right, well, that is going to be, uh... again, that worker lead from Silky Mio Mica just building units, and Silky just saying, well, I'm establishing my advantage. I'm, I'm not giving up too much. I'm just doing it carefully, like you say. It's just, like you say, it's it's patient, it's slow, but it's, it's just what you need when you play against Mio Mica because Mio Mica will just decide to, hey, I'm just sending it. I'm going to build a ton of units and go, go, go. Well, this is the way to kind of progress the game, just in case he doesn't, but also being safe enough to hold on against an attack. And as Mio Mica starts to come, I look at the numbers, and it honestly just seems fine across the board for Silky. He should have no issue here playing defensively. Yeah, I mean, the Biles, especially on the defense, are going to be huge. Just such a big ball of roaches. Lings aren't really going to get a surface error on that. There's no plus one range, so it's not like the Lings are getting two shot. And he's killed a lot of overlords, says Mio. Like, Silky's really fallen to that, but look at that. Even Baneling Cocoon's on the way. Going to put a hard timer on this. Your Lings are going to be expiring once those Baneling Cocoons finish. Nice files from Mio. Will take out most of the Banes. The Lings have already done their job by that point. The Roach Ravager is actually getting a surprisingly decent angle, but look at the numbers in reserve for Silky. He's just got so much stuff. Dodges the Biles as well. Very good in and out, back and forth micro. Breathe and brings a Bane and gets a few yeah. things and a bunch of the enemy roaches. The Biles the from Mio unable to land. He's just got no meat left. Great play by Silky. Yeah, move forward at the right time there as well to catch the Ravagers. Love that one little Bane. Knocked down a few reinforcing Lings, so it kept the roaches of Mio Mike in trouble. And the Lings, the Ravagers, the roaches all continue to push through. We're going to see those Lings continue to chase. The Ravager will get caught. Another one here surrounded. So, yeah, the Lings absolutely there. Putting work in. Here, Mike has just rebuilt Lings, but only Lings, and only Lings is not really going to be enough, as these Roaches will be able to hold their own. GG is called, and it is Silky to take the series 2-1 to one over Mio Mike. He will close today out with a win, and that's going to be huge for him, because, of course, this is a very competitive group stage in Asia, so being able to grab that for Silky is going to give him the shot of, again, having a better time, more than likely, in terms of moving forwards. 100% a huge success there and a huge moment for uh, Silky to kind of just be be looking smooth, you know? Yeah, losing to Cyan sucks yesterday, but you got to win now. Being tied up one-to-one -one gives you a much better chance, whereas Mio Micro is, of course, on the elimination uh, point in the next round, uh, which is going to be really rough for him. So really good play. Silky adapted throughout the series. I mean, game one, to be fair, I was like, oh gosh, Overlord going down, you're losing drones to Lings. This just is like, oh no. But to see Silky improve after that game to game are uh, very happy to see a player stabilize like that and i think game three he really prepared well that build order was made to counter mio mica's build mio mica is not a solid safe macro player he's a, i'm gonna see if i can get greedy take a quick third and drone on up and when you're on 27 drones and your opponent's on 18 they've got banelings you don't you've got no spine no roach warren no baneliness what are you gonna do he did about as good of a defense as he possibly could have given the tools he had technically could have focused one more baneling down if he did he may have survived with five more drones that could have definitely changed the outcome with how low their work income was in that game but i mean you can't be perfect in everything so hats off to silky for taking that one and what a pleasure it's been to be back on the regionals with you today warty this has been fun man yeah man it's good to have you it's uh we're gonna be casting next week as well i think if i read the schedule right or at some point in the future i, I think so name. yeah i saw our names next to each other so We'll be back. Uh, me and uh, I'll be back in general next week. It might not be next week. It might be the week after. Either way, um, that's us done for the day, but only because Steadfast and I believe Fear Dragon are coming in to take over. So uh, just to wrap up, here was our final set of results for Asia. They have eight best of threes from the Americas region. So it's what, basically what we just did for a different region. They're going to be going through all of the matches in Americas from round two of Swiss. So by the end of the day, all the regions will have played their round two of Swiss. Uh, so basically just TLDR, stay tuned, don't go anywhere, we're going to be sorting out, swapping the stream over, obviously it is going to be a change on stream host, so the stream may go offline for a couple of minutes or so, stream delay has to catch up, etc, 
And if it does go offline, don't worry. I'll be back ASAP with Steadfast and Fear Dragon, bringing you guys the rest of the games. Uh, so we'll see you uh, on the other side of that. So Steadfast and Fear Dragon will. I'll see you guys in a bit. Thanks for watching, guys.